Isis Audiobooks presents an unabridged recording of The Last Continent, written by Terry Pratchett, read by Nigel Planer. Discworld is a world and a mirror of worlds. This is not a book about Australia. No, it's about somewhere entirely different, which just happens to be, here and there, a bit... Australian. Still, no worries, right? Against the stars, a turtle passes, carrying four elephants on its shell. Both turtle and elephants are bigger than people might expect, but out between the stars the difference between huge and tiny is comparatively speaking very small. But this turtle and these elephants are, by turtle and elephant standards, big. They carry the disc world with its vast lands, cloudscapes and oceans. People don't live on the disc any more than in less handcrafted parts of the multiverse, they live on balls. Oh, planets may be the place where their body eats its tea, but they live elsewhere, in worlds of their own, which orbit very handily around the centre of their heads. When gods get together, they tell the story of one particular planet whose inhabitants watched, with mild interest, huge continent-wrecking slabs of ice slap into another world which was, in astronomical terms, right next door, and then did nothing about it, because that sort of thing only happens in outer space. An intelligent species would at least have found someone to complain to. Anyway, no one seriously believes in that story, because a race quite that stupid would never even have discovered slewed. Much easier to discover than fire, and only slightly harder to discover than water. People believe in all sorts of other things, though. For example, there are some people who have a legend that the whole universe is carried in a leather bag by an old man. They're right, too. Other people say, hold on, if he's carrying the entire universe in a sack, right, that means he's carrying himself and the sack inside the sack, because the universe contains everything, including him. And the sack, of course, which contains him and the sack already, as it were. To which the reply is, well... All tribal myths are true, for a given value of true. It is a general test of the omnipotence of a god that they can see the fall of a tiny bird. But only one god makes notes, and a few adjustments, so that next time it can fall faster and further. We may find out why. We may find out why mankind is here, although that is more complicated and begs the question, where else should we be? It would be terrible to think that some impatient deity might part the clouds and say, Damn! Are you lot still here? I thought you discovered Slewed ten thousand years ago. I've got ten trillion tons of ice arriving on Monday. We may even find out why the duck billed platypus. Not why it is anything, just why it is. Snow, thick and wet, tumbled onto the lawns and roofs of Unseen University, the Discworld's premier college of magic. It was sticky snow, which made the place look like some sort of expensive yet tasteless ornament, and it caked around the boots of Macabre, the head Bledlow, as he trudged through the cold, wild night. A Bledlow is a cross between a porter and a proctor. A Bledlow is not chosen for his imagination, because he usually doesn't have any. Two other Bledlows stepped out of the lee of a buttress and fell in behind him on a solemn march towards the main gates. It was an old custom, centuries old, and in the summer a few tourists would hang around to watch it, but the ceremony of the keys went on every night in every season. Mere ice, wind and snow had never stopped it. Bledlows in times gone past had clambered over tentacled monstrosities to do the ceremony. They'd waded through flood water, flailed with their bowler hats at errant pigeons, harpies and dragons, and ignored mere faculty members who'd thrown open their bedroom windows and screamed imprecations along the lines of Stop that damn racket, will you? What's the point? They'd never stopped, or even thought of stopping. You couldn't stop tradition. You could only add to it. The three men reached the shadows by the main gate, almost blotted out in the whirling snow. The Bledlow on duty was waiting for them. Halt! Who 
goes there? he shouted. Macabre saluted. The Arch Chancellor's keys. Pass the Arch Chancellor's keys. The head Bledlow took a step forward, extended both arms in front of him with his palms bent back towards him, and patted his chest at the place where some Bledlow long buried had once had two breast pockets. Pat, pat. Then he extended his arms by his sides and stiffly patted the sides of his jacket. Pat. Pat. Damn! Could have sworn I had them a moment ago, he bellowed, enunciating each word with a sort of bulldog carefulness. The gatekeeper saluted. Macabre saluted. Have you looked in all your pockets? Macabre saluted. The gatekeeper saluted. A small pyramid of snow was building up on his bowler hat. I think I must have left them on the dresser. It's always the same, isn't it? You should remember where you put them down. Hang on, perhaps they're in my other jacket. The young Bledlow, who was this week's keeper of the other jacket, stepped forward. Each man saluted the other two. The youngest cleared his throat and managed to say, No, I looked in there... This morning! Macabre gave him a slight nod to acknowledge a difficult job well done and patted his pockets again. Hold on, stone the crows. They were in this pocket after all. What a muggins I am! Don't worry, I do the same myself. Is my face red? Forget my own head next. Somewhere in the darkness, a window creaked up. Uh, excuse me, gentlemen, here's the keys then, said Macabre, raising his voice. Much obliged. I, I, I wonder if you could, um, the querulous voice went on, apologising for even thinking of complaining. All safe and secure, shouted the gatekeeper, handing the keys back. Um, I, 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 uh, perhaps keep it down a little. God's bless all present, screamed Macabre, veins standing out on his thick crimson neck. Careful where you put them this time. Ha, ha, ha. Ho, 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 yelled Macabre, beside himself with fury. He saluted stiffly went about turn with an unnecessarily large amount of foot stamping, and the ancient exchange completed, marched back to the Bledlow's Lodge muttering under his breath. The window of the university's little sanatorium shut again. That man really makes me want to swear, said the bursar. He fumbled in his pocket and produced his little green box of dried frog pills, spilling a few as he fumbled with the lid. I've sent him no end of memos, he says it's traditional, but I don't know. He's so, he's so boisterous about it. He blew his nose. How's he doing? Not good, said the dean. The librarian was very, very ill. Snow plastered itself against the closed window. There was a heap of blankets in front of the roaring fire. Occasionally it shuddered a bit. The wizards watched it with concern. The lecturer in recent runes was feverishly turning over the pages of a book. I mean, how do we know if it's old age or not, he said. What's old age for an orangutan? And he's a wizard, and he spends all his time in the library, all that magic radiation the whole time. Somehow the flu is attacking his morphic field, but it could be caused by anything. The librarian sneezed and changed shape. The wizards looked sadly at what appeared very much like a comfortable armchair, which someone had for some reason upholstered in red fur. "'What can we do for him?' said Ponder Stibbons, the faculty's youngest member. Uh, he, he, "'He might feel happier with some cushions,' said Ridcully. "'Slightly bad taste, Arch-Chancellor, I feel.' "'What? Everyone likes some, some comfy cushions when they're feeling a little under the weather, don't they?' said the man to whom sickness was a mystery. 
He was at table this morning. Mahogany, I believe. He seems to be able to retain his colour, at least. The lecturer in recent runes closed the book with a sigh. He certainly lost control of his morphic function, he said. It's not surprising, I suppose. Once it's been changed, it'll change again much more easily, I'm afraid. A well-known fact. He looked at the Arch-Chancellor's frozen grin and sighed. Mustrum Ridcully was notorious for not trying to understand things if there was anyone around to do it for him. It's quite hard to change the shape of a living thing, but once it's been done, it's a lot easier to do it next time, he translated. Uh, uh, say again? He was a human before he was an ape, Arch-Chancellor, remember? Oh, yes, said Ridcully. Funny, really, the way you get used to uh, things. Apes and humans are related, according to young Ponder here. <laughs> the other wizards looked blank. Ponder screwed up his face. "'He's been showing me some of the invisible writings,' said Ridcully. "'Fascinating stuff!' The other wizards scowled at Ponder Stibbons, as you would at a man who'd been caught smoking in a firework factory. So now they knew who to blame. As usual. "'Is that entirely wise, sir?' said the dean. "'Well, I, I, I do happen to be the Arch-Chancellor in these parts, Dean,' said Ridcully calmly. "'A blindly obvious fact, Arch-Chancellor,' said the Dean. "'You could have cut cheese with his tone.' "'Must take an interest, morale, you know,' said Ridcully. "'My door is always open. "'I see myself as a, as a member of the team.' Ponder winced again. "'I don't think I'm related to any apes,' said the senior wrangler thoughtfully. "'I mean, I'd know, wouldn't I? "'I'd get invited to their weddings and so on. "'My parents would have said something like, "'Don't worry about Uncle Charlie. "'He's supposed to smell like that, wouldn't they? "'And there'd be portraits in, um... "'The chair sneezed. There was an unpleasant moment of morphic uncertainty, and then the librarian was sprawling in his old shape again. The wizards watched him carefully to see what had happened next. It was hard to remember the time when the librarian had been a human being. Certainly no one could remember what he'd looked like, or even what his name had been. A magical explosion, always a possibility in somewhere like the library, where so many unstable books of magic are pressed dangerously together, had introduced him to unexpected apehood years before. Since then, he'd never looked back, and often hadn't looked down either. His big hairy shape, swinging by one arm from a top shelf while he rearranged books with his feet, had become a popular one among the whole university body. His devotion to duty had been an example to everyone. Arch-Chancellor Ridcully, into whose head that last sentence had treacherously arranged itself, realised that he was unconsciously drafting an obituary. "'Anyone called in a doctor?' he said. "'We got Donut Jimmy here this afternoon,' said the dean. Ank Morpork's leading vet, generally called in by people faced with ailments too serious to be trusted to the general medical profession. Donut's one blind spot was his tendency to assume that every patient was, to a greater or lesser extent, a racehorse.' He tried to take his temperature, but I'm afraid the librarian bit him. He bit him? With a thermometer in his mouth? Ah, uh, not exactly. There, in fact, you have rather discovered the reason for his biting. There was a moment of solemn silence. The senior wrangler picked up a limp black leather paw and patted it vaguely. "'Does that book say if monkeys have pulses?' he said. "'Is his nose supposed to be cold, or what?' "'There was a little sound, such as might be made by half a dozen people "'all sharply drawing in their breath at once. "'The other wizards began to edge away from their senior wrangler. "'There was for a few seconds no other sound "'but the crackling of the fire and the howl of the wind outside. "'The wizards shuffled back.' The senior wrangler, in the astonished tones of someone still possessing all known limbs, very slowly took off his pointy hat. This was something a wizard would normally do only in the most sombre of circumstances. "'Well, that's it, then,' he said. "'Poor chap's on his way home, back to the big desert in the sky.' 
Er, uh, or rainforest, possibly, said Ponder Stibbons. Maybe Mrs. Whitlow could make him some hot, nourishing soup, said the lecturer in recent runes. Arch-Chancellor Ridcully thought about the housekeeper's hot, nourishing soup. Uh, kill or cure, I suppose, he murmured. He patted the librarian carefully. Uh, buck up, old chap, he said. Soon mm, have you back on your feet and, and continuing to make a, a, a valued contribution. Knuckles, said the dean helpfully. Say again? Uh, knuckles rather than feet. Casters, said the lecturer in recent runes. Bad taste, that man, said the arch-chancellor. They wandered out of the room. From the corridor came their retreating voices. Looked very pale around the antimacassar, I thought. Surely there's some sort of cure. The old place won't be the same without him. Definitely one of a kind. When they'd gone, the librarian reached up cautiously, pulled a piece of blanket over his head, cuddled his hot water bottle, and sneezed. Now there were two hot water bottles, one of them a lot bigger than the other, and with a teddy bear cover in red fur. Light travels slowly on the disc and is slightly heavy, with a tendency to pile up against high mountain ranges. Research wizards have speculated that there is another much speedier type of light which allows the slower light to be seen, but since this moves too fast to see, they've been unable to find a use for it. This does mean that, despite the disc being flat, everywhere does not experience the same time, at, for want of a better term, the same time. When it was so late at night in Ark Moorpork that it was early in the morning, elsewhere it was... But there were no hours here. There was dawn and dusk, morning and afternoon, and presumably there was midnight and midday, but mainly there was heat and redness. Something as artificial and human as an hour wouldn't last five minutes here. It would be dried out and shriveled up in seconds. Above all, there was silence. It was not the chilly, bleak silence of endless space, but the burning, organic silence you get when across a thousand miles of shimmering red horizons everything is too tired to make a sound. But as the ear of observation panned across the desert, it picked up something like a chant, a reedy little litany that beat against the all-embracing silence like a fly bumping against the window pane of the universe. The rather breathless chanter was lost to view because he was standing in a hole dug in the red earth. Occasionally some earth was thrown up on the heap behind him. A stained and battered pointy hat bobbed about in time with the tuneless tune. The word wizard had perhaps once been embroidered on it in sequins. They had fallen off, but the word was still there in brighter red where the hat's original colour showed through. Several dozen small flies orbited it. The words went something like this. Grubs, that's what we're going to eat. That's why they call it grub. And what are we going to do to get the grub? Why, we're grubbing for it. Hooray! Another shovel full of earth arced onto the heap, and the voice said, rather more quietly, I wonder if you can eat flies. They say the heat and the flies here can drive a man insane, but you don't have to believe that, and nor does that bright mauve elephant that just cycled past. Strangely enough, the madman in the hole was the only person currently on the continent who might throw any kind of light on a small drama being enacted a thousand miles away and several metres below, where the opal miner, known only to his mates as Struth, was about to make the most valuable yet dangerous discovery of his career. Struth's pick knocked aside the rock and dust of millennia, and something gleamed in the candlelight. It was green, like frosty green fire. Carefully, his mind suddenly as frozen as the light under his fingers, he picked away at the loose rock. The opal picked up and reflected more and more light onto his face as the debris fell away. There seemed to be no end to the glow. Finally, he let his breath out in one go. Struth. 
If he'd found a little piece of green opal, say about the size of a bean, he'd have called his mates over and they'd have knocked off for a few beers. A piece the size of his fist would have had him pounding the floor. But with this... He was still standing there, brushing it gently with his fingers, when the other miners noticed the light and hurried over. At least, they started out hurrying. As they came closer, they slowed to a kind of reverential walk. No one said anything for a moment. The green light shone on their faces. Then one of the men whispered, Good on you, Struth. There isn't enough money in all the world, mate. Watch out, it might just be a glaze. Still worth a mint. Go on, Struth, get it out. They watched like cats as the pick pried loose more and more rock and found an edge and another edge. Now Struth's fingers began to shake. Careful, mate. There's a side of it. The men took a step back as the last of the obscuring earth was knocked away. The thing was oblong, although the bottom edge was a confusion of twisted opal and dirt. Struth reversed his pick and laid the wooden handle against the glowing crystal. Struth, it's no good, he said. I just gots to know. He tapped the rock. It echoed. Can't be hollow, can it? said one of the miners. Never heard of that. Struth picked up a crowbar. Right, let's... There was a faint plink. A large piece of opal broke away near the bottom. It turned out to be no thicker than a plate. It revealed a couple of toes, which moved very slowly inside their iridescent shell. Ah, oh, Struth, said a miner as they backed further away. It's alive! Ponder knew he should never have let Ridcully look at the invisible writings. Wasn't it a basic principle never to let your employer know what it is you actually do all day? But no matter what precautions you took, sooner or later the boss was bound to come in and poke around and say things like, Is this where you work, then? And, I thought I sent a memo out about people bringing in potted plants. And, what you call that thing with the keyboard? And this had been particularly problematical for Ponder, because reading the invisible writings was a delicate and meticulous job suited to the kind of temperament that follows Grand Prix Continental Drift and keeps bonsai mountains as a hobby, or even drives a Volvo. It needed painstaking care. It needed a mind that could enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles in a dark room. It did not need Mustrum Ridcully. The hypothesis behind invisible writings was laughably complicated. All books are tenuously connected through L-space, and therefore the content of any book ever written or yet to be written may, in the right circumstances, be deduced from a sufficiently close study of books already in existence. Future books exist in potentia, as it were, in the same way that a sufficiently detailed study of a handful of primal ooze will eventually hint at the future existence of prawn crackers. But the primitive techniques used hitherto, based on ancient spells like Wiesencake's unreliable algorithm, had meant that it took years to put together even the ghost of a page of an unwritten book. It was Ponder's particular genius that he had found a way around this by considering the phrase, How do you know it's not possible until you've tried? And experiments with Hex the university's thinking engine, had found that, indeed, many things are not impossible until they have been tried. Like a busy government, which only passes expensive laws prohibiting some new and interesting thing when people have actually found a way of doing it, the universe relied a great deal on things not being tried at all. When something is tried, Ponder found, it often does turn out to be impossible very quickly. But it takes a little while for this to really be the case. In effect, for the overworked laws of causality to hurry to the scene and pretend it has been impossible all along. In the case of cold fusion, this was longer than usual. Using Hex to remake the attempt in minutely different ways at very high speed had resulted in a high success rate, and he was now assembling whole paragraphs in a matter of hours.
It, it, it's like a conjuring trick, then, Ridcully had said. You're pulling the tablecloth away before all the, all, the, all the crockery has time to remember to fall over. And Ponder had winced and said, Yes, exactly like that, Arch-Chancellor. Well done. And that had led to all the trouble with how to dynamically manage people for dynamic results in a caring, empowering way in quite a short time dynamically. Ponder didn't know when this book would be written, or even in which world it might be published, but it was obviously going to be popular, because random trawls in the depths of L space often turned up fragments. Perhaps it wasn't even just one book. And the fragments had been on Ponder's desk when Rid Cully had been poking around. Unfortunately, like many people who are instinctively bad at something, the Arch-Chancellor prided himself on how good at it he was. Rid Cully was to management what King Herod was to the Bethlehem Playgroup Association. His mental approach to it could be visualised as a sort of business flowchart, with at the top a circle entitled, Me, Who Does the Telling?, and connected below it by a line, a large circle entitled, Everyone Else. Until now, this had worked quite well, because although Ridcully was an impossible manager, the university was impossible to manage, and so everything worked seamlessly. And it would have continued to do so if he hadn't suddenly started to see the point in preparing career development packages, and worst of all, job descriptions. As the lecturer in recent runes put it, he called me in and asked me what I did. Exactly. Have you ever heard of such a thing? What sort of a question is that? This is a university. He asked me whether I had any personal worries, said the senior wrangler. I don't see why I have to stand for that sort of thing. And did you see that sign on his desk? The dean had said. You mean the one that says, The buck starts here? No, the other one, the one which says, When you're up to your arse in alligators, today is the first day of the rest of your life. And uh, that means, I don't think it's supposed to mean anything. I think it's just supposed to be. Be what? Proactive, I think. It's a word he's using a lot. Oh, what does that mean? Well, in favour of activity, I suppose. Really? Dangerous. In my experience, inactivity sees you through. Altogether, it was not a happy university at the moment, and mealtimes were the worst. Ponder tended to be isolated at one end of the high table as the unwilling architect of this sudden tendency on the part of the Arch-Chancellor to try to weld them into a lean, mean team. The wizards had no intention of being lean, but were getting as mean as anything. On top of that, Rid Cully's sudden interest in taking an interest meant that Ponder had to explain something about his own current project, and one aspect of Rid Cully that had not changed was his horrible habit of, Ponder suspected, deliberately misunderstanding things. Ponder had long been struck by the fact that the librarian, an ape, at least generally an ape, although this evening he seemed to have settled on being a small table set with a red-furred tea service, was, well... So human-shaped. In fact, so many things were pretty much the same shape. Nearly everything you met was really a sort of complicated tube with two eyes and four arms or legs or wings. Oh, or they were fish. Or insects. All right, spiders as well. And a few odd things like starfish and whelks. But still, there was a remarkably unimaginative range of designs. Where were the six-armed, six-eyed monkeys pinwheeling through the jungle canopy? Oh, yes, octopuses too, but that was the point. They were really only a kind of underwater spider. Ponder had poked around among the university's more or less abandoned museum of quite unusual things and noticed something rather odd. Whoever had designed the skeletons of creatures had even less imagination than whoever had done the outsides. At least the outside designer had tried a few novelties in the spots, the wool and stripes department, 
but the bone builder had generally just put a skull on a rib cage, shoved the pelvis in further along, stuck on some arms and legs, and had the rest of the day off. Some rib cages were longer, some legs were shorter, some hands became wings, but they all seemed to be based on one design, one size stretched or shrunk to fit all. Not to his very great surprise, Ponder seemed to be the only one around who found this at all interesting. He'd point out to people that fish were amazingly fish-shaped, and they'd look at him as if he'd gone mad. Paleontology and archaeology and other skullduggery were not subjects that interested wizards. Things are buried for a reason, they considered. There's no point in wondering what it was. Don't go digging up things in case they won't let you bury them again. The most coherent theory was one he recalled from his nurse when he was small. Monkeys, she averred, were bad little boys who hadn't come in when called, and seals were bad little boys who'd lazed around on the beach instead of attending to their lessons. She hadn't said that birds were bad little boys who'd gone too close to the cliff edge, and in any case jellyfish would be more likely, but Ponder couldn't help thinking that, harmlessly insane though the woman had been, she might have had just the glimmerings of a point. He was spending most nights now watching Hex trawl the invisible writings for any hints. In theory, because of the nature of L's space, absolutely everything was available to him, but that only meant that it was more or less impossible to find whatever it was you were looking for, which is the purpose of computers. Ponder Stibbons was one of those unfortunate people cursed with the belief that if only he found out enough things about the universe, it would all somehow make sense. The goal is the theory of everything. But Ponder would settle for the theory of something, and late at night, when Hex appeared to be sulking, he despaired of even a theory of anything. And it might have surprised Ponder to learn that the senior wizards had come to approve of Hex, despite all the comments on the lines of, In my day, we used to do our own thinking. Wizardry was traditionally competitive, and while Yu Yu was currently going through an extended period of peace and quiet, with none of the informal murders that had once made it such a terminally exciting place, a senior wizard always distrusted a young man who was going places, since traditionally his route might be via your jugular. Therefore, there's something comforting in knowing that some of the best brains in the university, who a generation ago would be coming up with some really exciting plans involving trick floorboards and exploding wallpaper, were spending all night in the high-energy magic building trying to teach Hex to sing Lydia the Tattooed Lady, exulting at getting a machine to do after six hours' work something that any human off the street would do for tuppence, then sending out for banana and sushi pizza and falling asleep at the keyboard. Their seniors called it technomancy and slept a little easier in their beds in the knowledge that Ponder and his students weren't sleeping in theirs. Ponder must have nodded off because he was awakened just before 2am by a scream and realised he was face down in half of his supper. He pulled a piece of banana-flavoured mackerel off his cheek, left Hex quietly clicking through its routine and followed the noises. The commotion led him to the hall in front of the big doors leading to the library. The bursar was lying on the floor, being fanned with the senior wrangler's hat. "'As far as we can gather, Arch-Chancellor,' said the dean, "'the poor chap couldn't sleep and came down for a book.' Ponder looked at the library doors. A big strip of black and yellow tape had been stuck across them, along with a sign saying, "'Danger, do not enter in any circumstances.' It was now hanging off, and the doors were ajar. This was no surprise. Any true wizard faced with a sign like, Do not open this door, really, we mean it, we are not kidding, opening this door will mean the end of the universe, would automatically open the door in order to see what all the fuss was about. This made signs rather a waste of time, but at least it meant that when you handed what was left of the wizard to his grieving relatives, you could say, as they grasped the jar, We told him not to! There was a silence from the darkness on the other side of the doorway. Ridcully extended a finger and pushed one door slightly. Behind it, something made a fluttering noise, and the doors were slammed shut. The wizards jumped back. Don't risk it, Arch-Chancellor, 
said the chair of indefinite studies. I tried to go in earlier, and the whole section of critical essays had gone critical. Blue light flickered under the doors. Elsewhere, someone might have said, it's just books. Books aren't dangerous. But even ordinary books are dangerous, and not only the ones like Make Jelly Gnite the Professional Way. A man sits in some museum somewhere and writes a harmless book about political economy, and suddenly thousands of people who haven't even read it are dying, because the ones who did haven't got the joke. Knowledge is dangerous, which is why governments often clamp down on people who can think thoughts above a certain calibre. And the unseen university library was a magical library built on a very thin patch of space-time. There were books on distant shelves that hadn't been written yet, books that never would be written, at least not here. It had a circumference of a few hundred yards, but there was no known limit to its radius. And in a magical library the books leak and learn from one another. They've started attacking anyone who goes in moaned the dean. No one can control them when the librarian's not here. But, but, we're a university. We, we, we have to have a library, said Ridcully. It adds tone. What sort of people would we be if we didn't go into the library? Students, said the senior wrangler morosely. Mm, I remember when I was a student said the lecturer in recent rooms. Old bogey boy Swallet took us on an expedition to find the lost reading room. Three weeks we were wandering around. Had to eat our own boots. Did you find it? said the dean. No, but we found the remains of the previous year's expedition. What did you do? We ate their boots too. From beyond the door came a flapping as of leather covers. There's some pretty vicious grimoires in there, said the senior wrangler. They can take a man's arm right off. Yes, but at least they don't know about door handles, said the dean. They do if there's a book in there somewhere called Doorknobs for Beginners, said the senior wrangler. They read each other. The arch-chancellor glanced at Ponder. They're likely to be a, a book like that in there, Stibbons? According to L space theory, it's practically certain, sir. As one man, the wizards backed away from the doors. We, 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 we can't let this nonsense go on, said Ridcully. We've got to cure the librarian. It, it's a magical illness, so we ought to be able to cook up a magical cure, oughtn't we? That would be exceedingly dangerous, Arch-Chancellor said the dean. His whole system is a mess of conflicting magical influences. There's no knowing what adding more magic would do. He's already got a freewheeling temporal gland. Wizards are certain of the existence of the temporal gland, although not even the most invasive alchemist has ever found where it is located, and current theory is that it has a non-corporeal existence, like a sort of ethereal appendix. It keeps track of how old your body is and is so susceptible to the influence of a high magical field that it might even work in reverse, absorbing the body's normal supplies of chrononine. The alchemists say it is the key to immortality, but they say that about orange juice, crusty bread and drinking your own urine. An alchemist would cut his own head off if he thought it would make him live longer. Any more magic and, well, I don't know what'll happen. We'll find out, said Ridcully brusquely. We need to be able to go into the library. We'd be doing this for the college, Dean. An unseen university is, is, is bigger than one man. Ape. Thank you, thank you. Ape. And we must always remember that I is the smallest letter in, in the alphabet. There was another thud from beyond the doors. Actually, said the senior wrangler, I think you'll find that depending on the font, C, or even U, are in fact even smaller. Well, shorter, anyway. Of course, Ridcully went on, ignoring this as part of the university's usual background logic. I suppose I, I could appoint an, another librarian. Got to be a senior chap who knows his way around. Hmm. Now let me see. Do any names spring to mind, Dean? 
"'All right, all right,' said the dean. "'Have it your own way, as usual.' "'Er, uh, we, 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 we can't do it, sir,' Ponder ventured. "'Oh?' said Ridcully. "'Volunteering for a bit of bookshelf tidying yourself, are you?' "'I mean, we really can't use magic to change him, sir. "'There's a huge problem in the way.' "'There are no problems, Mr. Stibbons. "'There are only opportunities.' "'Yes, sir, and the opportunity here is to find out the librarian's name.' "'There was a buzz of agreement from the other wizards. "'The lad's right,' said the lecturer in recent rooms. "'Can't magic a wizard without knowing his name. Hmm. "'Basic rule.' "'Well, we call him the librarian,' said Ridcully. "'Everyone calls him the librarian. W w "'Won't that do?' "'That's just a job description, sir.' "'Ridcully looked at his wizards. Uh, "'One of us must know his name, surely. "'Good grief, I should hope we at least know our colleagues' names. "'Isn't that so?' "'He looked at the dean, hesitated, and then said, "'Dean?' "'He's been an ape for quite a while, Arch-Chancellor,' said the dean.' Most of his original colleagues have, have passed on, gone to the great big dinner in the sky. We were going through one of those periods of droit de mortis. Broadly speaking, the acceleration of a wizard through the ranks of wizardry by killing off more senior wizards. It is a practice currently in abeyance, since a few enthusiastic attempts to remove Mustrum Ridcully resulted in one wizard being unable to hear properly for two weeks. Ridcully felt that there was indeed room at the top, and he was occupying all of it. Yes, but he's got to be in the records somewhere. The wizards thought about the great cliffs of stacked paper that constituted the university's records. The archivist has never found him, said the lecturer in recent rooms. Who's the archivist? The librarian, Arch-Chancellor. Then... At least he ought to be in the yearbook for the year he graduated. It's a very funny thing, said the dean, but a freak accident appears to have happened to every single copy of the yearbook for that year. Ridcully noted his wooden expression. Would it be an accident like a particular page being torn out, leaving only a lingering banana aroma? Lucky guess, Arch-Chancellor. Ridcully scratched his chin. Hmm. A pattern emerges, he said. You see, he's always been dead set against anyone finding out his name, said the senior wrangler. He's afraid we'll try to turn him back into a human. He looked meaningfully at the dean, who put on an offended expression. Some people have been going around saying that an ape as librarian is unsuitable. I merely express the view that it is against the traditions of the university, the dean began, which consist largely of niggling, big dinners, and shouting damn fool things about keys in the middle of the night, said Ridcully. So I don't think we... The expressions on the faces of the other wizards made him turn around. The librarian had entered the hall. He walked very slowly because of the amount of clothing he'd put on. The sheer volume of coats and sweaters meant that his arms, instead of being used as extra feet, were sticking out very nearly horizontally on either side of his body. But the most horrifying aspect of the shuffling apparition was the red woolly hat. It was jolly. It had a bobble on it. It had been knitted by Mrs Whitlow, who was technically an extremely good needlewoman, but if she had a fault it lay in failing to take account of the precise dimensions of the intended recipient. Several wizards had on occasion been presented with one of her creations, which often assumed they had three ankles, or a neck two metres across. Most of the things were surreptitiously given away to charitable institutions. You can say this about Aunt Morpork. No matter how misshapen a garment, there will always be someone, somewhere, it would fit. Mrs Whitlow's mistake here was the assumption that the librarian, for whom she had considerable respect, would like a red bobble hat with side flaps that tied under his chin. Given that this would technically require that they be tied under his groin, he'd opted to let them flap loose. 
He turned a sad face towards the wizards as he stopped outside the library door. He reached for the handle. He said in a very weak voice, and then sneezed. The pile of clothing settled. When the wizards pulled it away, they found underneath a very large, thick book bound in hairy red leather. Says Ook on the cover, said the senior wrangler after a while in a rather strained voice. Does it say who it's by, said the dean. Bad taste to that man. I meant that maybe it'd be his real name. Can we look inside, said the chair of indefinite studies. There may be an index. Any, um, any volunteers to look inside the librarian, said Ridcully. Don't all shout. The morphic instability responds to the environment, said Ponder. Isn't that interesting? He's near the library, so it turns him into a book. Sort of protective camouflage, you could say. It's as if he evolves to fit in with... Thank you, Mr. Stibbons. And is there a point to this? Well, I assume we can look inside said Ponder. A book is meant to be opened. Uh, there's even a black leather bookmark, see? Oh, that's a bookmark, is it? said the chair of indefinite studies, who had been watching it nervously. Ponder touched the book. It was warm, and it opened easily enough. Every page was covered with ook. Good dialogue, but the plot is a little dull. "'Dean, I'd be obliged if you'd take this seriously, please,' said Ridcully. He tapped his foot once or twice. "'Anyone got any more ideas?' The wizards stared at one another and shrugged. "'I suppose,' said the lecturer in recent runes. "'Yes, runes. Arnold, isn't it?' "'No, Arch-Chancellor. Well, out with it anyway. "'I suppose. Um, I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but go on, man, we're almost all agog. "'I suppose there's always <clears throat> rinse wind.' "'Ridcully stared at him for a moment. Uh, "'Skinny fella, scruffy beard, bloody useless wizard. "'Got that box on legs thingy?' That's right, Arch-Chancellor. Well done. Uh, he was the deputy librarian for a while, as I expect you remember. Mm, not really, but do go on, he said. In fact, he was here when the librarian became the librarian, and I remember once when we were watching the librarian stamping four books all at the same time, he said, Amazing, really, when you think he was born in Ankh Morpork. I'm sure if anyone knows the name of the librarian, it's Rincewind. Well, 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 go and fetch him, then. I suppose you do know where he is, do you? Technically, yes, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder quickly, but we're not sure quite where the place where he is, is, if you follow me. Ridcully gave him another stare. You see, we think he's on XXXX, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. X, 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 Arch-Chancellor. I thought no one knew where that place was, said Ridcully. Exactly, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. Sometimes you had to turn facts in several directions until you found the right way to fit them into Ridcully's head. Sometimes Ponder thought his skill with Hex was because Hex was very clever and very stupid at the same time. If you wanted it to understand something, you had to break the idea down into bite-sized pieces and make absolutely sure there was no room for any misunderstanding. The quiet hours with Hex were often a picnic after five minutes with the senior wizards. What's he doing there? We don't really know, Arch-Chancellor. If you remember, we believe he ended up there after that Agatean business. But what did he want to go there for? I don't, I don't think he actually wanted to, said Ponder. Um, we sent him. It was a trivial error in bilocational thaumaturgy that anyone could make. But, but, but you made it, as I recall, said Ridcully, whose memory could spring nasty surprises like that. I am a member of the team, sir, said Ponder, pointedly. 
Well, if he doesn't want to be there, and we need him here, let's bring him back. The rest of the sentence was drowned out, not by a noise, but by a sort of bloom of quietness, which rolled over the wizards and was so oppressive and soft that they couldn't even hear their own heartbeats. Old Tom, the university's magical and tongueless bell, told out 2 a.m. by striking the silences. Um, said Ponder, it's not as simple as that. Ridcully blinked. Why not, he said. Bring him back by magic. We sent him there. We can bring him back. Um, it'd take months to set it up properly if you want him back right here, said Ponder. If we get it wrong, he'll end up arriving in a circle fifty feet wide. That's not a problem, is it? If we keep out of it, he can land anywhere. I don't think you quite understand, sir. The signal-to-noise ratio of any thalmic transfer over an uncertain distance coupled with the disc's own spin will almost certainly result in a practical averaging of the arriving subject over an area of a couple of a thousand square feet, at least, sir. Say again? Ponder took a deep breath. I mean, he'll end up arriving as a circle fifty feet wide. Ah, so he probably wouldn't be very good in the library after that, then. Only as a very large bookmark, sir. All right, then. It's down to sheer geography. Who've we got who knows anything about geography? The miners emerged from the vertical shaft like ants leaving a burning nest. There were thumps and thuds from below, and at one point Struth's hat shot up into the air, turned over a few times and dropped back. There was silence for a while, and then bits cracking off it like errant pieces of shell on a newly hatched chick. The thing pulled itself out of the shaft and looked around it. The miners... Crouched behind various bushes and sheds, were quite certain of this, even though the monster had no visible eyes. It turned its hundreds of little legs, moving rather stiffly, as if they'd spent too much time buried in the ground. Then, weaving slightly, it set off. And far away in the shimmering red desert, the man in the pointy hat climbed carefully out of his hole. He held in both hands a bowl made of bark. It contained... Lots of vitamins, valuable protein, and essential fats. See? No mention of wriggling at all. A fire was smouldering a little way away. He put the bowl down carefully and picked up a large stick, stood quietly for a moment, and then suddenly began to hop around the fire, smacking the ground with a stick and shouting, Ha! When the ground had been subdued to his apparent satisfaction, he whacked at the bushes as if they had personally offended him and bashed a couple of trees as well. Finally, he advanced on a couple of flat rocks, lifted up each one in turn, averted his eyes, and shouted, Ha! again, and flailed blindly at the ground beneath. The landscape having been acceptably pacified, he sat down to eat his supper before it escaped. It tasted a little like chicken. When you're hungry enough, practically anything can. And eyes watched him from the nearby waterhole. They were not the tiny eyes of the swarming beetles and tadpoles that made a careful examination of every handful he drank a vital gastronomic precaution. These were far older eyes, and currently without any physical component. For weeks, a man whose ability to find water was limited to checking if his feet were wet had survived in this oven-ready country by falling into water holes. A man who thought of spiders as harmless little creatures had experienced only a couple of nasty shocks when, by now, this approach should have left him with arms the size of beer barrels that glowed in the dark. The man had even hit the seashore once and paddled in a little way to look at the pretty blue jellyfish, and it was all the watcher could do to see that he got a mere light sting which ceased to be agonising after only a few days. The waterhole bubbled and the ground trembled as if, despite the cloudless sky, there was a storm somewhere. Now it was three o'clock in the morning. Ridcalley was good at doing without other people's sleep. Unseen University was much bigger on the inside. Thousands of years as the leading establishment of practical magic in a world where dimensions were largely a matter of chance in any case had left it bulging in places where it shouldn't have places. 
There were rooms containing rooms, which, if you entered them, turned out to contain the room you'd started with, which can be a problem if you're in the conga line. And because it was so big, it could afford to have an almost unlimited number of staff on the premises. Tenure was automatic, or more accurately, non-existent. You found an empty room, turned up for meals as usual, and generally no one noticed. Although, if you were unfortunate, you might attract students. And if you looked hard enough in some of the outlying regions of the university, you could find an expert on anything. You could even find an expert on finding an expert. The professor of recondite architecture and origami map folding had been woken up, been introduced to the arch-chancellor, who'd never set eyes on him before, and had produced a map of the university which would probably be accurate for the next few days and looked rather like a chrysanthemum in the act of exploding. Finally, the wizards reached a door and Ridcully glared at the brass plate on it as if it had just been cheeky to him. Burr, egregious professor of cruel and unusual geography, he said. This looks like the one. We must have walked miles, said the dean, leaning against the wall. I don't recognise any of this. Ridcully glanced around. The walls were stone, but had at some time been painted in that very special institutional green that you get when an almost finished cup of coffee is left standing for a couple of weeks. There was a board covered in balding and darker green felt, on which had been optimistically thumbtacked the word notices. But from the looks of it, there had never been any notices and never would be, ever. There was a smell of ancient dinners. Ridcully shrugged and knocked on the door. "'I don't remember him,' said the lecturer in recent runes. "'I think I do,' said the dean. "'Not a very promising boy. Had ears. Hmm. "'Don't often see him around, though. Always has a suntan. Odd, that. "'He's on the staff. If anyone knows anything about geography, he's our man.' "'Ridcully knocked again. "'Perhaps he's out,' said the dean. "'That's where you mostly get geography. Outside.' Ridcully pointed to a little wooden device by the door. There was one outside every wizard's study. It consisted of a little sliding panel in a frame. Currently, it was revealing the word in, and presumably was covering the word out, although you could never be sure with some wizards. The lecturer in creative uncertainty, for example, held rather smugly that he was in a state of both inness and outness, until such time as anyone knocked on his door and collapsed the field, and that it was impossible to be categorical before that event. Logic is a wonderful thing, but doesn't always beat actual thought. The dean tried to slide the panel. It refused to budge. "'He must come out sometimes,' said the senior wrangler. "'Besides, sensible men should be in bed at 3 a.m.' "'Yes, indeed,' said the dean meaningfully. Ridcully thumped on the door. I, I, I demand that you open up, he shouted. I am the, the master of this college. The door moved under the blow, but not very much. It was blocked by what turned out to be, after some strenuous shoving by all the wizards, an enormous pile of paperwork. The dean picked up a yellowing piece of paper. This is the memo saying I've been appointed as dean, he said. That was years ago. Surely... He must come out some time, said the senior wrangler. Oh, dear. The same thought had occurred to the other wizards, too. Remember poor old Wally Slubber, murmured the chair of indefinite studies, looking around in some trepidation. Three years of tutorials post-mortem. Well, the students did say he was a bit quiet, said Ridcully. He sniffed. <laughs> Doesn't smell bad in here. Quite fresh, really. "'Pleasantly salty. Aha! "'There was a bright light under a door "'at the other end of the crowded and dusty room, "'and the wizards could hear a gentle splashing. "'Bath night! Good man!' said Ridcully. "'Well, we don't have to disturb him.' "'He peered at the titles of the books that lined the room. "'Bound to be a lot about XXXX somewhere here,' he added, "'pulling out a volume at random. "'Come along. One man, one book each.' "'Can we at least send out for some breakfast?' grumbled the dean. "'Far too early for breakfast,' said Ridcully. "'Well, some supper, then. Too late for supper.' The chair of indefinite studies took in the rest of the room. A lizard scuttled across the wall and disappeared. "'A bit of a mess in here, isn't there?' he said, glaring at the place where the lizard had been. "'Everything's 
Very dusty. What's in all these boxes? Says rocks on this side, said the dean. Makes sense. If you're going to study the outdoors, do it in the warm. But what about all the fishing nets and coconuts? The dean had to agree the point. The study was a mess, even by the extremely expansive standards of wizardry. Boxes of dusty rocks occupied the little space that wasn't covered with books and paper. They had been variously labelled, with inscriptions like Rocks from Lower Down, Other Rocks, Curious Rocks, and Probably Not Rocks. Further boxes to Ponder's rising interest were marked Remarkable Bones, Bones, and Dull Bones. One of those people who pokes his nose where it doesn't belong, I fancy, said the lecturer in recent rooms, and sniffed. He sniffed again, and looked down at the book he'd picked at random. This is a pressed squid collection, he said. Oh, is it any good? I used to collect starfish when I was a boy, said Ponder. The lecturer in recent rooms shut the book and frowned at him over the top of it. I dare say you did, young man. And old fossils too, I expect. I always thought that old fossils might have a lot to teach us, said Ponder. Perhaps I was wrong, he added darkly. Well, I, for one, have never believed all that business about dead animals turning into stone, said the lecturer in recent rooms. It's against all reason. What's in it for them? So how do you explain fossils, then, said Ponder? Ah, 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 you see, I don't, said the lecturer in recent rooms with a triumphant smile. It saves so much trouble in the long run. How do skinless sausages hold together, Mr. Stippens? What? Eh? How should I know something like that? Really? You don't know that? But you think you're entirely qualified to know how the whole universe was put together, do you? Anyway, you don't have to explain fossils. They are there. Why try to turn everything into a big mystery? If you go around asking questions the whole time, you'll never get anything done. Well, what are we put here for? said Ponder. There you go again, said the lecturer in recent rooms. Says here, it's girt by sea, said the senior wrangler. He looked up at their stairs. This, this continent, XXXX, he added, pointing at a page, says here, little is known about it, save that it is girt by sea. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see someone has their mind on the task in hand, said Ridcully. You two, get on with some studying, please. Right, then, Senior Wrangler. Girt by sea, is it? Apparently. Well, well, it would be, wouldn't it, said Ridcully. Anything else? I used to know a girt, said the bursar. The terror of the library had sent his somewhat erratic sanity on a downward slide into the calm pink clouds again. Not very much, said the senior wrangler, flicking through the pages. Sir Roderick Purday spent many years looking for the alleged continent and was very emphatic that it didn't exist. Quite a jolly girl. Gertrude Plusher, I think her name was. Face like a brick. Yes, but he once got lost in his own bedroom said the dean, thumbing through another book. They found him in the wardrobe. I wonder if it's the same girt, said the bursar. Could be, bursar, said Ridcully. He nodded at the other wizards. 
no one's to let him have any sugar or fruit. For a while there was no sound but the splash of water behind the door, the turning of pages, and the bursar's randomised humming. "'According to this note in Wasport's lives of very dull people,' said the senior wrangler, squinting at the tiny script, "'he met an old fisherman who said in that country the bark fell off the trees in the winter and the leaves stayed on.' "'Yes, yes, but they always make up that sort of thing,' said Ridcully. "'Otherwise it's too boring. "'It's no good coming home and just saying you were shipwrecked for two years and eight winkles, is it? "'You have to put in a lot of daft stuff about men who go around on one big foot "'and the land of giant plum puddings and nursery rubbish like that.' "'My word,' said the lecturer in recent rooms, "'who had been engrossed in a volume at the other end of the table. "'It says here,' that the people on the island of Slacky wear no clothes at all, and the women are of unsurpassed beauty. That sounds quite dreadful, said the chair of indefinite studies primly. There are <clears throat> several woodcuts. I, I'm sure none of us wish to know that, said Ridcully. He looked around at the rest of the wizards and repeated in a louder voice, I said, I'm sure none of us... "'Wish to know that. Dean, come right back here and pick up your chair. "'There's a, a mention of XXXX in Wrencher's Snakes of All Nations,' said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. "'It says the continent has very few poisonous snakes. "'Oh, there's a footnote.' "'His finger went down the page. "'It says most of them have been killed by the spiders.' "'How very odd.' "'Oh,' said the lecturer in recent rooms, "'it also says here that the denizens of Purdy Island "'also existeth in a state of nature.' "'He struggled with the ancient handwriting. "'Yeti is in fine health and of good bearing and stature "'and is truly a nobly savage.' "'Let me have a look at that,' said Ridcully. "'The book was passed down the table. "'The Arch-Chancellor scowled. "'It's written noble,' he said. "'Noble, savage, means you, means you act like a gentleman, don't you know?' "'What, go fox-hunting, bow to ladies, don't pay your tailor, that sort of thing?' "'Shouldn't think that chap owes his tailor very much,' said Ridcully, "'looking at the accompanying illustration. "'All right, chaps, let's see what else we can find.' "'He's having rather a long buff, isn't he?' said the dean, after a while. "'I mean, I like to be as well scrubbed as the next man, "'but we're talking serious prunes here.' "'Sounds like he's sloshing about,' said the senior wrangler. "'Sounds like the seaside,' said the bursar happily. "'Try to keep up, will you, bursar?' said Ridcully wearily. "'Actually,' said the senior wrangler, "'there is a certain sea-gully component, now that you mention it.' Ridcully stood up, strode over to the bathroom door, and held up his fist to knock. "'I am the Arch-Chancellor,' he grumbled, lowering it. "'I can open any doors I damn well please.' And he turned the handle. "'There,' he said as the door swung back. "'See, gentlemen, a perfectly ordinary bathroom, stone bath, brass taps, bath cap, humorous scrubbing brush in the shape of a duck, a perfectly ordinary bathroom. It is not... Let me make myself quite clear, some kind of tropical beach. It doesn't look remotely like a tropical beach. He pointed out the bathroom's open window to where waves lapped languorously against a tree-fringed strand under a brilliant blue sky. The bathroom curtains flapped on a warm breeze. That's a tropical beach, he said. See? No similarity at all. After his nourishing meal, that contained masses of essential vitamins and minerals, and, unfortunately, quite a lot of taste as well, the man with wizard on his hat settled down for some housekeeping, or as much as was possible in the absence of a house. It consisted of chipping away at a piece of wood with a stone axe. He appeared to be making a very short plank, and the speed with which he was working suggested he'd done this before. A cockatoo settled in the tree above him to watch, Rincewind glared at it suspiciously. 
When the plank had apparently been smoothed to his satisfaction, he stood on it with one foot, and swaying, drew around the foot with a piece of charcoal from the fire. He did the same with the other foot, and then settled down to hack at the wood again. The watcher in the waterhole realised that the man was making two foot-shaped boards. Rincewind took a length of twine from his pocket. He found a particular creeper which, if you carefully peeled the bark off, would give you a terrible spotted rash. What he'd actually been looking for was a creeper which, if you carefully peeled off the bark, would give you a serviceable twine, and it had taken several more goes and various different rashes to find out which one this was. If you made a hole in the soles and fed a loop of twine through it into which a toe could be inserted, you ended up with some ur uh, footwear. It made you shuffle like the ascent of man, but nevertheless had some unexpected benefits. Firstly, the steady flop-flop as you walked made you sound like two people to any dangerous creatures you were about to encounter, which in Rincewind's recent experience was any creature at all. Second, although they were impossible to run in, they were easy to run out of, so that you were a smoking dot on the burning horizon while the enraged caterpillar or beetle was still looking at your shoes and wondering where the other person was. He'd had to run away a lot. Every night he made a new pair of thonged sandals, and every day he left them somewhere in the desert. When he'd finished them to his satisfaction, he took a roll of thin bark from his pocket. Attached to it, by a length of twine, was a very precious small stub of pencil. he decided to keep a journal, in the hope that this might help. He looked at the recent entries. Probably Tuesday, hot, flies, dinner, Honey ants, attacked by honey ants, fell into waterhole. Wednesday, with any luck. Hot, flies. Dinner, either bush raisins or kangaroo droppings. Chased by hunters, don't know why, fell into waterhole. Thursday, could be. Hot, flies. Dinner, blue-tongued lizard. Savaged by blue-tongued lizard. Chased by different hunters, fell off cliff, bounced into tree, pissed on by small grey incontinent teddy bear, landed in a waterhole. Friday, hot flies. Dinner, some kind of roots which tasted like sick. This saved time. Saturday, hotter than yesterday. Extra flies. V thirsty. Sunday, hot. Delirious with thirst and flies. Nothing but nothing as far as the eye can see, with bushes in it. Decided to die. Collapsed, fell down sand dune, into waterhole. He wrote very carefully, and as small as possible, Monday. Hot. Flies. Dinner. Moth grubs. He stared at the writing. It said it all, really. Why didn't people here like him? He'd meet some small tribe, everything would be friendly, he'd pick up a few tips, get to know a few names, he'd build up a vocabulary, enough to chat about ordinary everyday things like the weather, and then suddenly they'd be chasing him away. After all, everyone talked about the weather, didn't they? Rincewind had always been happy to think of himself as a racist. The 100 metres, the mile, the marathon, he'd run them all. Later, when he'd learned with some surprise what the word actually meant, he'd been equally certain he wasn't one. He was a person who divided the world quite simply into people who were trying to kill him and people who weren't. That didn't leave much room for fine details like what colour anyone was. But he'd be sitting by the campfire, trying out a simple conversation, and suddenly people would get upset over nothing at all and drive him off. You didn't expect people to get nasty just because you'd said something like, ''My word, when did it last rain here?'' Did you? Rincewind sighed, picked up his stick, beat the hell out of a patch of ground, lay down and went to sleep. Occasionally, he screamed under his breath and his legs made running motions which just showed that he was dreaming. The waterhole rippled. It wasn't large, a mere puddle deep in a bush-filled gully between some rocks, and the liquid it contained could only be called water because geographers refused to countenance words like soup hole. Nevertheless, it rippled, as though something had dropped into the centre. And what was odd about the ripples was that they didn't stop when they reached the edge of the water, but continued outwards over the land as expanding circles of dim white light. When they reached Rincewind, they broke up and flowed around him, so that now he was the centre of concentric lines of white dots, like strings of pearls. The waterhole erupted. 
something climbed up into the air and sped away across the night. It zigzagged from rock to mountain to waterhole, and as the eye of observation rises, the travelling streak briefly illuminates other dim lines, hanging above the ground like smoke, so from above the whole land appears to have a circulatory system, or nerves. A thousand miles from the sleeping wizard, the line struck ground again, emerged in a cave, and passed across the walls like a searchlight. It hovered in front of a huge, pointed rock for a moment, and then, as if reaching a decision, shot up again into the sky. The continent rolled below it as it returned. The light hit the waterhole without a splash, but once again three or four ripples in something spread out across the turbid water and the surrounding sand. Night rolled in again. But there was a distant thumping under the ground. Bushes trembled. In the trees birds awoke and flew away. After a while, on a rock face near the waterhole, pale white lines began to form a picture. Rincewind had attracted the attention of at least one other watcher, apart from whatever it was that dwelt in the waterhole. Death had taken to keeping Rincewind's lifetimer on a special shelf in his study, in much the way that a zoologist would want to keep an eye on a particularly intriguing specimen. The lifetimers of most people were the classic shape that death thought was right and proper for the task. They appeared to be large egg timers, although since the sands they measured were the living seconds of someone's life, all the eggs were in one basket. Rincewind's hourglass looked like something created by a glass blower who'd had the hiccups in a time machine. According to the amount of actual sand it contained, and death was pretty good at making this kind of estimate, he should have died long ago. But strange curves and bends and extrusions of glass had developed over the years, and quite often the sand was flowing backwards, or diagonally. Clearly, Rincewind had been hit by so much magic, had been thrust reluctantly through time and space so often, that he'd nearly bumped into himself coming the other way, that the precise end of his life was now as hard to find as the starting point on a roll of really sticky transparent tape. Death was familiar with the concept of the eternal, ever-renewed hero, the champion with a thousand faces. He'd refrained from commenting. He met heroes frequently, generally surrounded by, and this was important, the dead bodies of very nearly all their enemies, and saying, What the hell just happened? Whether there was some arrangement that allowed them to come back again afterwards was not something he would be drawn on. But he pondered whether, if this creature did exist, it was somehow balanced by the eternal coward, the hero with a thousand retreating backs, perhaps. Many cultures had a legend of an undying hero who would one day rise again, so perhaps the balance of nature called for one who wouldn't. Whatever the ultimate truth of the matter, the fact now was that death did not have the slightest idea of when Rincewind was going to die. This was very vexing to a creature who prided himself on his punctuality. Death glided across the velvet emptiness of his study until he reached the model of the Discworld, if indeed it was a model. Eyeless sockets looked down. Show, he said. The precious metals and stones faded. Death saw ocean currents, deserts, forests, drifting cloudscapes like albino buffalo herds. Show! The eye of observation curved and dived into the living map and a reddish splash grew in an expanse of turbulent sea. Ancient mountain ranges slipped past, deserts of rock and sand glided away. Show! Death watched the sleeping figure of Rincewind. Occasionally, its legs would jerk. Hmm! Death felt something crawling up the back of his robe, pause for a minute on his shoulder and leap. A small rodent skeleton in a black robe landed in the middle of the image and started flailing madly at it with his tiny sides, squeaking excitedly. Death picked up the death of rats by his cowl and held him up for inspection. No, we don't do it that way. The death of rats struggled madly. Squeak? Because it's against the rules, said Death. Nature must take its course. He glanced down at the image again, as if a thought had struck him, and lowered the death of rats to the floor. Then he went to the wall and pulled a cord. Far away, a bell tolled. After a while, an elderly man entered carrying a tray. 
Sorry about that, master. I was cleaning the bath. I beg your pardon, Albert? I mean, that's why I was late with your tea, sir, said Albert. That is of no consequence. Tell me, what do you know of this place? Death's finger tapped the red continent. His manservant looked closely. Oh, there, he said. Terror incognita, we called it when I was alive, master. Never went there myself. It's the currents, you know. Many a poor sailorman has washed up on them fatal shores rather than get carried right over the rim and regretted it, I expect. Dry as a statue's t uh, very dry, master, or so they say. And hotter than a demon's jockstra, very hot too. But you must have been there yourself. Oh, yes. But you know how it is when you're there on business, and there's hardly any time to see the country. Death pointed to the great spiral of clouds that turned slowly around the continent, like jackals warily circling a dying lion, which looked done for, but which might yet be capable of one last bite. Very strange, he said. A permanent anti-cyclone. And inside a huge, calm land that never sees a storm and never has a drop of rain. Good place for a holiday, then. Come with me. The two of them, trailed by the death of rats, walked into Death's huge library. There were clouds here, up near the ceiling. Death held out a hand. I want, he said, a book about the dangerous creatures of Forex. Albert looked up and dived for cover, receiving only mild bruising because he had the foresight to curl into a ball. After a while, Death, his voice a little muffled, said, Albert, I would be so grateful if you could give me a hand here. Albert scrambled up and pulled at some of the huge volumes, finally dislodging enough of them to allow his master to clamber free. Hum. Death picked up a book at random and read the cover. Dangerous mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, fish, jellyfish, insects, spiders, crustaceans, grasses, trees, mosses, and lichens of the terror incognita, he read. His gaze moved down the spine. Volume 29C, he added. Oh, part three, I see. He glanced up at the listening shelves. Possibly it would be simpler if I asked for a list of the harmless creatures of the aforesaid continent. They waited. It would appear that... No, wait, master, here it comes. Albert pointed to something white, zigzagging lazily through the air. Finally, Death reached up and caught the single sheet of paper. He read it carefully and then turned it over briefly just in case anything was written on the other side. "'May I?' said Albert. Death handed him the paper. "'Some of the sheep,' Albert read aloud. "'Ah, oh, well, maybe a week at the seaside would be better, then.' "'What an intriguing place,' said Death. "'Saddle up the horse, Albert. I feel sure I'm going to be needed.' "'Squeak!' said the Death of Rats. "'Pardon?' "'He said, "'No worries, master,' said Albert.' I can't imagine why. Four huge blooms of silence rolled over the city as old Tom so emphatically did not strike the hour. Several servants rumbled a trolley along the corridor. The Arch-Chancellor had given in. An early breakfast was on the way. Ridcully lowered his tape measure. Yeah, let's try that again, shall we? he said. He stepped out of the window and picked a seashell out of the sand. It was warm from the sun. Then he pulled himself back into the bathroom and walked around to a door beside the window. It led to a dank, moss-grown light well, which allowed second-hand and grubby daylight into these dismal floors. Even the snow hadn't managed to get more than a brushing of flakes down this far. The window on this side glimmered in the light from the doorway like a pool of very black oil. OK, Dean, he said. Push your staff through. Now, waggle it about. The wizards looked at the gently rippling surface. 
There should have been several feet of solid wood sticking out of it. "'Well, well, well,' said the Arch-Chancellor, going back in out of the cold air. "'Do you know I've, I, I've never actually seen one of these?' "'Anyone remember Arch-Chancellor Budley's boots?' said the senior wrangler, helping himself to some cold mutton from the trolley. "'He made a mistake and got one of the things opened up in the left boot. Very tricky. You can't go walking around with one foot in another dimension.' "'Well, well, no,' said Ridcully, staring at the tropical scene and tapping his chin thoughtfully with the seashell. "'Can't see what you're treading in for one thing,' said the senior wrangler. "'One opened up in one of the cellars once all by itself,' said the dean. "'Just a round black hole. "'Anything you put in it just disappeared. "'So old Arch-Chancellor Weatherwax had a privy built over it.' "'Very sensible idea,' said Ridcully, still looking thoughtful. "'We thought so, too, until we found the other one that had opened in the attic. "'Turned out to be the other side of the same hole. "'I'm sure I don't need to draw you a picture.' "'I've never heard of these,' said Ponder Stibbons. "'The possibilities are amazing!' "'Everyone says that when they first hear about them,' said the senior wrangler. "'But when you've been a wizard as long as I have, my boy, "'you'll learn that as soon as you find anything that offers amazing possibilities "'for the improvement of the human condition, "'it's best to put the lid back on and pretend it never happened.' "'But if you could get one to open above another, "'you could drop something through the bottom hole "'and it had come out of the top hole "'and fall through the bottom hole again. "'It had reached meteoritic speed "'and the amount of power you could generate would be... "'That's pretty much what happened between the attic and the cellar,' "'said the dean, taking a cold chicken leg. "'Thank goodness for air friction, that's all I say.' "'Ponder waved his hand gingerly through the window "'and felt the sun's heat.' "'And no one's ever studied them?' he said. "'The senior wrangler shrugged. "'Studied what? They're just holes. "'You get a lot of magic in one place. "'It kind of drops through the world like a hot steel ball through pork dripping. "'If it comes to the edge of something, it kind of fills it in. "'Stress points in the space-time continuinuinuum,' said Ponder. "'There must be hundreds of uses.' Eh. "'Yes. No wonder our egregious professor is always so suntanned. said the dean. "'I feel he's been cheating. Geography should be hard to get to. "'It shouldn't be in your window box, is what I'm saying. "'You shouldn't get at it just by sneaking out of the university.' "'Well, he hasn't really, has he?' said the senior wrangler. "'He's really just extended his study a bit.' "'Do you think that is XXXX by any chance?' said the dean. It certainly looks foreign. Well, there is C, said the senior wrangler, but would you say that it looks as if it's actually girting? It's just, you know, just sloshing. One would somehow imagine that C that was girting something would look more, well, defiant, said the lecturer in recent rooms. You know, thundering waves and so on, definitely sending a message to outsiders that it was girting this coast and they'd better be jolly respectful. Perhaps we could go right through and investigate, said Ponder. Something dreadful will happen if we do, said the senior wrangler gloomily. Oh, it hasn't happened to the bursar, said Ridcully. The wizards crowded around. There was a figure standing in the surf. Its robe was rolled up above the knees. A few birds wheeled overhead. Palm trees waved in the background. My word, he must have snuck out while we weren't looking, said the senior wrangler. Bursa! Ridcully yelled. The figure didn't look around. I don't want to, you know, make trouble, said the chair of indefinite studies, looking wistfully at the sun-drenched beach, but it's... "'Freezing cold in my bedroom, and last night there was frost on my eiderdown. "'I don't see any harm in a quick stroll in the warm.' "'We're here to help the librarian,' snapped Ridcully. "'Faint snores were coming from the volume entitled Ook. "'My point exactly. "'The poor chap would be a lot happier in those trees there.' "'You mean we could... We could wedge him in the branches, 
said the Arch-Chancellor. He stilled the story of Ook. You know what I mean, Mustrum. A day at the seaside for him would be better than a day at the seaside, as it were. Let's get out there. I'm freezing. Are you mad? There could be terrible monsters. Look at the poor chap standing there in the surf. That sea's probably teeming with... with... Sharks, said the senior wrangler. Right, said Ridcully, and... Barracudas, said the senior wrangler. Marlins, swordfish. Looks like somewhere out near the rim to me. Fishermen say there's fish there that'll take your arm off. Right, said Ridcully, right. There was a small but significant change in his tone. Everyone knew about the stuffed fish on his walls. Arch-Chancellor Ridcully would hunt anything. The only cockerel still crowing within two hundred yards of the university these days stood under a cart to do it. "'And that jungle,' said the senior wrangler, sniffling, "'looks pretty damn dangerous to me. "'Could be anything in it. "'Fatal. "'Could be tigers and, and, and gorillas and elephants and, and pineapples. "'I wouldn't go near it. "'I'm with you, Arch-Chancellor. "'Better to freeze here than look some rabid man-eater in the eye.' Ridcully's own eyes were burning bright. He stroked his beard thoughtfully. Oh, tigers, eh? he said. Then his expression changed. Pineapples? Deadly, said the senior wrangler firmly. One of them got my aunt. We couldn't get it off her. I told her that's not the way you're supposed to eat them, but would she listen? The dean looked sidelong at his arch-chancellor. It was the glance of a man who also didn't want another night in a frigid bedroom and had suddenly worked out where the levers were. "'That gets my vault, Mustrum,' he said. "'Catch me going through some hole in space onto some warm beach with a sea teeming with huge fish and a jungle full of hunting trophies.' <laughs> he yawned like a bad poker player. "'No, it's me from a nice freezing bed. I don't know about you, Arch-Chancellor.' Uh, I think... Ridcully began. Yes? Clams, said the senior wrangler, shaking his head. Looks just the beach for the devils. You ask my cousin. You'll have to find a good medium first, though. They shouldn't ooze green, I said. They shouldn't bubble, I told him. But would he listen? The arch-chancellor was currently amongst those who wouldn't. You think that taking him out there would be just the thing for the librarian, do you? he said. Just the tonic for the poor old chap and an hour or two under that sun. But I expect we ought to be ready to protect him, eh, Arch-Chancellor? the dean said innocently. W why, yes, I hadn't really thought of that, said Ridcully. Hmm, mm, yes, yes, important point. Uh, better get them to bring down my my five hundred pound crossbow with the armor piercing arrows and my home taxidermy outfit and all ten fishing rods and all four tackle boxes and the big set of scales. Good thinking, Arch Chancellor, said the Dean. He may want to take a swim when he's feeling better. "'In that case,' said Ponder, "'I think I'll get my Thalma Delight and my notebooks. "'It's vital to work out where we are. "'It could be XXXX, I suppose. "'It looks very foreign.' "'I suppose I'd better fetch my reptile press "'and my herbarium,' said the Chair of Indefinite Studies, "'who had got there eventually. "'Much may be learned from the plants here, I'll wager.' I shall certainly endeavour to make a study of any primitive grass-skirted peoples hereabouts, added the dean, with a lawnmower look in his eyes. What about you, runes? said Ridcully. Me? Oh, er... Uh, the lecturer in recent runes looked wildly at his colleagues, who were nodding frantically at him. Um, this would be a good time to catch up on my reading, obviously. Right, said Ridcully, because we are not... And, and I want to make this very clear, we are not doing this in order to enjoy ourselves. Is that understood? What about the senior wrangler? said the dean, nastily. Me? Enjoy it? 
"'There might even be prawns out there,' said the senior wrangler, miserably. Ridcully hesitated. The other wizards shrugged when he glanced at them. Oh, "'Look, old chap,' he said eventually, "'I think I understood about the clams, "'and I've got a sort of mental picture about your granny uh, and the pineapple. "'My aunt, your, your, your aunt and the pineapple, "'but mm, what's deadly about prawns?' "'Eh, see how you like a crate of them dropping off the crane onto your head,' said the senior wrangler. "'My uncle didn't, I can tell you. "'Okay, I think I understand. "'Important safety tip, everyone,' said Ridcully. "'Avoid all crates, understood? "'But we are not here on some kind of holiday. "'Do you all understand me?' "'Absolutely,' said the wizards in unison. "'They all understood him.' Rincewind awoke with a scream to get it over with. Then he saw the man watching him. He was sitting cross-legged against the dawn. He was black, not brown or blue-black, but black as space. This place baked people. Rincewind pulled himself up and thought about reaching for his stick, and then he thought again. The man had a couple of spears stuck in the ground, and people here were good at spears, because if you didn't get efficient at hitting the things that moved fast, you had to eat the things that moved slowly. He was also holding a boomerang, and it wasn't one of those toy ones that came back. This was one of the big, heavy, gently curved sort that didn't come back because it was sticking in something's ribcage. You could laugh at the idea of wooden weapons until you saw the kind of wood that grew here. It had been painted with stripes of all colours, but it still looked like a business item. Rincewind tried to seem harmless. It required little in the way of acting. The Watcher regarded him in that sucking silence that you just have to fill, and Rincewind came from a culture where, if there was nothing to say, you said something. Um, said Rincewind, me, big fella, uh, fella, um, belong, um, um, damn, what's the... He gave up and glanced at the blue sky. Um, turned out nice again, he said. The man seemed to sigh stuck the boomerang into the strip of animal skin that was his belt, and in fact the whole of his wardrobe, and stood up. Then he picked up a leathery sack, slung it over one shoulder, took the spears, and without a backward glance, ambled off around a rock. This might have struck anyone else as rude, but Rincewind was always happy to see any heavily armed person walking away. He rubbed his eyes and contemplated the dismal task of subduing breakfast. You want some grub? The voice was almost a whisper. Rincewind looked around. A little way off was the hole from which last night's supper had been dug. Apart from that, there was nothing all the way to the infinite horizon but scrubby bushes and hot red rocks. I think I dug up most of them, he said weakly. Nah, mate. I've got to tell you the secret of finding tucker in the bush. There's always a beaut feed if you know where to look, mate. Um, how come you're speaking my language, mystery voice? said Rincewind. I ain't, said the voice. You're listening to mine. Gotta feed you up proper. Gonna sing you into a real bush tucker finder. True. Lovely grub, said Rincewind. Just you stand there and don't move. It sounded as though the unseen voice then began to chant very quietly through an unseen nose. Rincewind was, after all, a wizard. Not a good one, but he was sensitive to magic, and the chant was doing strange things. The hairs on the back of his hands tried to crawl up his arms, and the back of his neck began to sweat. His ears popped, and very gently the landscape began to spin around him. He looked down at the ground. There were his feet. Almost certainly his feet. And they were standing on the red earth and not moving at all. Things were moving round him. He wasn't dizzy, but by the look of it, the landscape was. The chanting stopped. There was a sort of echo, which seemed to happen inside his head, as if the words had been merely the shadow of something more important. Rincewind shut his eyes for a while, and then opened them again. Um, fine, he said. Very catchy. He couldn't see the speaker, so he spoke with that careful politeness you reserve for someone armed who is probably standing behind you. He turned. "'I expect you, um, had to go somewhere, did you?' he said to the empty air. 
Er... Uh, hello? Even the insects had gone quiet. Er... Uh, you haven't noticed a, a, a box walking around on legs, have you, by any chance? He tried to see if anyone could possibly be hiding behind a bush. It's, it's not important. It's just that it's got my clean underwear in it. The boundless silence made an eloquent statement about the universe's views on clean underwear. So, um, I'm going to know how to find food in the bush, right? He ventured. He glared at the nearest trees. They didn't look any more fruitful than before. He shrugged. What a strange person. He edged over to a flat stone and with a stick raised in case of resistance from anything below, pulled it up. There was a chicken sandwich underneath. It tasted rather like chicken. A little way away, behind the rocks near the water hole, a drawing faded into the stone. This was another desert elsewhere. No matter where you were, this place would always be elsewhere. It was one of those places further than any conceivable journey, but possibly as close as the far side of a mirror, or just a breath away. There was no sun in the sky here, unless the whole sky was sun. It glowed yellow. The desert underfoot was still red sand, but hot enough to burn. A crude drawing of a man appeared on a rock. Gradually, layer by layer, it got more complex, as if the unseen hand was trying to draw bones and organs and a nervous system and a soul. And he stepped onto the sand and put down his bag, which here seemed a lot heavier. He stretched his arms and cracked his knuckles. At least here he could talk normally. He daren't raise his voice down there in the shadow world, lest he raise mountains as well. He said a word which on the other side of the rock would have shaken trees and created meadows. It meant, in the true language of things which the old man spoke, something like trickster. A creature like him appears in many belief systems, although the jolly name can be misleading. Tricksters have that robust sense of humour that puts a landmine under a seat cushion for a bit of a laugh. A black and white bird appeared and perched on his head. You know what to do, said the old man. Him? What a wonga, said the bird. I've been looking at him. He's not even heroic. He's just in the right place at the right time. The old man indicated that this was maybe the definition of a hero. All right, but why not go and get the thing yourself, said the bird. You've got to have heroes, said the old man. And I suppose I'll have to help, said the bird. It sniffed, which is quite hard to do through a beak. Yep, off you go. The bird shrugged, which is easy to do if you have wings, and flew down off the old man's head. It didn't land on the rock, but flew into it. For a moment there was a drawing of a bird, and then it faded. Creators aren't gods. They make places, which is quite hard. It's men that make gods. This explains a lot. The old man sat down and waited. Confront a wizard with the concept of a bathing suit and he'll start to get nervous. Why does it have to be so skimpy, he'll ask. Where can I put the gold embroidery? How can you have any kind of costume without at least forty useful pockets? And occult symbols made out of sequins. There appears to be no place for them. And where, when you get right down to it, are the lapels? There is also the concept of acreage. It is vitally important that as large an amount of wizard as possible is covered, so that timid people and horses are not frightened. There may be strapping young wizards with copper-coloured skins and muscles as solid as a plank, but not after sixty years of UU dinners. It gives senior wizards what they think is called gravitas, but is more accurately called gravity. Also, it takes heavy machinery to part a wizard from his pointy hat. The chair of indefinite studies looked sidelong at the dean. They both wore a variety of garments in which red and white stripes predominated. Last one, into the waters, a man standing all by himself on the beach, he shouted. Wizards also enjoy a bit of fun, but never have much of a chance to develop the appropriate vocabulary. Out on a point of rock, surf washing over his bare feet... Mustrum Ridcully lit his pipe and cast a line on the end of which was such a fearsome array of spinners and weights that any fish it didn't hook, it might successfully bludgeon. The change of scenery seemed to be working on the librarian. Within a few minutes of being laid in the sunlight, he'd sneezed himself back into his old shape, and he now sat on the beach with a blanket around him and a fern leaf on his head. 
It was indeed a lovely day. It was warm, the sea murmured beautifully, the wind whispered in the trees. The librarian knew he ought to be feeling better, but instead he was beginning to feel extremely uneasy. He stared around him. The lecturer in recent rooms had gone to sleep with his book carefully shading his eyes. It had originally been entitled Principles of Thaumic Propagation, but because of the action of the sunlight and some specialised high-frequency vibrations from the sand granules on the beach, the words on the cover now read, The Omega Conspiracy. This isn't magic. It is a simple universal law. People always expect to use a holiday in the sun as an opportunity to read those books they've always meant to read. But an alchemical combination of sun, quartz crystals and coconut oil will somehow metamorphose any improving book into a rather thicker one with a name containing at least one Greek word or letter. The Gamma Imperative, the Delta Season, the Alpha Project, and in the more extreme cases, even the Mu Cow P Caper. Sometimes a hammer and sickle turn up on the cover. This is probably caused by sunspot activity, since they are invariably the wrong way round. It's just as well for the librarian that he sneezed when he did, or he might have ended up a thousand pages thick and crammed with weapons specifications. In the middle distance was the window. It hung in the air, a simple square into a shadowy room. The Arch-Chancellor hadn't trusted the window catch and had propped up the window with a piece of wood. A warning label pinned to it showed that some thought had gone into the wording. Do not remove this wood. Not even to see what happens. Important. There appeared to be some forest behind the beach which rose a little way up the side of a small yet quite pointy mountain, certainly not tall enough to have snow on it. Some of the trees lining the beach looked hauntingly familiar and spoke to the librarian of home. This was strange because he had been born in Moon Pond Lane, Ankh Morpork, next to the saddlemakers. But they spoke to the home in his bones. He had an urge to climb. But there was something wrong with the trees. He looked down at the pretty shells on the beach. There was something wrong with them, too. Creepily, worryingly wrong. A few birds wheeled overhead, and they were wrong. They were the right shape, as far as he knew, and they seemed to be making the right noises, but they were still wrong. Oh, dear. He tried to stop the sneeze as it gathered nasal momentum, but this is impossible for anyone who wants to continue to go through life with their eardrums. There was a snort, a clattering sound, and the librarian changed into something suitable for the beach. It is often said about desert environments that there is in fact a lot of nutritious food around, if only you know what to look for. Rincewind mused on this as he pulled a plate of chocolate-covered sponge cakes from their burrow. They had dried coconut flakes on them. He turned the plate cautiously. Well, you couldn't argue with it. He was finding food in the desert. In fact, he was even finding dessert in the desert. Perhaps it was some special talent hitherto undiscovered by the kind people who had occasionally shared their food with him in the last few months. They hadn't eaten this sort of thing. They'd ground up seeds and dug up skinny yams and eaten things with more eyeballs than the watch had found after that business with Medley the medical kleptomaniac. So something was going right for him. Out here in the red-hot wilderness, something wanted him to stay alive. This was a worrying thought. No one ever wanted him alive for something nice. This was Rincewind after several months. His wizardly robe was quite short now. Bits had been torn off or used as string or after some particularly resistant hors d'oeuvre as bandages. It showed his knees, and wizards are nowhere near championship standard at knees. They tend to appear, as the book might put it, a knobbly savage. But he'd kept his hat. He'd woven a new wide brim for it, and he'd had to restore the crown once or twice with fresh bits of robe, and most of the sequins had been replaced with bits of shell stitched on with grass, but it was still his hat, the same old hat. A wizard without a hat was just a sad man with a suspicious taste in clothes. A wizard without a hat wasn't anyone. Although this particular wizard had a hat, he didn't have keen enough eyes to see the drawing appear on a red rock half hidden in the scrub. It started off like a bird, then without any time being other than smears of ochre and charcoal that had been there for years, it began to change shape. He set off towards the distant mountains. 
They'd been in view for several days. He hadn't the faintest idea if they represented a sensible direction, but at least they were one. The ground shivered underfoot. It had been doing that once or twice a day for a while, and that was another odd thing, because this didn't look like volcano country. This was the kind of country where, if you watched a large cliff for a few hundred years, you might see a rock drop off, and you'd talk about it for ages. Everything about it said that it had got over all the more energetic geological exercises a long time ago, and was a nice, quiet country which, in other circumstances, a man might be at home in. He became aware after a while that a kangaroo was watching him from the top of a small rock. He'd seen the things before, bounding away through the bushes. They didn't usually hang around when there were humans about. This one was stalking him. They were vegetarian, weren't they? It wasn't as though he was wearing green. Finally, it sprang out of the bushes and landed in front of him. It brushed one ear with a paw and gave Rincewind a meaningful look. It brushed the other ear with the other paw and wrinkled its nose. Yes, fine, good, said Rincewind. He started to edge away and then stopped. After all, it was just a big, well, rabbit, with a long tail and the kind of feet you normally see associated with red noses and baggy pants. I'm not frightened of you, he said. <laughs> Why should I be frightened of you? Well, said the kangaroo, I could kick your stomach out through your neck. Ah, you can talk. You're a quick one said the kangaroo. It rubbed an ear again. Something wrong, said Rincewind. No, that's the kangaroo language. I'm trying it out. What, one scratch for yes and one for no, that sort of thing. The kangaroo scratched an ear and then remembered itself. Yep, it said. It wrinkled its nose. And the uh, wrinkling, said Rincewind. Ah, oh, that means come quick, someone's fallen down a deep hole, said the kangaroo. That one gets used a lot. You'd be amazed. And what's kangaroo for? You are needed for a quest of the utmost importance, said Rincewind, with guileful innocence. You know, it's funny you should ask that. The sandals barely moved. Rincewind rose from them like a man leaving the starting blocks, and when he landed his feet were already making running movements in the air. After a while the kangaroo came alongside and accompanied him in a series of easy bounds. Why are you running away without even listening to what I have to say? I've had a long experience of being me, panted Rincewind. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be dragged into things that shouldn't concern me, and you're just a uh, hallucination caused by rich food on an empty stomach, so don't you try and stop me. Stop you, said the kangaroo, when you're heading in the right direction? Rincewind tried to slow down, but his method of running was very efficiently based on the idea that stopping was the last thing he'd do. Legs still moving, he ran out over the empty air and plunged into the void. The kangaroo looked down and, with a certain amount of satisfaction, wrinkled its nose. Arch-Chancellor! Ridcully awoke and sat up. The lecturer in recent runes was hurrying up, out of breath. "'The bursar and I uh, went for a walk along the beach,' he said. And, "'And can you guess where we ended up?' "'In Kidling Street, Quirm,' said Ridcully tartly, "'brushing an exploring beetle off his beard. "'That little bit by the tea shop with the trees in it.' "'That's astonishing, Arch-Chancellor, "'because you know, in fact, we, we didn't. "'We wound up back here. "'We are on a tiny island. "'Were you having a rest?' A few moments uh, cogitating, said Ridcully. Any idea where we are yet, Mr. Stibbons? Ponder looked up from his notebook. I won't be able to work out that precisely until sundown, sir, but I think we're pretty close to the rim. And I think we found where the Professor of Cruel and Unusual Geography has been camping, said the lecturer in recent runes. He rummaged in a deep pocket. There was a camp and a fireplace, bamboo furniture and what not, socks on a washing line, and this. He pulled out the remains of a small notebook. It was standard UU issue. Ridcully would never let anyone have a new one until they'd filled up every page on both sides. It was just lying there, said the lecturer in recent runes. I'm afraid ants have been eating it. Ridcully flicked it open and read the first page. Some interesting observations on Mono Island, he said. A most singular place. He flicked through the rest of the book. Just a list of plants and fishes, he said. Doesn't look all that special to me, but then I ain't a geography man.
Why is he calling it Mono Island? It means one island, said Ponder. Well, you've just told me it is one island, said Ridcully. Anyway, I can see several more out there. Severe lack of imagination, I suggest. He tucked the notebook into his robe. Right then, no sign of the chap himself? Strangely, no. Probably went, went swimming and was eaten by a pineapple, said Ridcully. How's the librarian doing, Mr Stibbons? Comfortable, is he? You should know, sir, said Ponder. You've been sitting on him for three quarters of an hour. Ridcully looked down at the deck chair. It was covered with red fur. Oh, um, uh, this is... Um, yes, sir. I thought perhaps our geography man had brought it with him. Not uh, with the uh, black toenails, sir. Ridcully appeared further. Oh, uh, uh, should I get up, do you think? Well, he is a deck chair, sir, so being sat on is a perfectly normal activity for him, I suppose. We, 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 we must find a cure, Stibbons. This is too strange. Cooey, gentlemen! There was activity in front of the window. It centred around a vision in pink, although admittedly the sort of vision associated with the more erratic kind of hallucinogen. In theory, there is no dignified way for a lady of a certain age to climb through a window, but nevertheless, this one was attempting it. In fact, she moved with more than dignity, which is something that is given away free with kings and bishops. What she had was respectability, which is homemade out of cast iron. However, at some point she would have to show a bit of ankle, and she was wedged awkwardly on the sill while trying to prevent this from happening. The senior wrangler coughed. If he had been wearing a tie, he would have straightened it. Ah, said Ridcully, the inestimable Mrs. Whitlow. Someone go and give her a hand. Stibbons. I'll help, said the senior wrangler, just a little faster than he meant. The senior wrangler had once walked past Mrs. Whitlow's rooms when the door was open, and he'd caught sight of the bare, headless, armless dressmaker's dummy that she used to make all her own clothes. He'd had to go lie down quietly after that, and ever since had thought about Mrs. Whitlow in a special way. The university's housekeeper turned and spoke to someone unseen beyond the window and then turned back, her shouting at subordinates' expression briefly visible before it was eclipsed by her much sunnier talking-to-wizards one. The chair of indefinite studies had once upset the senior wrangler by saying that the housekeeper had a face full of chins but there was a glossiness about her that put some people in mind of a candle that had been kept in the warm for too long. There wasn't anything approaching a straight line anywhere on Mrs Whitlow until she found that something hadn't been dusted properly when you could use her lips as a ruler. Most of the faculty walked in dread of her. She had strange powers they couldn't quite get a grip on, like the ability to get the beds made and the windows washed. A wizard who could wield a staff crackling with power against dreadful monsters from some ghastly region was nevertheless quite capable of picking up a feather duster by the wrong end and seriously injuring himself with it. At Mrs Whitlow's whim, people's clothes got washed and socks got darned. Wizards lack the HW chromosome in their genes. Feminist researchers have isolated this as one which allows people to see the washing up in sinks before the life forms growing there have actually invented the wheel or discovered slewed. If anyone annoyed her, they found their study spring-cleaned more often than was good for them, and since to a wizard his room is as personal an item as his trouser pocket, this was a terrible vengeance. "'I just thought you gentlemen would like a morning snack,' she said, as the wizards helped her down. "'So I took the liberty of getting the girls to put together a cold collation. "'I'll just go and fetch it.' The Arch-Chancellor stood up hastily. Uh, "'Well done, Mrs Whitlow!' Uh, "'A morning snack,' said the senior wrangler. "'It looks like mid-afternoon to me.' His tone made it clear that if Mrs Whitlow wanted it to be the morning, he wasn't going to cause any trouble. "'Speed of light crossing the disc,' said Ponder. "'We are close to the rim, I'm sure. "'I'm trying to remember how you tell the time by looking at the sun.' "'I should leave it for a while.' said the senior wrangler, squinting under his hand. It's too bright to see the numbers at the moment. Ridcully nodded happily. I'm sure we could all do with a snack, 
he said. Something suitable for the beach, perhaps. Cold pork and mustard, said the dean, waking up. Possibly some beer, said the senior wrangler. And have we got any of those, those, those pies? You know the ones with the egg inside them, said the lecturer in recent rooms. Although I must say I've always thought that it was rather cruel to the chicken. There was a soft little sound, very similar to the one you get aged around seven when you stick your finger in your mouth and flick it out again quickly and think it's incredibly funny. Ponder turned his head, dreading the sight he was about to see. Mrs Whitlow had a tray of cutlery in one hand and was prodding ineffectually at the air with the stick she held in the other. "'I only moved it to get things through,' she said. "'No, I can't seem to quite find where the silly thing is supposed to go.' Where there had been a dark rectangle opening into the geographer's dingy study, there was now only waving palms and sunlit sand. Strictly speaking, it could be said to be an improvement. It depended on your point of view. Rincewind surfaced, gasping for breath. He'd fallen into a water hole. It was in... well, it looked as though once there had been a cave and the roof had collapsed. There was a big circle of blue right above him. Rocks had fallen down here and sand had blown in and seeds had taken root. Cool, damp and green, the place was a little oasis tucked away from the sun and the wind. He pulled himself out of the water and looked around while he drained off. Vines had grown among the rocks. A few small trees had managed to take root in the crack. 
There was even a little bit of beach. By the look of the stains on the rocks, the water had once been a lot higher. And there, Rincewind sighed, wasn't that just typical? You got some quiet little beauty spot miles from anywhere, and there was always some graffiti artist ready to spoil it. It was like that time when he was hiding out in the Moorpork Mountains, and right in the back of one of the deepest caves, some vandal had drawn loads of stupid bulls and antelopes. Rincewind had been so disgusted he'd wiped them off, and they'd left lots of old bones and junk lying around. Some people had no idea how to behave. Here they'd covered the rock walls with drawings in white, red and black. Animals again, Rincewind noticed. They didn't even look particularly realistic. He stopped, water dripping off him in front of one. Someone had probably wanted to draw a kangaroo. There were the ears and the tail and the clown feet, but they looked alien and there were so many lines and cross hatchings that the figure seemed odd. It looked as though the artist hadn't just wanted to draw a kangaroo from the outside, but had wanted to show the inside as well, and then had wanted to show the kangaroo last year and today and next week, and also what it was thinking, all at the same time, and had set out to do the whole thing with some ochre and a stick of charcoal. It seemed to move in his head. He blinked, but it still hurt. His eyes seemed to want to wander off in different directions. Rincewind hurried further along the cave, ignoring the rest of the paintings. The piled rubble of the collapsed ceiling reached nearly to the surface, but there was space on the other side going on into the darkness. It looked as though he was in a piece of tunnel that had collapsed. You walked right past it, said the kangaroo. He turned. It was standing on the little beach. I didn't see you get down here, said Rincewind. How'd you get down here? Come on, I've got to show you something. You can call me Scrappy if you like. Why? We're mates, ain't we? I'm here to help you. Oh, dear. Can't make it alone across this land, mate. How do you think you've survived so far? Water's bloody hard to find out there these days. No, oh, I don't know. I just kept falling into... Um... Rincewind stopped. Yeah, said the kangaroo. Strike you as odd, does it? I thought I was just naturally lucky, said Rincewind. He thought about what he'd just said. I must have been crazy. There weren't even flies down here. There was the occasional faint ripple on the water, and that wasn't comforting since there wasn't apparently anything to stir the surface. Up above, the sun was torching the ground and the flies swarmed like, well, flies. Why isn't there anyone else here, he said. Come and see, said the kangaroo. Rincewind raised his hands and backed away. Are we talking teeth and stings and fangs? Just look at that painting there, mate. What, the one of the kangaroo? Which one's that, mate? Rincewind looked along the wall. The kangaroo picture wasn't where he remembered it. I could have sworn, that's the one I want you to look at over there. Rincewind looked at the stone. What it showed, outlined in red ochre, were dozens of hands. He sighed. Oh, right, he said wearily. I see the problem. Exactly the same thing happens to me. What are you talking about, mister? It's just the same with me when I try to take snaps with an iconograph, said Rincewind. You set up a nice picture, the demon paints away, and when you look at it, whoops, you had your thumb in the way. I must have got a dozen pictures of my thumb. Now I can see your lad there doing his painting in a bit of a hurry, got his brush already, and then splush. He'd forgotten to take his hand off the... No, it's the painting underneath I'm talking about, mister. Rincewind looked closer. There were fainter lines there, which you'd think were just flaws in the rock if you weren't looking. Rincewind squinted. Other lines seemed to fit. Yes, someone had painted figures. They were... He blew away some sand. Yes, they were curiously familiar. Yes, said Scrappy, his voice apparently coming from a distance. Look a bit like you, don't they? But they're... He began, he straightened up. How long have these paintings been here? Well, let's see, said the kangaroo. Out of the sun and the weather, nothing to disturb them. <sighs> 20,000 years? That's not right. Nah, true, probably 30,000 in a nice sheltered spot like this. But these are, that's my... Of course, when I say 30,000 years, said the kangaroo, I mean it depends how you look at it. 
Even them hand paintings on the top there have been 5,000 years, see? And those faint ones, oh, yeah, got to be pretty old, tens of thousands of years, except, uh... Except what? They weren't here last week, mate. You're saying they've been here for ages, but not for very long. See, I knew you was clever. And now you're going to tell me what the hell you're talking about? Right. Um, excuse me, I'll just find something to eat. Rincewind lifted up a rock. There were a couple of jam sandwiches underneath. The wizards were civilised men of considerable education and culture. When faced with being inadvertently marooned on a desert island, they understood immediately that the first thing to do was place the blame. It really was very clear, shouted Ridcully, waving his hand frantically in the air at the place where the window had been. And I put a sign on it. Yes, but you've got a do not disturb sign nailed to your study door, said the senior wrangler, and you still expect Mrs Whitlow to bring you your tea in the mornings. "'Gentlemen, please,' said Ponder Stibbons. "'We've got to sort some things out right now.' "'Yes, indeed,' roared the Dean. "'And it was his fault. "'The sign wasn't large enough.' "'I mean, we have to—' "'There are ladies present,' snapped the senior wrangler. "'Lady!' Mrs Whitlow uttered the word carefully "'and with deliberation, like a gambler putting down a winning hand.' She stood primly watching them. Her expression said, I'm not worried, because with all these wizards around, nothing bad can happen. The wizards adjusted their attitudes. I do apologise if I've done something wrong, she said. Oh, oh, no, no, not, not wrong, said Ridcully quickly. Not exactly wrong as such. Anyone could have done it, said the senior wrangler. I could hardly read the lettering myself. And, and taking the broad view, it's certainly better to be stuck out here in the fresh air and sunshine than in that stuffy study, Ridcully went on. That's quite a broad view, sir, said Ponder doubtfully. And, and we'll be back home in two shakes of a lamb's tail, said Ridcully, beaming. Unfortunately, this doesn't look a very um, agricultural sort of... Ponder began. Figure of speech, Mr. Stibbons, figure of speech. The sun's going down, sir, Ponder persisted, which means it'll be night time soon. Ridcully looked nervously at Mrs. Whitlow and then at the sun. Is there a problem, said Mrs. Whitlow. Oh, good heavens, no, said Ridcully hastily. "'A notice the little hole in the wall doesn't seem to have come back,' said Mrs Whitlow. "'We, um, it's a little prank, is it?' the housekeeper went on. "'I'm sure you gentlemen will have your fun and no mistake.' "'Yes, that's, but A should be grateful if you would send me back now, Arch-Chancellor. "'We're doing the laundry this afternoon and I'm afraid we're having a lot of trouble with the Dean's sheets.' The dean suddenly knew how a mosquito feels in the beam of a searchlight. "'We'll sort this out directly. Never fear, Mrs Whitlow,' said Ridcully, not taking his eyes off the wretched dean. "'In the meantime, why don't you take a seat and enjoy the rather wonderful sheets? I, I, I mean, sunshine.' There was a clack as the deck chair folded itself up. Then it sneezed. "'Ah, back with us again, librarian,' Ridcully went on, as the orangutan sprawled in the sand. "'Help him up, please, Mr Stibbons. Uh, a, a word to the rest of you, please, if you'll excuse us a moment. Mrs Whitlow, a faculty meeting.' The wizards went into a huddle. "'It was tomato sauce, all right,' said the dean hurriedly. "'I just happened to be having a snack in bed, and, and you know how that stuff stains.' I, "'I'm sure we're not at all interested in the state of your sheets, dean,' said Ridcully. "'No, indeed,' said the senior wrangler brightly. "'Not us,' said the lecturer in recent runes, slapping the dean on the back. We, we, "'We have to get back,' said Ridcully. "'We can't spend the night alone with Mrs Whitlow. "'It wouldn't be decent.' "'I don't see why anyone should make a fuss about a bit of tomato sauce. "'I at least cleaned all the beans off.' "'Well, we're, we're not actually alone, are we? Not as such,' said the lecturer in recent runes. "'I mean, there's, there's seven of us, not including the librarian.' 
Yes, but we're all alone together, said Ridcully urgently. There could be talk. Uh, what about? said the chair of indefinite studies, who sometimes lagged behind. You know, said the lecturer in recent rooms, seven men and, and, and one <clears throat> woman it, it doesn't bear thinking about. Well, I, for one, will certainly veto any suggestion about ordering uh, another six women, said the chair firmly. Perhaps the hole will open again, said the senior wrangler. I, I doubt it, said Ridcully. Ponder says that our coming through probably altered the, the thaumostatic balance. What do you think, Dean? Just tomato sauce, said the Dean. It could have happened to anyone. I meant about our being marooned on this island, said Ridcully. Any ideas, anyone? We must tackle this as a team. What shall we tell Mrs Whitlow? whispered the senior wrangler. She thinks this is a prank. Senior wrangler, we are elderly, wise and experienced wizards, said Ridcully. Students are prankers. Pranksters, possibly, mumbled Ponder Stibbons. Whatever, we do not indulge in pranks. With us, it's a fully-fledged, gold-embossed cock-up, or nothing, said the lecturer in recent rooms. I don't see why people are making such a fuss about a bit of tomato sauce that hardly even shows up, muttered the dean. No one, no one brought any suitable spells, said Ridcully. At four in the morning, for the beach, said the lecturer in recent rooms. Of course not. Then we shall have to fall back on our own resources. There's bound to be a ship along sooner or later. The point is, gentlemen, he added, that we are the product of a university education. I'm quite sure primitive people have no difficulty surviving in a place like this. And, and, and think of all the things we have that our rude forefathers lacked. Mrs. Whitlow, for a start, said the chair of indefinite studies. She wouldn't put up with rudeness of any sort. The senior wrangler agreed. Do you know anything about boats, Dean? I believe you got a brown for rowing when you were slimmer, said Ridcully. Please note that this question did not raise the matter of sheets in any way. Well, indeed, boat building is not a difficult task, said the Dean, surfacing. Even primitive people can build boats, and we are civilised men, after all. Then you're head of the boat building committee, said Ridcully. Senior Wrangler can help you. The rest of you fellows had better see if there's any fresh water and food. Knock down a few coconuts, uh, uh, that sort of thing. And what will you do, Arch Chancellor? said the senior Wrangler nastily. I shall be the protein acquisition committee, said Ridcully, waving his fishing rod. You going to stand there and fish again? What good's that going to do? It might result in a fish dinner, senior wrangler. Has anyone got any tobacco? said the dean. I'm dying for a smoke. The wizards went off about their tasks, complaining and blaming one another. And just inside the forest, in the leafy debris, roots unfolded and a number of very small plants began to grow like hell. This is the last continent, said Scrappy. It was put together last... And differently. Looks pretty old to me, said Rincewind. Ancient. Those hills look as old as the hills. They were made 30,000 years old, said the kangaroo. Come on, they look millions of years old. Yep, 30,000 years ago, they were made a million years ago. Time here is, the kangaroo shrugged, not the same. It was... Glued together differently, right? Search me, said Rincewind. I'm a man sitting here listening to a kangaroo. I'm not arguing. I'm trying to find words you might understand, said the kangaroo reproachfully. Good, keep going, you'll get there. Want a jam sandwich? It's gooseberry. Nah, strictly herbivore, mate. Listen, unusual gooseberry jam. I mean, you don't often see it. Raspberry and strawberry, yes, even blackcurrant. I shouldn't think more than one jar of jam in a hundred is gooseberry. Sorry, sorry, do go on. 
You're taking this seriously, are you? Am I smiling? Have you ever noticed how time goes slower in big spaces? The sandwich stopped halfway to Rincewind's mouth. Actually, that is true, but it only seems slower. So? When this place was made, there wasn't much space and time left over to work with, see? He had to budge them together to make them work harder. Time happens to space, and space happens to time. You know, I think there could be a plum in it too, said Rincewind, his mouth full, and maybe some, mm, some rhubarb. You'd be amazed how often they do that sort of thing. You know, stuff cheaper fruitin. I met this man in an inn once. He worked for a jam maker in Ark Moorpork, and he said they put in any old rubbish and some red dye. And I said, what about the raspberry pips? And he said they make them out of wood. Wood! He said they'd got a machine for stamping them out. Can you believe that? Will you stop talking about jam and be sensible for a moment? Rincewind lowered the sandwich. Good grief, I hope not, he said. I'm sitting in a cave in a country where everything bites you and it never rains, and I'm talking, no offence, to a herbivore that smells of a carpet in a house where there are a lot of excitable puppies, and I've suddenly got this talent for finding jam sandwiches and inexplicable fairy cakes in unexpected places, and I've been shown something very odd in a picture on some old cave wall, and suddenly said kangaroo tells me time and space are all wrong and wants me... To be sensible. What, when you get right down to it, is in it for me? Look, this place wasn't finished, right? It wasn't fitted in, turned around. The kangaroo looked at Rincewind as if reading his mind, which was the case. You know, like with a jigsaw puzzle, the last piece is the right shape, but you have to turn it round to fit, right? Now, think of the piece as a bloody big continent that's got to be turned around through about nine dimensions, and you're home and... Dry, said Rincewind. Bloody right. Er, uh, um, I know this may seem like a foolish question, said Rincewind, trying to dislodge a gooseberry pip from a tooth cavity, but why me? It's your fault. You arrived here and suddenly things had always been wrong. Rincewind looked back towards the wall. The earth trembled again. Can you hop that past me again, he said. Something went wrong in the past. The kangaroo looked at Rincewind's blank, jam-smeared expression and tried again. Your arrival caused a wrong note, it ventured. What in? The creature waved a paw vaguely. All this, it said. You could call it a bloody multidimensional knuckle of localised phase space, or maybe you could just call it the song. Rincewind shrugged. I don't mind putting my hand up to killing a few spiders, he said, but it was me or them. I mean, some of those come at you at head height. You changed history. Oh, come on. A few spiders don't make that much difference. Some of them were using their webs as trampolines. It was a case of boing and, and then the next moment. No, not history from now on. History that's already happened, said the kangaroo. I've changed things that already happened long ago. Right. By arriving here, I changed what's already happened? Yep. Look... Time isn't as straightforward as you think. I never thought it was, said Rincewind, and I've been round it a few times. The kangaroo waved a paw expansively. It's not just that things in the future can affect things in the past, he said. Things that didn't happen but might have happened can affect things that really happened. Even things that happened and shouldn't have happened and were removed still have, ah, call them shadows in time. Things left over which interfere with what's going on. Between you and me, it went on, waggling its ears, it's all just held together by spit now. No one's ever got round to tidying it up. I'm always amazed when tomorrow follows today, and that's the truth. Me too, said Rincewind. Oh, me too. Still, no worries, eh? I think I'll lay off the jam, said Rincewind. He put the sandwich down. Why me? The kangaroo scratched its nose. It's got to be someone, it said. And what am I supposed to do, said Rincewind? Wind it into the world. There's a key? Might be. Depends. 
Rincewind turned and looked at the rock pictures again. The pictures that hadn't been there a few weeks ago and then suddenly had always been there. Figures holding long sticks, figures in long robes. The artist had done a pretty good job of drawing something quite unfamiliar. And in case there was any doubt, you only had to look at what was on their heads. Yeah, we call them the pointy heads, said the kangaroo. He started catching fish, said the senior wrangler. That means he'll come over all smug and start asking what plans we've got for making a boat any minute. You know what he's like. The dean looked at some sketches he'd made on a rock. How hard can it be to build a boat, he said. People with bones in their noses build boats, and we are the end product of thousands of years of enlightenment. Building a boat is not beyond men like us, senior wrangler. Quite, Dean. All we have to do is search this island until we find a book with a title like Practical Boat Building for Beginners. Exactly. It'll be plain sailing after that, Dean. <laughs> he glanced up and swallowed hard. Mrs Whitlow was sitting on a log in the shade, fanning herself with a large leaf. The sight stirred things in the senior wrangler, he was not at all sure what they were, but little details like the way something creaked when she moved twanged bits of the senior wrangler as well. You all right, senior wrangler? You look as if the heat is getting to you. Just a little... <clears throat> warm, Dean. The Dean looked past him as he loosened his collar. Well, they haven't been long, he said. The other wizards were walking down the beach. One advantage of a long wizarding robe is that it can be held like an apron, and the chair of indefinite studies was bulging at the front even more than usual. Found anything to eat? said the senior wrangler. Er, uh, yes. Fruit and nuts, I suppose, grumbled the dean. Er, um, yes, and, and then again, no, said the lecturer in recent runes. Mm, it's rather odd. The chair of indefinite studies let his burden spill out onto the sand. There were coconuts, other nuts of various sizes, and assorted hairy or knobbly vegetable things. All rather primitive, said the dean, and probably poisonous. Well, the bursar's been eating things like there's no tomorrow, said the lecturer in recent runes. The bursar burped happily. That doesn't mean there will be, said the dean. What's up with you fellows? You keep looking at one another. Um, we, we've tasted a few things too, dean said the lecturer in recent runes. Ah, I see the gatherers have returned, roared Ridcully happily, walking towards them. He waved three fish on a string. Anything resembling potatoes in there, chaps? You're not going to believe any of this, mumbled the lecturer in recent runes. You're going to accuse us of trickery. What are you talking about, said the dean. They don't look very tricky to me. The chair of indefinite studies gave a sigh. Have a coconut, he said. Did they go off bang or something? No, nothing like that at all. The dean picked up a nut, gave it a suspicious look, and banged it on a stone. It fell into two exact halves. There was no milk to spill out. Inside the husk was a brown inner shell full of soft white fibres. Ridcully picked up a bit of it and sniffed. Ah. I don't believe this, he said. That's not natural. So, said the dean, it's a coconut full of coconut. What's odd about that, then? The arch-chancellor broke off a piece of the shell and handed it over. It was soft and slightly crumbly. The dean tasted it. Chocolate, he said. Ridcully nodded. Dairy milk by the taste of it, with a creamy coconut filling. That's not possible, said the dean, his cheeks bulging. Spit it out, then. I think I might perhaps try a little more, said the dean, swallowing. In a spirit of inquiry, you understand. The senior wrangler picked up a knobbly bluish nut about the size of a fist and tapped it experimentally. It shattered, but was held together because of the gooey contents. The smell was very familiar. A careful taste confirmed it. The wizards regarded the nut's innards in shocked silence. It's even got the blue veins, said the senior wrangler. Yes, we know, we tried one, said the chair of indefinite studies weakly. And after all, 
There is such a thing as bread fruit. Mm, I, I, I've heard of it, said Ridcully, and I might believe there's such a thing as a naturally chocolate-covered coconut, because chocolate's a kind of um, potato. A bean, possibly, said Ponder Stibbons. Whatever, but I damn well don't believe there's such a thing as a mature, l'encre blue, runny cheese nut. He prodded the thing. But nature does come up with some very funny coincidences, Arch-Chancellor, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. Why, I myself, as a child, once dug up a carrot, which, <laughs> most amusingly, looked just like a man with an... Uh, said the Dean. It was only a little sound, but it had a certain portentous quality. They turned to look at him. He'd been peeling away the yellowing husk from something like a small bean pod. What he now held were... Ah, yes, good joke, said Ridcully. They certainly don't grow on tree. I didn't do anything. Look, it's still got bits of pith and stuff on it, said the dean, waving the thing wildly. Ridcully took it, sniffed it, held it up to his ear and shook it, and then said quietly, Um, uh, show me where you found it, will you? The bush was in a small clearing. Dozens of the little green shoots hung down between its tiny leaves. Each was tipped by a flower, but the flowers were curling up and falling off. The crop was ripe. Multicoloured beetles zoomed away from the bush as the dean selected a pod and peeled it open, revealing a slightly damp white cylinder. He examined it for a few seconds, then put one end in his mouth, took a box of matches from a pocket in his hat and lit up. Mmm, quite a smooth smoke, he said. His hand shook slightly as he took the cigarette out of his mouth and blew a smoke ring. "'Cork filter, too,' he said. Uh, "'Well, both tobacco and cork are naturally occurring vegetable products,' quavered the Chair of Indefinite Studies. "'Chair?' said Ridcully. "'Yes, Arch-Chancellor?' "'Shut up, will you?' Y "'Yes, Arch-Chancellor.' Ponder Stibbons broke open a cork tip. There was a tiny ring of what might well have been... Seeds, he said, but that can't be right, because the dean, wreathed in blue smoke, had been staring at the nearby vines. Has it occurred to anyone else that those pods are remarkably rectangular, he said. Go for it, dean, said Ridcully. A brown outer husk was pulled aside. Ah, said the dean. Biscuits. Just the thing with cheese. Um, said Ponder. He pointed. Just beyond the bush, a couple of boots lay on the ground. Rincewind ran his fingers over the cave wall. The ground shook again. What's causing that? he said. Oh, some people say it's an earthquake. Some say it's the country drying up. Others say it's a giant snake rushing through the ground, said Scrappy. Which is it? The wrong sort of question. They definitely looked like wizards, thought Rincewind. They had that basic cone shape familiar to anyone who'd been to Unseen University. They were holding staffs. Even with the crude materials available to them, the ancient artists had managed to portray the knobs on the ends. But Yu Yu hadn't even existed 30,000 years ago. Then he noticed, for the first time, the drawing right at the end of the cave. There were a lot of the ochre handprints on top of it, Almost, and the thought expanded in his mind in a sneaky way, as though someone had thought that they could hold it down onto the rock, prevent it, this was a silly thought he knew, prevent it from getting out. He brushed away some dust. Oh, no, he mumbled. It was an oblong box. The artist hadn't got the hang of conventional perspective, but there was no doubt that he'd tried to paint hundreds of little legs. That's my luggage. Always the same, right? said Scrappy behind him. You arrive okay, and your luggage ends up somewhere else. Thousands of years in the past? Could be a valuable antique. It's got my clothes in it. They'll probably be back in style then. You don't understand. It's a magical box. It's supposed to end up where I am. It probably is where you are. Just not when. What? Oh. I told you time and space were all stirred up, didn't I? You wait till you're on your journey. There's places where there's several times happening at once and places where there's hardly any time at all. And times when there's hardly any place. You've got to sort it out, right? 
What, like shuffling cards? said Rincewind. He made a mental note about on your journey. Yep. That's impossible. You know, I'd have said so too, but you will do it. Now you'll have to concentrate about this bit, right? Scrappy took a deep breath. <gasps> I know you're going to do it because you've already done it. Rincewind put his head in his hands. I told you about time and space here being mixed up, said the kangaroo. I've already saved the country, have I? Yep. Oh, good. Well, that wasn't so difficult. I don't want much. Um, a medal, perhaps? A grateful thanks of the population, maybe? A small pension and a, a ticket home? He looked up. I'm not going to get any of that, though, am I? No, because I haven't already done it yet. Exactly. You're getting the hang of it. You have to go and do what we know you're going to do because you've already done it. In fact, if you hadn't done it already, I wouldn't be here to make sure it gets done, so you'd better do it. Facing, um, terrible dangers? The kangaroo waved a paw. Slightly terrible, it said, and go for many miles of a parched and trackless terrain. Well, yeah, we haven't got any other sort. Rincewind brightened up slightly, and I'll meet comrades whose strengths and skills will be a great help to me. Don't bet on it. Any chance of a magic sword? What would you do with a magic sword? Fair enough, fair enough, forget the magic sword. But I've got to have something. Cloak of invisibility, potion of strength, something like that. That stuff's for people who know how to use them, mister. You'll have to rely on your native wit. I've got nothing. What sort of a quest is that? Can't you give me any hints? You may have to drink some beer, said the kangaroo. It cringed back for a moment, as if confident of facing a storm of objections. Rincewind said, Oh, right. Oh, well, I know how to do that. Um, what direction am I supposed to go? Ah, you'll find it. And when I get to where I'm going, what am I supposed to do? It'll be obvious, right? And how will I know I've done it? The wet will come back. The wet what? It'll rain. I thought it never rained here, said Rincewind. See, I knew you were smart. The sun was setting. The rocks around the edge of the cave glowed red. Rincewind stared at them for a while and reached a brave decision. I'm not the man to shirk when the fate of whole countries is in the balance, he said. I will make a start at dawn to complete this task which I have already completed by Hokey, or my name isn't Rincewand. Rincewind, said the kangaroo. Indeed. Well said, mate. Then I should get some sleep if I were you. Could be a busy day tomorrow. I have not been found wanting when duty calls, said Rincewind. He reached into a hollow log, and after some rummaging around, pulled out a plate of egg and chips. See you at dawn, then. Ten minutes later, he stretched out on the sand with the log as his pillow and looked up at the purple sky. Already a few stars were coming out. Now there was something. Oh, yes, the kangaroo was lying down on the other side of the waterhole. Rincewind raised his head. You said something about when he created this place and, and you talked about him. Yep. Only I, I'm pretty sure I've met the creator, a short bloke. Does all his own snowflakes. Yeah? And when did you meet him? When he was making the world, as a matter of fact. Rincewind decided to refrain from mentioning that he'd dropped a sandwich into a rock pool at the time. People don't like to hear that they may have evolved from somebody's lunch. I get around quite a lot, he added. Are you coming the raw prawn? What? Oh, no, certainly not. Coming a raw prawn? Not me. That's something I never do. Mm. Or even cooked prawns. Or crustaceans of any sort, especially in rock pools. Not me. Um, what uh, was it that you actually meant? Well, he didn't create this place, said Scrappy, ignoring him. This was done after. Can that happen? Why not? Well, it's not like, you know, building on over the stables, is it? said Rincewind. Someone just wanders along when a world's all finished and slings down an extra continent. Happens all the time, mate, said Scrappy. Bloody hell, yeah. Why not, anyway? If other creators go around leaving ruddy great empty oceans, someone's bound to fill them up, right? 
Does a world good too, having a fresh look, new ideas, new ways? Rincewind stared up at the stars. He had a mental vision of someone walking from world to world, sneaking in extra lands when no one was looking. Yes, indeed, he said. I, for one, would not have thought of making all the snakes deadly and all the spiders deadlier than the snakes and putting pockets on everything. Great idea. There you go, then, said Scrappy. He was hardly visible now as the dark filled up the cave. Made a lot of them, has he? Yep. Why? "'So's maybe at least one of them won't get mucked up. "'Always put kangaroos on them too, sort of a signature, you might say.' "'Does this creator have a name?' "'No. He's just the man who carries the sack that contains the whole universe.' "'A leather sack?' "'Sounds like him,' the kangaroo agreed. "'The whole universe in one small sack?' "'Yep.' Rincewind settled back. "'I'm glad I'm not religious,' he said. It must be very complicated. After another five minutes, he began to snore. After half an hour, he moved his head slightly. The kangaroo didn't seem to be around. With almost super rinsewind speed, he was upright and scrambling up the fallen rocks, over the lip of the cave and into the dark oven of the night. He sighted on a random star and got into his stride, ignoring the bushes that lashed at his bare legs. Ha! He was not going to be found wanting when duty called... He did not intend to be found at all. In the cave, the water in the pool rippled under the starlight, the expanding circles lapping against the sand. On the wall was an ancient drawing of a kangaroo, in white and red and yellow. The artist had tried to achieve on stone what might better have been attempted with eight dimensions and a large particle accelerator. He tried to include not just the kangaroo now, but also the kangaroo in the past and the kangaroo in the future, and in short, not what the kangaroo looked like, but what the kangaroo was. Among other things, as it faded, it was grinning. Among the complexities that made up the intelligent biped known to the rest of the world as Mrs Whitlow was this. There was no such thing as an informal meal in Mrs Whitlow's world. If Mrs Whitlow made sandwiches even just for herself, she would put a sprig of parsley on the top. She placed a napkin on her lap to drink a cup of tea. If the table could have a vase of flowers and a placemat with a tasteful view of something nice, so much the better. It was unthinkable that she should eat a meal balanced on her knees. In fact, it was unthinkable to think of Mrs Whitlow as having knees, although the senior wrangler had to fan himself with his hat occasionally. So the beach had been scoured to find enough bits of driftwood to make a very rough table and some suitable rocks to use as seats. The senior wrangler dusted one off with his hat. <clears throat> there we are, Mrs Whitlow, the housekeeper frowned. I'm really sure it's not done for the staff to eat with the gentlemen, she said. Be our guest, Mrs Whitlow, said Ridcully. I really can't. It does not do to get ideas above one's station, said Mrs Whitlow. I would never be able to look you in the face again, sir. I hope I knew me place. Ridcully looked blank for a moment and then said quietly, uh, Faculty meeting, gentlemen. The wizards went into another huddle a little way along the beach. What are we supposed to do about that? I think it's very commendable of her. Her world is below stairs, after all. Yes, very well, but it's not as if there are any stairs on this island. Uh, could we build some? We can't let the poor woman sit off by herself somewhere. That is my point. We spent ages on that table. And did you notice something about the driftwood, Arch-Chancellor? Looked like perfectly ordinary wood to me, Stibbons. Branches, tree trunks and what not. That's the strange thing, sir, because... It's very simple, Ridgallo. I hope that as a gentleman we know how to treat a woman. Lady. Let me just say that was unnecessarily sarcastic, Dean, said Ridcully. Very well. If the Prophet Ossery won't go to the mountain, the mountain must go to the Prophet Ossery, as they say in Clatch. He paused. He knew his wizards. I believe, in fact, that it's in Omnia that they say... Ponder began... Ridcully waved a hand. Uh, something like that, anyway. 
and that is why Mrs. Whitlow dined alone at the table while the wizards sat around the fire a little way away, except that very frequently one of them would lumber over to offer her some choice bit of nature's bounty. It was obvious that starvation would not be a problem on this island, although dyspepsia and gout might be. Fish was the main course. Frenzied searching had failed to locate a steak bush so far, but had found, in addition to numerous more conventional fruits, a pasta bush, a sort of squash that contained something very much like custard, and to rid Cullis disgust, a pineapple-like plant, the fruit of which was, when the husk had been stripped away, a large plum pudding. Obviously it's not really a plum pudding, he protested. We just think it's like a plum pudding because it tastes exactly like a, 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 a plum pudding. His voice trailed off. It's got plums and currants in it, said the senior wrangler. Pass the custard squash, will you? My point is that we only think they look like currants and plums. No, we also think they taste like currants and plums, said the senior wrangler. Look, Arch-Chancellor, there's no mystery. Obviously, wizards have been here before. This is the result of perfectly ordinary magic. Perhaps our lost geographer did a bit of experimenting. Or it's sorcery, perhaps. Some of the things that got created in the old days. Well, a cigarette bush is very small beer by comparison, eh? Um, talking of small beer, said the Dean, waving his hand, pass me the rum, will you? "'Mrs. Whitlow doesn't approve of strong liquor,' said the senior wrangler. "'The dean glanced at the housekeeper, who was daintily eating a banana, "'a feat which is quite hard to do. "'He put down the coconut shell. "'Well, she... I am... I, I don't see... well, damn it, that's all I've got to say.' "'Or oh, bad language,' said the lecturer in recent runes. "'I vote we take some of those bees back with us.' said the chair of indefinite studies. Marvellous little creatures. No footling around being content with making boring honey. You just reach up and pick one of these handy little wax containers and Bob's your uncle. She takes all the peel off slowly before she eats it. Oh, dear. You all right, senior wrangler? Is the heat getting to you? What? Huh? Oh, oh, nothing. Um, yes, yes, uh, bees. Ah, uh, wonderful things. They glanced up at a couple of the bees, who were busying themselves around a flowering bush in the last of the light. They were leaving little black smoke trails. Shooting around like little rockets, said the Arch-Chancellor. Amazing. I'm still worried about those boots, said the senior wrangler. You'd think the man had been pulled right out of them. It's a tiny island, man, said Ridcully. All we've seen is birds, a few little squeaky things, and a load of insects. You, you don't get big, fierce animals on islands you can practically throw a stone across. He must have just felt a bit carefree. It's a bit hot for boots here, anyway. So why haven't we seen him? Ah, he's probably lying low, said the dean, ashamed to face us. Keeping a nice sunny island in your study is against university rules. Is it? said Ponder. I've never seen it mentioned. How long has it been a rule? Ever since I've had to sleep in a freezing bedroom, said the dean, darkly. Pass the bread and butter pudding fruit, will you? Mook, said the librarian. Ah, nice to see you, your old shape, old chap, said Ridcully. Try and keep it up for longer this time, eh? Mook. The librarian was sitting behind a pile of fruit. Normally he wouldn't question such a perfect piece of positioning, but now even the bananas were bothering him. There was the same sensation of wrongness. There were long yellow ones and stubby ones and red ones and fat brown ones. He stared at the remains of the fish. There was a big silver one and a fat red one and a small grey one and a flat one a bit like a place. Obviously some sorcerer landed here and wanted to make the place more homely the senior wrangler was saying, but he sounded far off. The librarian was counting. The plum pudding plant, the custard squash vine, the chocolate coconut. He turned his head to look at the trees. And now he knew what he was looking for, he couldn't see it anywhere. The senior wrangler stopped talking as the ape scrambled to his knuckles and sped back to the high tide line. The wizards watched in silence as he scrabbled through the heaped up seashells. He came back with a double handful, which he dropped triumphantly in front of the Arch-Chancellor. Ooh, ooh, 
Eh, what's that, old chap? Ook. Yes, yes, very pretty. But, um, what's... Ook. The librarian seemed to remember what kind of intellects he was dealing with. He held up a finger and looked at Ridcully inquiringly. Ook. Um, still not quite with you. Two fingers went up. Ook, ook. Mm, no, not sure I fully under... Ook, ook, ook. Ponder Stibbons looked at the three fingers now raised. I think he's counting, sir. The librarian handed him a banana. Ah, the old how many fingers am I holding up game, said the dean. But usually we all have to have a bit more to drink first. The librarian waved his hand at the fish, at the meal, at the shells, and at the background of trees. One finger stabbed at the sky. Ook! It's, it's all one to you, said Ridcully. It's one big place. Um, it's one to remember. The librarian opened his mouth again and then sneezed. A very large red seashell lay on the sand. Oh dear, said Ponder Stibbons. That's interesting, said the chair of indefinite studies. He's turned into quite a good specimen of the giant conch. You can get a marvellous sound out of one of them if you blow in the pointy end. Volunteers, said the dean, almost under his breath. Oh dear, said Ponder again. What's up with you, said the dean. There's only one, said Ponder. That's what he was trying to tell us. Um, one what, said Ridcully. Of everything, sir. There's only one of everything. It was, he thought later, a good dramatic line. People ought to have looked at one another in growing and horrified realisation and said things like, By George, you know, he's right. But these were wizards, capable of thinking very big thoughts in very small chunks. Don't be daft, man, said Ridcully. There's millions of the damn shells for a start. Yes, sir, but look, they're all... Different, sir. All the trees we found, there was only one of each sort, sir. Lots of banana trees, but they all produced different types of bananas. There was only one cigarette tree, wasn't there? Lots of bees, though, said Ridcully. But only one swarm, said Ponder. Millions of beetles, said the dean. I don't think I've seen two alike, sir. Well, that's interesting, said Ridcully, but I don't see... One of anything doesn't work, sir, said Ponder. It can't breed. Yes, but they're only trees, Stibbons. Trees need males and females too, sir. Oh, they do? Yes, sir. Sometimes they're different bits of the same tree, sir. What? Are you sure? Yes, sir. My uncle grew nuts, sir. Keep it down, boy. Keep it down. Mrs Whitlow might hear you. Ponder was taken aback. What, sir? But, but she is Mrs. Whitlow, sir. Well, what, what's that got to do with the price of feet? I mean, presumably there was a Mr. Whitlow, sir. Ridcully's face went wooden for a moment, and his lips moved as he tried out various responses. Finally, he settled weakly for, that's as may be, but it all sounds pretty mucky to me. I'm afraid that's nature for you, sir. I used to like walking through the woods on a nice spring morning, Stibbons. You mean to say the trees were at it like knives the whole time? Ponder's horticultural knowledge found itself a little exhausted at this point. He tried to remember what he could about his uncle, who'd spent most of his life up a ladder. I uh, think camel hair brushes are sometimes involved, he began. But Ridcully's expression told him that this wasn't a welcome fact. So he went on... Anyway, sir, ones don't work. And there's another thing, sir. Who smokes the cigarettes? I mean, if the bush just hopes that butts are going to be dropped around the place, who does it think is going to smoke them? What? Ponder sighed. The point about fruit, sir, is that it's a kind of lure. A bird will eat the fruit and then uh, drop the seed somewhere. It's the way the plant spreads its seeds around. "'But we've only seen birds and a few lizards on this island, so how—' "'Oh, I see what you mean,' said Ridcully. "'You're thinking, what kind of bird stops flying around for a quick smoke?' "'Um, a puffin,' 
said the bursar. "'Glad to see you still with us, bursar,' said Ridcully, without looking round. "'Birds don't smoke, sir. You've got to ask yourself what's in it for the bush, you see. "'If there were people here, well, I suppose you might get a sort of nicotine tree eventually "'because they'd smoke the cigarettes. I mean, he corrected himself because he prided himself on his logical thought. "'These things that look like cigarettes and stub them round the place, thus spreading the seeds which are in the filter.' "'Some seeds need heat to germinate, sir, but if there aren't any people, the bush doesn't make any sense.' "'We're people,' said the dean, "'and I like a smoke after supper. Everyone knows that. "'Yes, but with respect, sir, we've only been here a couple of hours, "'and I doubt whether the news has spread all the way to small islands,' said Ponder patiently, "'and with, as it turned out, one hundred percent inaccuracy.' "'That's probably not long enough for one to evolve.' "'Hm, are you telling me,' said Ridcully, like a man with something on his mind, "'that you think when you eat an apple, you're helping it to, um... "'He stopped. "'It was bad enough about the trees,' he sniffed. "'I shall stick to eating fish. "'At least they make their own arrangements. "'At a decent distance, I understand.' "'And you know what I think about evolution, Mr. Stibbons? "'If it happens, and frankly I've always considered it a bit of a fairy story, "'it has to happen fast. "'Look at lemmings, for one thing.' "'Lemmings, sir?' "'Right. "'The little blighters keep charging over the cliffs, right? "'And how many have ever changed into birds on the way down? Hmm? Eh? "'Well, none, of course. "'There's my point.' "'said Ridcully triumphantly. "'And it's no good one of them on the way down "'thinking, hey, maybe I should waggle my claws a bit, is it? "'No. "'What it ought to do is decide really positively "'about growing some real wings.' "'What, in a couple of seconds? "'While they're plunging towards the rocks?' "'Best time. "'But lemmings don't just turn into birds, sir. "'Lucky for them if they could, though, eh? Hmm? "'There was a roar far off in the little jungle.' It sounded rather like a foghorn. Are you sure there aren't any dangerous creatures on this island? said the dean. I think I saw some prawns, said the senior wrangler nervously. No, the arch-chancellor was right. It's far too small, said Ponder, trying to dismiss the thought of flying lemmings. It couldn't possibly support anything that could hurt us, sir. After all, what would it eat? Now they could all hear something crashing through the trees. Us? said the dean, hesitantly. A creature blundered out onto the sunset sands. It was large and seemed to be mainly head, one huge reptilian head that looked almost as big as the body below it. It walked on two long hind legs. There was a tail, but given the amount of teeth now showing at the other end, the wizards weren't inclined to take in too much additional detail. The creature sniffed the air and roared again. Ah, said Ridcully, the solution to the mystery of the disappearing geographer, I suspect. Well done, senior wrangler. I think I'll just... the dean began. Stay still, sir, hissed Ponder. A lot of reptiles can't see you if you don't move. I can assure you, at the speed I intend, nothing is going to see me. The monster turned its head this way and that and began to lumber forward. Can't see things that don't move? said the Arch-Chancellor. You mean we just have to wait for it to walk into a tree? Mrs. Whitlow's still sitting there, said the senior wrangler. She was, in fact, spreading some runny cheese on a biscuit in a ladylike fashion. I don't think she's seen it. Ridcully rolled up his sleeve. I think a round of fireballs, gentlemen, he said. Hold on, said Ponder. This may be an endangered species. So is Mrs. Whitlow. But do we have the right to wipe out what is... Absolutely, said Ridcully. If its creator had meant it to survive, he would have given it a fireproof skin. That's your evolution for you, Stibbons. But perhaps we ought to study it. The thing was beginning to get up speed now. It was amazing how fast it could move, considering how big it was. Uh, said Ponder nervously. Ridcully raised his arm. The creature stopped, jerked into the air, and then went flat like a rubber ball that had been stepped on, and indeed when it sprang back into shape, it was with a noise akin to the sound made when a bad conjurer is having trouble twisting the back legs onto the balloon animal. 
In so far as it had an expression at all, it looked more astonished than hurt. Little flashes of lightning crackled around it. It went flat again, rolled up into a cylinder, twisted into a range of interesting but probably painful shapes, shrank to a ball the size of a grapefruit, and then with a final and rather sad little noise that might well have been spelled prap, dropped back onto the sand. Now that was pretty good, said Ridcully. Which of you fellows did that? The wizards looked at one another. Not us, said the dean. It was going to be fireballs all the way. Ridcully nudged Ponder. Go on, then, he said. Study it. Er... Uh, Ponder looked at the bewildered creature on the sand. Er... Uh, the subject appears to have turned into a large chicken. Good. Well done, said Ridcully, as if to wrap things up. Shame to waste this fireball, then. He hurled it. It was a road. At least, it was a long, flat piece of desert with wheel ruts in it. Rincewind stared at it. A road. Roads went somewhere. Sooner or later they went everywhere. And when you got there you generally found walls, buildings, harbours, boats. And incidentally a shortage of talking kangaroos. That was practically one of the hallmarks of civilization. It wasn't that he was against anyone saving the world, or whatever subset of it apparently wanted saving. He just felt that it didn't need saving by him. Which way to go? He picked a direction at random and jogged along for a while as the sun came up. After a while there was a cloud of dust in the dawn, coming closer. Rincewind stood hopefully by the track. What eventually appeared at the inverted apex of the cloud was a cart pulled by a string of horses. The horses were black, so was the cart, and it didn't seem to be slowing down. Rincewind waved his hat in the air just as the horses came past. After a while the dust settled. He got back onto his feet and walked unsteadily through the bushes until he found the cart where it had come to rest. The horses watched him warily. It wasn't a huge cart to be pulled by eight horses, but both they and the cart were covered with so much wood, leather and metal they probably didn't have much energy to spare. Spikes and studs covered every surface. The reins led not to the usual seat, but into holes at the front of the cart itself. This was roofed over with more wood and ironmongery, bits of old stove, hammered-out body armour, saucepan lids, and tin cans that had been stamped flat and nailed on. Above the slot where the reins went in was something like a piece of bent stovepipe poking through the cart's roof. It had a watchful look. Um, hello, said Rincewind. Sorry if I scared your horses. In the absence of any reply, he climbed up an armoured wheel and looked at the top of the cart. There was a round lid that had been pushed open. Rincewind didn't even consider looking inside. That'd mean his head would be outlined against the sky, a sure way of getting your body outlined against the dirt. A twig cracked behind him. He sighed and got down slowly, taking great care not to turn round. I surrender totally, he said, raising his hands. That's right, said a level voice. This is a crossbow, mate. Let's have a look at your ugly mug. Rincewind turned. There was no one behind him. Then he looked down. The crossbow was almost vertical. If it were fired, the bolt would go right up his nose. The dwarf, he said. You've got something against dwarfs? Who, me? No. Some of my best friends would be dwarfs, if I had any friends, I mean. Um, I'm Rincewind. Yeah? Well, I'm sure tempered, said the dwarf. Most people call me mad. Just mad? That's an unusual name? It ain't a name. Rincewind stared. There was no doubt that his captor was a dwarf. He didn't have the traditional beard or iron helmet... But there were other little ways you could tell. There was the chin that you could break coconuts on, the fixed expression of ferocity, and the certain bullet-headedness that meant its owner could go through walls face first. And, of course, if all else failed, the fact that the top of it was about level with Rincewind's stomach was a clue. Mad wore a leather suit, but like the cart, it had metal riveted onto it wherever possible. Where there weren't rivets, there was weaponry. The word... 
Friend jumped into the forefront of Rincewind's brain. There are many reasons for being friends with someone. The fact that he's pointing a deadly weapon at you is among the top four. Good description, said Rincewind. Easy to remember. The dwarf cocked his head on one side and listened. Blast! They're catching me up. He looked back up at Rincewind and said, Can you fire a crossbow? in a way that indicated that answering no was a good way to contract immediate sinus trouble. Uh, absolutely, said Rincewind. Get on the cart, then. You know, I've been travelling this road for years, and this is the first time anyone's ever dared to hitch a lift. Amazing, said Rincewind. There was not much room under the hatch, and most of it was taken up by more weapons. Mad pushed Rincewind aside, grasped the reins, peered into the periscope stovepipe, and urged the horses into motion. Bushes scraped up against the wheels, and the horses dragged back onto the track and began to get up speed. Beaut, aren't they? said Mad. They can outrun anything, even with armour. This is certainly a very original cart, said Rincewind. Got a few modifications of my own, said Mad. He grinned evilly. You a wizard, mister? Broadly speaking, yes. Any good? Mad was loading another crossbow. Rincewind hesitated. No, he said. Lucky for you, said Mad. I'd have killed you if you were. Can't stand, wizards. Bunch of wowzers, right? He grasped the handles of the bent stovepipe and swivelled it around. Here they come, he muttered. Rincewind peered over the top of Mad's head. There was a piece of mirror in the bend of the pipe. It showed the road behind and half a dozen dots under another cloud of red dust. Road gang, said Mad. After my cargo. Steal anything they will. All bastards are bastards, but some bastards is bastards. He pulled a handful of nose bags from under the seat. Right, you get up on top with a couple of crossbows, and I'll fix the supercharger. What? You, you want me to start shooting at people? You want me to start shooting at people? Said Mad, pushing him up the ladder. Rincewind crawled out onto the top of the cart. It was swaying and bouncing. Red dust choked him and the wind tried to blow his robe over his head. He hated weapons, and not just because they'd so often been aimed at him. You got into more trouble if you had a weapon. People shot you instantly if they thought you were going to shoot them. But if you were unarmed, they often stopped to talk. Admittedly, they tended to say things like, You'll never guess what we're going to do to you, pal. But that took time, and Rincewind could do a lot with a few seconds. He could use them to live longer in. The dots in the distance were other carts, designed for speed rather than cargo. Some had four wheels, some had two. One had just one, a huge one between narrow shafts with a tiny saddle on top. The rider looked as though he'd bought his clothes in the scrap metal yards of three continents, and where they wouldn't fit had strapped on a chicken. But not one as big as the chicken pulling his wheel. It was bigger than Rincewind, and most of what wasn't leg was neck. He was covering the ground as fast as a horse. What the hell's that? he yelled. Emu, shouted Mad, who was now hanging among the harnesses. Try and pick it off. They're a good feed. The cart jolted. Rincewind's hat whirled away into the dust. Now I've lost my hat. Good, bloody awful hat. An arrow twanged off a metal plate by Rincewind's foot. And they're shooting at me. A cart rattled out of the dust. The man beside the driver whirled something around his head. A grapnel bit into the woodwork by Rincewind's other foot and ripped off a metal plate. And there, he began. You got a bow, right? yelled Mad, who was balancing on the back of one of the horses. And find something to hold on to. They're going to go at any minute. The cart had been moving at a gallop, but now it suddenly shot forward and almost jolted Rincewind right off. Smoke poured out of the axles. The landscape blurred. What the hell is that? "'Supercharger!' shouted Mad, pulling himself onto the cart inches from the frantically pounding hooves. "'Secret recipe! Now hold them off right, cos someone's got to steer!' The emu emerged from the dust cloud with a few of the faster carts rattling behind it. An arrow buried itself in the cart right between Rincewind's legs. He flung himself flat on the swaying roof, held out the crossbow, shut his eyes and fired. In accordance with ancient narrative practice... The shot ricocheted off someone's helmet and brought down an innocent bird some distance away whose only role was to expire with a suitably humorous squawk. The man driving the emu drew alongside. 
From under a familiar hat with wizard dimly visible in the grime, he gave Rincewind a grin. Every tooth had been sharpened to a point, and the front six had mother engraved on them. G'day, he shouted cheerfully. Hand over your cargo, and I promise you you won't be killed all in one go. That's my hat. Give me back my hat. You're a wizard, are you? The man stood up on the saddle, balancing easily as the wheel bounced over the sand. He waved his hands over his head. Look at me, mates. I'm a bloody wizard. Magic, magic, magic. A very heavy arrow, trailing a rope, smashed into the back of the cart and stuck fast. There was a cheer from the riders. You give me back my hat or there'll be trouble. Oh, there's going to be trouble anyways, said the rider, aiming his crossbow. Tell you what, why not turn me into something bad? Oh, I'm all afraid. His face went green. He pitched backwards. The crossbow bolt hit the driver of the cart beside him, which veered wildly into the path of another, which swerved and crashed into a camel. That meant the carts behind were suddenly faced with a pile-up, which together with the absence of brakes on any vehicle immediately got bigger. Part of it was kicking people as well. Rincewind, hands over his head, watched until the last wheel had rolled away and then walked unsteadily along the swaying cart to where Mad was leaning on the reins. Uh, I think you can slow down now, Mr. Mad, he ventured. Yeah, killed them all, did ya? Um, uh, not all of them, some of them just ran away. You're kidding me. The dwarf looked around. Stone me, you ain't. Here, pull that lever as hard as you can. He waved a long metal rod beside Rincewind, who tugged it obediently. Metal screamed as the brakes locked against the wheels. Why are they going so fast? It's a mixture of oats and lizard's glands, shouted Mad against the red-hot squealing. Gives them a big jolt. The cart had to circle for a few minutes until the adrenaline wore off, and then they went back along the track to look at the wreckage. Mad swore again. What happened? He shouldn't have stolen my hat. Rincewind mumbled. The dwarf jumped down and kicked a broken cartwheel. You did this to people because they stole your hat? What do you do if they spit in your eye, blow up the country? It's my hat, said Rincewind sullenly. He wasn't at all sure what had happened. He wasn't any good at magic, that he knew. The only curses of his that stood a chance of working were on the lines of may you get rained on at some time in your life and... May you lose some small item despite the fact that you put it there only a moment ago. Going pale green, he looks down, oh yes, and slightly yellow in blotches now, was not the usual effect. Mad wandered purposefully among the wreckage. He picked up a few weapons and tossed them aside. Want the camel? he said. The creature was standing a little way off, eyeing him suspiciously. It looked quite unscathed, having been the cause of considerable scathe in other people. "'I'd really rather stick my foot in a bacon slicer,' said Rincewind. "'Sure. We'll hitch it onto the cart. "'It'll fetch a good price and did you bring a beer along?' said Mad. "'He looked at a homemade repeating crossbow, grunted and tossed it aside. "'Then he looked at another cart and his face brightened. "'Ah, now we're cooking with charcoal,' he said. "'It's a lucky day, mate.' "'Oh, a bag of hay,' said Rincewind. "'Give us a hand to get it on the wagon, will you?' said Mad, unbolting the rear of his own cart. What's so special about hay? The cart opened. It was full of hay. Life or death out here, mate. There's people slit you from here to breakfast for a bale of hay. Man without hay is a man without a horse, and out here a man without a horse is a corpse. Sorry? I went through all of that for a load of hay... Mad waggled his eyebrows conspiratorially. And two sacks of oats in the secret compartment, mate. He slapped Rincewind on the back. And to think I thought you was some backstabbing drongo I ought to toss over the rail. Turns out you're as mad as me. There are times when it does not pay to declare one's sanity, and Rincewind realised that he'd be mad to do so now. Anyway, he could talk to kangaroos and find cheese and chutney rolls in the desert... There were times when you had to look wobbly facts in the face. Mental as anything, he said, with what he hoped was disarming modesty. Good bloke. Let's load up their weapons and grub and get going. What do we want their weapons for? Fetch a good price. And what about the bodies? Nah, worthless. 
While Mad was nailing salvaged bits of scrap metal to his cart, Rincewind sidled over to the green and yellow corpse, and, oh yes, large black areas now, and using a stick, levered his hat from its head. A small eight-legged ball of angry black fur sprang out and locked its fangs onto the stick, which began to smoulder. He put it down very carefully, grabbed the hat and ran. Ponder sighed. I wasn't questioning your authority, Arch-Chancellor, he said. I just feel that if a huge monster evolves into a chicken right in front of you, the considered response should not be to eat the chicken. The Arch-Chancellor licked his fingers. Uh, what would you have done then, he said. Well, studied it, said Ponder. So did we. Post-mortem examination, said the Dean. Minutely, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies happily. He belched. Mm, pardon me, Mrs. Whitlow. Will you have a little more br... He caught Ridcully's steely glance and went on. Front part of the chicken, Mrs. Whitlow? And we've discovered that it'll no longer be any menace to visiting wizards, said Ridcully. It's just that I think proper research should involve more than having a look to see if you can find a sage and onion bush said Ponder. You saw how quickly it changed, didn't you? Well, said the Dean, that can't be natural. You're the one who says things naturally change into other things, Mr Stibbons. But not that fast. Have you ever mm, seen any of this evolution happening? Well, of course not. No one has ever se Well, there you are, then, said Ridcully, in a closing-the-argument voice. That might be the normal speed. As I said, it makes perfect sense. There's no point in turning into a bird a bit at a time, is there? A feather here, a beak there. You'd see some damn stupid creatures wandering around, hmm, eh? The other wizards laughed. Our monster probably simply thought, Oh, there's too many of them. Perhaps I'd better turn into something they'd like. Enjoy, said the dean. Sensible survival strategy, said Ridcully, up to a point. Ponder rolled his eyes. These things always sounded fine when he worked them out in his head. He'd read some of the old books and sit and think for ages, and a little theory would put itself together in his head in a row of little shiny blocks, and then when he let it out, it had run straight into the faculty, and one of them, one of them, would always ask some bloody stupid question which he couldn't quite answer at the moment. How could you ever make any progress against minds like that? If some god somewhere had said, let there be light, they'd be the ones to say things like, why, the darkness has always been good enough for us. Old men, that was the trouble. Ponder was not totally enthusiastic about the old traditions because he was well into his twenties, and in a moderately important position, and therefore to some of the mere striplings in the university, a target. Or would have been, if they weren't getting that boiled eyeball feeling by sitting up all night tinkering with Hex. He wasn't interested in promotion anyway. He'd just be happy if people listened for five minutes instead of saying, Well done, Mr Stibbons, but we tried that once and it doesn't work. Or, We probably haven't got the funding. Or, Worst of all, You don't get proper fill-in nouns these days. Remember old nickname Ancient Wizard who died fifty years ago who Ponder wouldn't possibly be able to remember? Now there was a chap who knew his fill-in nouns. Above Ponder, he felt were a lot of dead men's shoes, and they had living men's feet in them, and were stamping down hard. They never bothered to learn anything, they never bothered to remember anything apart from how much better things used to be, they bickered like a lot of children, and the only one who ever said anything sensible said it in orangutan. He prodded the fire viciously. The wizards had made Mrs Whitlow a polite rude hut out of branches and big woven leaves. She bade them good night, and demurely pulled some leaves across the entrance behind her. "'A very respectable lady, Mrs Whitlow,' said Ridcully. Oh, "'I think I'll turn in myself, too.' There were already one or two sets of snores building up around the fire. "'I think someone ought to stand guard,' said Ponder. "'Good man,' muttered Ridcully, turning over. Ponder gritted his teeth and turned to the librarian, who was temporarily back in the land of the bipedal, and was sitting gloomily wrapped in a blanket. "'At least I expect this is a home from home for you, eh, sir?' 
The librarian shook his head. Would you be interested in hearing what else is odd about this place? said Ponder. Ook? The driftwood. No one listens to me, but it's important. We must have dragged loads of stuff for the fire, and it's all natural timber. Do you notice that? No bits of plank, no old crates, no tatty old sandals, just ordinary wood. Ook? That means we must be a long way off the normal shipping deck. Oh, no, don't. The librarian wrinkled his nose desperately. Quickly, concentrate on having arms and legs. I mean living ones. The librarian nodded miserably and sneezed. Ook, he said, when his shape had settled down again. Well, said Ponder sadly, at least you're animate. Possibly rather large for a penguin, though. I think it's your body's survival strategy. It keeps trying to find a stable shape that works. Ook. Funny it can't seem to do anything about the red hair. The librarian glared at him, shuffled a little way along the beach, and sagged into a heap. Ponder looked around the fire. He seemed to be the man on watch, if only because no one else intended to do it. Well, wasn't that a surprise? Things twittered in the trees. Phosphorescence glimmered on the sea. The stars were coming out. He looked up at the stars. At least you could depend... And suddenly... He saw what else was wrong. <gasps> Arch-Chancellor! So, how long have you been mad? No, not a good start, really. It was quite hard to know how to open the conversation. So, I didn't expect dwarfs here, Rincewind said. Oh, the family blew in from No Thingfjord when I was a kid, said Mad. Meant to go down the coast a bit, storm got up. Next thing we shipwrecked and up to our knees in parrots. Best thing that could have happened. Back there I'd be down some freezing cold mine, picking bits of rock out of the walls. But over here, a dwarf can stand tall. Really, said Rincewind, his face carefully blank. But not too bloody tall, Mad went on. Uh, certainly not. So, we settled down and now my dad's got a chain of bakeries in Bugger Up. Dwarf bread, said Rincewind. Too right. That's what kept us going across thousands of miles of shark-infested ocean, said Mad. If we hadn't had that sack of dwarf bread, we'd never have been able to club the sharks to death, said Rincewind. Ah, you're a man who knows your breads. Big place, bugger up. Has it got a harbour? People say so. Never been back there. I like the outdoor life. The ground trembled. The trees by the track shook, even though there was no wind. Sounds like a storm, said Rincewind. What's one of them? You know, said Rincewind, rain. Oh, strain the flaming cows, you don't believe all that stuff, do you? My granddad used to go on about that when he'd been at the beer. It's just an old story. Water falling out of the sky. Do me a favour. Well, it, it never does that here. Course not. Happens quite a lot where I come from, said Rincewind. Yeah? How's it get up into the sky, then? Water's heavy. Oh, it, 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 uh, I think the sun sucks it up or something. How? I don't know. It just happens. And then it drops out of the sky? Yes. For free? Haven't you ever seen rain? Look, everyone knows all the water's deep underground. That's only sense. It's heavy stuff. It leaks down. I've never seen it floating around in the air, mate. <laughs> well, how do you think it got on the ground in the first place? Mad looked astonished. How do mountains get in the ground, he said. What? Well, they're just there. Oh, so they don't drop out of the sky. Of course not. They're much heavier than air. And water isn't? I've got a couple of drums of it under the cart and you'd sweat to lift them. Aren't there any rivers here? Course we got rivers. This country's got everything, mate. Well, how do you think the water gets into them? Mad looked genuinely puzzled. What do we want water in the rivers for? What did it do? Uh, flow out to the sea? Bloody waste. That's what you let it do where you come from, is it? 
You don't let it. It, it. it happens. It's what rivers do. Mad gave Rincewind a long, hard look. Yep. And they call me mad, he said. Rincewind gave up. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, but the ground shook again. Arch-Chancellor Ridcully glared at the sky as if it was doing this to upset him personally. What? Not one, he said. Technically, not a single familiar constellation, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies frantically. We've counted 3,191 constellations that could be called the Triangle, for example, but the Dean says some of them don't count because they use the same stars. There's not a single star I recognise, said the senior wrangler. Ridcully waved his hands in the air. They change a bit all the time, he said. The turtle swims through space and... Not this fast, said the dean. The dishevelled wizards looked up at the rapidly crowding night. Discworld constellations changed frequently as the world moved through the void which meant that astrology was cutting-edge research rather than, as elsewhere, a clever way of avoiding a proper job. It was amazing how human traits and affairs could so reliably and continuously be guided by a succession of big balls of plasma billions of miles away, most of whom have never even heard of humanity. We're marooned on some other world, moaned the senior wrangler. Er, uh, I don't think so, said Ponder. You've got a better suggestion, I suppose. Er, uh, you see that big patch of stars over there? The wizards looked at the large cluster twinkling near the horizon. Very pretty, said Ridcully. Well? I think it's what we call the small boring group of faint stars. It's about the right shape, said Ponder. And I know what you're going to say, sir. You're going to say, but they're just a blob in the sky, not a patch on the blobs we used to get, sir. But, you see, that's what they might have looked like when Great Artuin was much closer to them thousands of years ago. In other words, sir... Ponder drew a deep breath, in dread of everything that was to come. I think we've travelled backwards in time for thousands of years. And that was the other side of the odd thing about wizards. While they were quite capable of spending half an hour arguing that it could not possibly be Tuesday, they'd take the outrageous in their pointy-shoed stride. The senior wrangler even looked relieved. Oh, is that it? he said. Bound to happen eventually, said the dean. It's not written down anywhere that these holes connect to the same time after all. Hmm, going to make getting back a bit tricky said Ridcully. Eh, uh, Ponder began, it might not be so simple as that, Arch-Chancellor. You mean as, as simple as finding a way to move through time and space? I mean, there might not be any there to go back to, said Ponder. He shut his eyes. This was going to be difficult, he knew it. <laughs> of course there is, said Ridcully. We were only there this morning, only yesterday. That is to say, yesterday, thousands of years in the future, naturally. But if we're not careful, we might alter the future, you see, said Ponder. The mere presence of us in the past might alter the future. We might already have altered history. It's vital that I tell you this. He's got a point, Ridcully, said the dean. Was there any of that rum left, by the way? Well, uh, there isn't any history happening here, said Ridcully. It's just an odd little island. I'm afraid tiny actions anywhere in the world may have huge ramifications, sir, said Ponder. Oh, oh. Well, we certainly don't want any uh, ramifications. Well, what's your point? Mm? What do you advise? It had been going so well, they almost seemed up to speed. This may have been what caused Ponder to act like the man who, having so far fallen a hundred feet without any harm, believes that the last few inches to the ground will be a mere formality. To use the classic metaphor, the important thing is not to kill your own grandfather, he said, and smacked into the bedrock. What the hell would I want to do that for? said Ridcully. I quite liked the old boy. No, of course, I mean accidentally, said Ponder. But in any case, really? Well, as you know, I accidentally kill people every day, said Ridcully. Anyway, I don't see him around. 
It's just an illustration, sir. The problem is cause and effect, and the point is... The point, Mr Stibbins, is that you suddenly seem to think everyone comes over all fratricidal when they go back in time. Now, if I'd met my grandfather, I'd buy him a drink and tell him not to assume that snakes won't bite if you shout at them in a loud voice. Information which he might come to thank me for in later life. Why? said Ponder. Because he would have some later life, said Ridcully. No, sir, no, that'd be worse than shooting him. It would? Yes, sir. I think there may be one or two steps in your logic that I have failed to grasp, Mr. Stibbons, said the Arch-Chancellor coldly. I suppose you're not intending to shoot your own grandfather by any chance? Of course not, snapped Ponder. I don't even know what he looked like. He died before I was born. Aha! I didn't mean... Look, we're a lot further back in time than that, said the Dean. Thousands of years, he says. No one's grandfather is alive. That's a lucky escape for Mr. Stibbons Senior, then, said Ridcully. No, sir, said Ponder. Please, what I was trying to get across, sir, is that anything you do in the past changes the future. The tiniest little actions can have huge consequences. You might tread on an ant now, and it might entirely prevent someone from being born in the future. Really? said Ridcully. Yes, sir. Ridcully brightened up. That's not a bad wheeze. There's one or two people history could do without. Any idea um, how we can find the right ants? No, sir. Ponder struggled to find a crack in his Arch-Chancellor's brain into which could be inserted the crowbar of understanding and for a few vain seconds thought he had found one. Because the ant you tread on might be your own, sir. You mean... I might tread on an ant, and this would affect history, and I wouldn't be born? Yes, yes, that's it, that's right, sir. How? Ridcully looked puzzled. I'm not descended from ants. Because? Ponder felt the sea of mutual incomprehension rising around him, but he refused to drown. Well, um, well, supposing it bit a man's horse, and he fell off, and he was carrying a very important message, and because he didn't get there in time, there was a terrible battle, and one of your ancestors got killed. No, sorry, I mean, didn't get killed. Uh, how did this ant get across the sea? said Ridcully. Clung to a piece of driftwood, said the dean promptly. It's amazing what can get even onto the remotest island by clinging to driftwood, insects, lizards, even small mammals. And then got up the beach and all the way to this battle, said Ridcully. Bird's leg, said the dean, read it in a book. Even fish eggs get transported from pond to pond on a bird's leg. Pretty determined ant, then, really, said Ridcully, stroking his beard. Still, hmm, I must admit... "'Stranger things have happened.' "'Practically every day,' said the senior wrangler. Ponder beamed. They had successfully negotiated an extended metaphor. "'Only one thing I don't understand, though,' Ridcully added. "'Who'll tread on the ant?' "'What?' "'Well, it's obvious, isn't it?' said the Arch-Chancellor. "'If I tread on this ant, then I won't exist.' But if I don't exist, then I can't have done it. So I won't. So I will. See? He prodded Ponder with a large, good-natured finger. You've got some... some brains, Mr. Stibbons, but sometimes I wonder if you really try to apply logical thought to the subject in hand. Things that happen... stay happened. It stands to reason. Oh, don't look so downcast, he said, mistaking, possibly innocently, Ponder's expression of futile rage for shameful dismay. If you get stuck with any of this... "'Complicated stuff. My door's always open. "'I am your Arch-Chancellor, after all.' "'There's a certain type of manager who is known by his call of "'My door is always open, "'and it is probably a good idea to beat yourself to death "'with your own CV rather than work for him. "'In Ridcully's case, however, he meant "'My door is always open because then, when I'm bored, "'I can fire my crossbow right across the hall "'and into the target just above the bursar's desk.'
excuse me, can we uh, tread on ants or not? said the senior wrangler peevishly. If you like, Rid Cully swelled with generosity, because in fact history already depends on your treading on any ants that you happen to step on. Any ants you tread on, you've already trodden on. Hm. So if you do it again, it'll be for the first time, because you're doing it now, because you did it then, which is also now. Really? Yes, indeed. So we should have worn bigger boots, said the bursar. Try to keep up, bursar. Rid Cully stretched and yawned. Well, that seems to be it, he said. Let's try to get back to sleep, shall we? It's been a rather long day. Someone was keeping up. After the wizards got back to sleep, a faint light, like burning marsh gas, circled over them. He was an omnipresent god, although only in a small area, and he was omnicognizant, but just enough to know that while he did indeed know everything, it wasn't the whole everything, just the part of it, that applied to his island. Damn! He'd told himself the cigarette tree would cause trouble. He should have stopped it the moment it started growing. He'd never meant it to get out of hand like this. Of course, it had been a shame about the other pointy creature, but it hadn't been his fault, had it? Everything had to eat. Some of the things that were turning up on the island were surprising even him, and some of them never stayed stable for five minutes together. Even so, he allowed himself a little smirk of pride. Two hours between the one called the Dean dying for a smoke and the bush evolving, growing and fruiting its first nicotine-laden crop, that was evolution in action. Trouble was, now they'd start poking around and asking questions. The god, almost alone among gods, thought questions were a good thing. He was, in fact, committed to people questioning assumptions, throwing aside old superstitions, breaking the shackles of irrational prejudice, and, in short, exercising the brains their god had given them. Except, of course, they hadn't been given them by any god, Lord knows. So what they really ought to do was exercise those brains developed over millennia in response to the external stimuli and the need to control those hands with their opposable thumbs. Another damn good idea that he was very proud of. Or would have been, of course, if he existed. However, there were limits. Freethinkers were fine people, but they shouldn't go around thinking just anything. The light vanished and reappeared, still circling in the sacred cave on the mountain. Technically, he knew, it wasn't in fact sacred, since you needed believers to make a place sacred, and this god didn't actually want believers. Usually, a god with no believers was as powerful as a feather in a hurricane, but for some reason he'd not been able to fathom, he was able to function quite happily without them. It may have been because he believed so fervently in himself. Well, obviously not in himself, because belief in gods was irrational, but he did believe in what he did. He considered rather guiltily making a few more thunder lizards in the hope that they might eat the intruders before they got too nosy, but then dismissed the thought as being unworthy of a modern, forward-thinking deity. There were racks and racks of seeds in this part of the cave. He selected one from among the pumpkin family and picked up his tools. These were unique. Absolutely no one else in the world had a screwdriver that small. A green shoot speared up from the forest litter in response to the first light of dawn, unfolded into two leaves, and went on growing. Down among the rich compost of fallen leaves, white shoots writhed like worms. This was no time for half-measures. Somewhere far down, a questing taproot found water. After a few minutes, the bushes around the by now large and moving plant began to wilt. The lead shoot dragged itself onwards towards the sea. Tendrils just behind the advancing stem wound around handy branches. Larger trees were used as support. Bushes were uprooted and tossed aside, and a taproot sprouted to take possession of the newly vacated hole. The god hadn't had much time for sophistication. The plant's instructions had been put together from bits and pieces lying around, things he knew would work. At last, the first shoot crossed the beach and reached the sea. Roots drove into the sand, leaves unfolded, and the plant sprouted one solitary female flower. Small male ones had already opened along the stem. 
The god hadn't programmed this bit. The whole problem with evolution, he told himself, was that it wouldn't obey orders. Sometimes matter thinks for itself. A thin, prehensile tendril bunched itself for a moment, then sprang up and lassoed a passing moth. It curved back, dipped the terrified insect waist-deep in the pollen of a male flower, then coiled back with whiplash speed and slam-dunked it into the embracing petals of the female. A few seconds later the flower dropped off and the small green ball below it began to swell, just as the horizon began to blush with the dawn. Argo Nauticae Unico was ready to produce its first and only fruit. There was a huge windmill squeaking around on top of a metal tower. A sign attached to the tower read, Did you bring a beer along? Check your weapons. Yep, still got all mine. No worries, said Mad, urging the horses forward. They crossed a wooden bridge, although Rincewind couldn't see why anyone had bothered to build it. It seemed a lot of effort just to cross a stretch of dry sand. Sand, said Mad. That's the Lassitude River, that is. And indeed a small boat went past. It was being towed by a camel and was making quite good time on its four wide wheels. A boat, said Rincewind. Never seen one before. Not being pedalled, no, said Rincewind as a tiny canoe went past. They'd hoist the sail if the wind was right. But um, this might sound a strange question. Why is it a boat shape? It's the shape boats are. Oh, right. I thought it'd be a good reason like that. Um, how did the camels get here? They cling to driftwood, people say. The currents wash a lot of stuff up down the coast. Did you bring a beer along was coming into view. It was just as well there had been a sign, otherwise they might have ridden through it without noticing. The architecture was what is known professionally as vernacular, a word used in another field to mean swearing, and this was quite appropriate. But then Rincewind thought, it's as hot as hell and it never rains. All you need a house for is to mark some kind of boundary between inside and outside. You said this was a big town, he said. It's got a whole street and a pub. Oh, that's a street, is it? And that log pile is a, is a pub? you like it. It's run by Crocodile. Why do they call him Crocodile? A night sleeping on the sand hadn't helped the faculty very much, and the Arch-Chancellor didn't help even more. He was an early morning man, as well as being, most unfairly, a late night man. Sometimes he went from one to the other without sleeping in between. Oh, wake up, you fellows. Who's game for a brisk trot around the island? There'll be a small prize for the winner, hmm? Oh, my gods, moaned the dean, rolling over. He's doing press-ups. I certainly wouldn't want anyone to think I'm advocating a return to the bad old days, said the chair of indefinite studies, trying to dislodge some sand from his ear. But once upon a time... We used to kill wizards like him. Yes, but we also used to kill wizards like us, Chair, said the Dean. Remember what we'd say in those days, said the senior wrangler. Never trust a wizard over sixty-five. Whatever happened? We got past the age of sixty-five, senior wrangler. Ah, yes, and it turned out that we were trustworthy after all. Good thing we found out in time, eh? "'There's a crab climbing that tree,' said the lecturer in recent runes, who was lying on his back and staring straight upwards. "'An actual crab?' "'Yes,' said the senior wrangler. "'They're called tree-climbing crabs.' "'Why?' "'I had this book when I was a little lad,' said the chair of indefinite studies. "'It was about this man who was shipwrecked on an island such as this, "'and he thought he was all alone, "'and then one day he found a footprint in the sand. "'There was a woodcut,' he added. "'One footprint,' said the dean, sitting up, clutching his head. "'Well, yes, and when he saw it, he knew that he was alone on an island "'with a crazed one-legged long-jump champion.' said the dean. He was feeling testy. Well, obviously he found some other footprints later on. I wish I was on a desert island all alone, said the senior wrangler gloomily, watching Ridcully running on the spot. Is it just me, 
the dean asked, or are we marooned thousands of miles and thousands of years from home? Yes, I thought so. Is there any breakfast? Stibbons found some soft-boiled eggs. What a useful young man he is, the dean groaned. Where did he find them? On a tree. Bits of last night came back to the dean. A soft-boiled egg tree. Yes, said the senior wrangler. Nicely runny. They're quite good with breadfruit soldiers. You'll be telling me next he found a spoon tree. Of course not. Good. It's a bush. The senior wrangler held up a small wooden spoon. It had a few small leaves still attached to it. A bush that fruits spoons. Young Stibbons said it makes perfect sense, Dean. After all, he said, we'd pick them because they're useful and then spoons are always getting lost. Then he burst into tears. He's got a point, though. Honestly, this place is like Big Rock Candy Mountain. I vote we leave it as soon as possible, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. We'd better have a serious look at this boat idea today. I don't want to meet another of those horrible lizards. One of everything, remember? Then probably there's a worse one. Building some sort of boat can't be very hard, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. Even quite primitive people manage it. Now look, snapped the Dean. We've searched everywhere for a decent library on this island. There simply isn't one. It's ridiculous. How is anyone supposed to get anything done? I suppose we could... Try things, said the senior wrangler. You know, see what floats, that sort of thing. Oh, well, if you want to be crude about it. The chair of indefinite studies looked at the dean's face and decided it was time to lighten the atmosphere. I was, aha, uh -huh, just wondering, he said, as a little mental exercise, if you were marooned on a desert island, uh, eh, dean, what kind of music... Would you like to listen to, eh? Huh? The dean's face clouded further. I think, Chair, that I would like to listen to the music in the Ankh-Morpork Opera House. Ah, huh? Oh, yes, well, a very, very, very direct thinking there, Dean. Rincewind grinned glassily. So, um, you're a crocodile, then? He's worrying you, said the barman. No, no, don't they call you anything else, though? Well, they've a nickname they gave me. Oh, yes? Yeah. Crocodile, crocodile. But in here, most people call me Dongo. And uh, this stuff, uh, what do you call this? We call it beer, said the crocodile. What do you call it? The barman wore a grubby shirt and a pair of shorts, and until he'd seen a pair of shorts tailored for someone with very short legs and a very long tail, Rincewind hadn't realised what a difficult job tailoring must be. Rincewind held the beer glass up to the light, and that was the point. You could see light all the way through it. Clear beer. Ankh Morpork beer was technically ale, that is to say gravy made from hops. It had texture. It had flavour, even if you didn't always want to know what of. It had body. It had dregs. You could eat the last half inch of it with a spoon. This stuff was thin and sparkly and looked as though someone had already drunk it. Tasted all right, though. Didn't sit on your stomach the way the beer at home did. Weak stuff, of course, but it never did to insult someone else's beer. Mmm, pretty good, he said. Where'd you blind from? Er, uh, I floated here on a piece of driftwood. Was there room with all the camels? Er, uh, yes. Good on ya! Rincewind needed a map. Not a geographical map, although one of those would be a help, but one that showed him where his head was at. You didn't usually get crocodiles serving behind a bar, but everyone else in this cavern of a place seemed to think it was perfectly normal. Mind you, the people in the bar included three sheep in overalls and a couple of kangaroos playing darts. And they weren't exactly sheep. They looked more like, well, human sheep. Sticking out ears, white curls, a definite sheepish look, but standing upright with hands. 
and he was pretty sure that there was no way you could get a cross between a human and a sheep. If there was, people would definitely have found out by now, especially in the more isolated rural districts. Something similar had happened with the kangaroos. There were the pointy ears, and they definitely had snouts, but now they were leaning on the bar drinking this thin, strange beer. One of them was wearing a stained vest with the legend, Wagga Hay, it's the rye grass just visible under the dirt. In short, Rincewind had the feeling he wasn't looking at animals at all. He took another sip of the beer. He couldn't raise the subject with Crocodile Dongo. There was a philosophical wrongness about drawing a crocodile's attention to the fact that there were a couple of kangaroos in the bar. Yous want another beer? said Dongo. Yeah, right, said Rincewind. He looked at the sign on the beer pump. It was a picture of a grinning kangaroo. The label said, Roo Beer. He raised his eyes to a torn poster on the wall. It also advertised Roo Beer. There was the same kangaroo holding a pint of said beer and wearing the same knowing grin. It looked familiar for some reason. I can't help noticing, he tried again. I can't help noticing, he said, that some people in this bar a different chap from other people. Will old hollow-lock Joe over there have put on a bit weight lately? said Dongo, polishing a glass. Rincewind looked down at his legs. Whose legs are these? You OK, Mifter? Probably been bitten by something, said Rincewind. A sudden urgent need gripped him. He fout the back, said Dongo. Out back, in the outback, said Rincewind, staggering forward. <laughs> he walked into an iron pillar, which picked him up in a fist and held him at arm's length. He looked along the arm to a large, angry face and an expression that said a lot of beer was looking for a fight, and the rest of the body was happy to go along with it. Rincewind was muzzily aware that in this case a lot of beer wanted to run away, and at a time like this it's always the beer talking. "'I've been listening to you. "'Where are you from, mister?' said the giant's beer. "'Uh, Ankh Morpork. "'At a time like this, why lie?' "'The bar went quiet. "'And you're going to come here and make a lot of cracks "'about us all drinking beer and fighting and talking funny, right?' "'Some of Rincewind's beer said, "'No worries.' "'His captor pulled him so they were face to face.' Rincewind had never seen such a huge nose. And I expect you don't even know that we happen to produce some particularly fine wines. Our Chardonnay's been specially worthy of attention and competitively priced, not to mention the rich, firmly structured, rusty Dunny Valley Similians, which are a tangily refreshing discovery for the connoisseur, you bastard. Um, uh, uh, jolly good. I I'll have a pint of Chardonnay, please. You taking a piss? N no, I I'd like to leave it here. How about you putting my mate down? Said a voice. Mad was in the doorway. There was a general scuffle to get out of the way. Oh, you looking for a fight too, Stubby? Rincewind was dropped as the huge creature turned to face the dwarf, fists clenching. I don't look for them. I just walk into pubs and there they are, said Mad, pulling out a knife. Now, you gonna leave him alone, Wally? You call that a knife? The giant, unsheathed one that would be called a sword if it had been held in a normal-sized hand. This is what I call a knife. Mad looked at it, then he reached his hand around behind his back, and it came back holding something. Really? No worries. This, he said, is what I call a crossbow. Um, it's a log, said Ridcully, inspecting the boat-building committee's work to date. Rather more than a log, the dean began. Oh, oh, you've, you've made a mast and tied the bursar's bathrobe to it, I can see that. It's a log, Dean. There's roots on one end and bits of branch at the other. You haven't even hollowed it out. It's a log. It 
took us all hours, said the senior wrangler. And it does float, the dean pointed out. I think the term is more like wallows, said Ridcully, and we'd all get on it, would we? This is the one-man version, said the dean. We thought we'd test it out and then try it with a lot of them together. Oh, like a raft, you mean? I suppose so, said the dean with considerable reluctance. He would have preferred a more dynamic name for it. Obviously, these things take time. The arch-chancellor nodded. He was impressed in a strange way. The wizards had succeeded in recapitulating in a mere day a technological development that had probably taken mankind several hundred years. They might be up to coracles by Tuesday. Uh, which of you is going to test it? he said. Uh, we thought perhaps the bursar could assist at this point in the development program. Volunteered, has he? We are sure he will. In fact, the bursar was some distance away, wandering aimlessly but happily through the beetle-filled jungle. The bursar was, as he would probably be the first to admit, not the most mentally stable of people. He would probably be the first to admit that he was a tea strainer. But he was, as it were, only insane on the outside. He'd never been very interested in magic as a boy, but he had been good at numbers. And even somewhere like Unseen University needed someone who could add up. And he had indeed survived many otherwise exciting years by locking himself in a room somewhere and conscientiously adding up, while some very serious division and subtraction was going on outside. Those were still the days when magical assassination was still a preferred and legal route to high office, but he'd been quite safe because no one had wanted to be a bursar. Then Mustrum Ridcully had been appointed, and he'd put a stop to the whole business by being unkillable, and had been in his own strange way a moderniser, and the senior wizards had gone along with him because he tended to shout at them if they didn't, and it was, after some exhilarating times in the university's history, something of a relief to enjoy your dinner without having to watch someone else eat a bit of it first, or having to check your shape the moment you got out of bed. But it was hell for the bursar. Everything about Mustrum Ridcully rasped across his nerves. If people were food, the bursar would have been one of life's lightly poached eggs. But Mustrum Ridcully was a rich suet pudding with garlic gravy. He spoke as loudly as most people shouted. He stamped instead of walking. He roared around the place and lost important bits of paper which he then denied he'd ever seen and shot his crossbow at the wall when he was bored. He was aggressively cheerful. Never sick himself, he tended to the belief that sickness in other people was caused by sloppy thinking. And he had no sense of humour. And he told jokes. It was odd that this affected the bursar so much, since he did not have a sense of humour either. He was proud of it. He was not the kind of man to laugh, but he did know, in a mechanical sort of way, how jokes were supposed to go. Ridcully told jokes like a bullfrog did accountancy. They never added up. So the bursar found it much more satisfying to live inside his own head, where he didn't have to listen, and where there were clouds and flowers. Even so, something must have filtered in from the world outside, because occasionally he'd jump up and down on an ant, just in case he was supposed to. Part of him rather hoped that one of the ants was, in some unimaginably distant way, related to Mustrum Ridcully. It was while he was thus engaged in changing the future that he noticed what looked like a very thick green hosepipe on the ground. Ooh. It was slightly transparent and seemed to be pulsating rhythmically. When he put his ear to it, he heard a sound like gloop. Mildly deranged though he was, the bursar had the true wizard's instinct to amble aimlessly into dangerous places, so he followed the throbbing stem. Rincewind awoke, because sleep was so hard with someone kicking him in the ribs. Was it? You want I should pour a bucket of water on yous? Rincewind recognised the chatty tones. His eyes unglued. Oh, not you. You're a figment of my imagination. I should kick you in the ribs again, then, said Scrappy. Rincewind pulled himself upright. It was dawn, and he was lying in some bushes out behind the pub. Memory played its silent movie across the tattered sheets of his eyelids. There was a fight. Mad shot that... that shot him with a crossbow. 
Only through the foot so he'd stand still to be hit. Wombats can't hold their drink, that's their trouble. More recollections flickered across the smoky darkness of Rincewind's brain. That's right, there were animals drinking in there. Yes and no, said the kangaroo. I tried to explain. I'm all ears, said Rincewind. His eyes glazed for a moment. No, I'm not. I'm all bladder. Back in a minute. The buzz of flies and a sort of universal smell drew Rincewind into a nearby hut. Some people would have liked to think of it as the bathroom, although not after going inside. He came out again, hopping up and down urgently. Uh, there's a great big spider on the toilet seat. What you gonna do? Wait till it's finished? Fan it with your hat. It was odd, Rincewind thought, as he shooed the spider out, that a human being would, um, use the bathroom behind a bush in the middle of a thousand miles of howling wilderness, but would fight for a dunny if there was one available. And stay out, he muttered, when he was confident the spider was out of earshot. But the human brain often feels incapable of concentrating on the job in hand, and Rincewind found his gaze wandering. And here, as in private places everywhere, Men had found the urge to draw on the walls. Perhaps it was the way the light hit the ancient woodwork, but under the usual minutiae from people who needed people, and drawings done from overheated hope rather than memory, was a deeply scored drawing of men in pointy hats. He sidled out thoughtfully and edged away through the bushes. No worries, said the kangaroo, so close to his ear that Rincewind was quite pleased that he'd already relieved himself. I don't believe it. You'll see them everywhere. They're built in. They find their way into people's thoughts. You can't outrun your destiny, mate. Rincewind didn't even bother to argue. You're going to have to sort this out, said Scrappy. You're the cause. I'm not. Things happen to me, not the other way round. I could disembowel you with a kick, you know. Would you like to see? Er, uh, no. Haven't you noticed that by running away you end up in more trouble? Yes, but you see, you can run away from that too, said Rincewind. That's the beauty of the system. Dead is only for once, but running away is forever. Ah, but it is said that a coward dies a thousand deaths while a hero dies only one. Yes, but it's the important one. Aren't you ashamed? No, I'm going home. I'm going to find this city called Bugger Up, find a boat and go home. Bugger Up? Don't tell me the place doesn't exist. Ah, no, it's a big place. And that's where you're going? And don't try to stop me. I can see you made up your mind, said Scrappy. Read my lips. Your moustache is in the way. Read my beard, then. The kangaroo shrugged. In that case, I've got no choice but to carry on helping you, I suppose. Rincewind drew himself up. I'll find my own way, he said. You don't know the way. I'll ask someone. What about food? You'll starve. Ah, that's where you're wrong, Rincewind snapped. I've got this amazing power. Watch. He lifted up a nearby stone, extracted what was underneath and flourished it. See? Impressed, eh? Very. Aha. Uh -huh. Scrappy nodded. I've never seen anyone do that with a scorpion before. The god was sitting high up in a tree, working on a particularly promising beetle, when the bursa ambled past far below. Well, at last, one of them had found it. The god had spent some time watching the wizard's attempts at boat building, although he had been unable to fathom out what it was they were trying to do. As far as he could tell, they were showing some interest in the fact that wood floated. Well, it did float, didn't it? He threw the beetle into the air. It hummed into life at the top of the ark and flew away, a smear of iridescence among the treetops. The god drifted out of his tree and followed the bursa. The god hadn't made up his mind about these creatures yet, but the island was, unfortunately, and against all his careful planning, throwing up all sorts of odd things. These were obviously social creatures, with some of the individuals designed for specific tasks. The hairy red one was designed for climbing trees, and the dreamy ant-stamping one for walking into them. Possibly the reasons for this would become apparent. 
"'Ah, Bursa,' said the dean heartily. "'How would you like a brief trip round the lagoon?' The Bursa looked at the soaking log and sought for words. Sometimes, when he really needed to, it was possible to get Mr. Brain and Mr. Mouth all lined up together. "'I had a boat once,' he said. "'Well done. And here's another one just for... "'It was green.' "'Really? Well, we can... "'I found another green boat,' said the bursar. "'It's floating in the water.' "'Yes, yes, I'm sure you have.' said Ridcully kindly. A big boat with lots of sails, I expect. Now then, Dean. Just one sail, said the bursar, and a bare, naked lady on the front. Hovering imminently, the god cursed. He'd never intended the figurehead. Sometimes he really wanted to just break down and cry. Bare, naked lady, said the dean. "'Settle down, Dean,' said the senior wrangler. "'He's probably just had too many dried frog pills.' "'It's going up and down in the water,' said the bursar. "'Up and down, up and down.' "'The Dean looked at their own creation. "'Contrary to all expectations, it did not go up and down in the water. "'It stayed exactly where it was, and the water went up and down over it.' "'This is an island,' he said. "'I suppose someone could have sailed here, couldn't they? "'What kind of bare-naked lady? Um, "'A dusky one? "'Really, Dean. "'Spirit of inquiry, senior angler. "'Important biogeographical information.' "'The bursar waited until his brain came round again. "'Green!' he volunteered. "'That is not a natural colour for a human being, clothed or not.' "'said the senior wrangler. "'She might be seasick,' said the dean. "'There was only the vaguest of wistful longings in his head, "'but he did not want to let go of it. "'Going up and down,' said the bursar. "'I suppose we could have a look,' said the dean. "'What about Mrs Whitlow? "'She hasn't been out of her hut yet.' "'She can come too if she likes,' said the dean.' "'I don't think we can expect Mrs Whitlow to go looking at a bare, naked lady, "'even if this one is green,' said the senior wrangler. "'Why not? She must have seen at least one. Not green, of course.' "'The senior wrangler drew himself up. "'There's no call for that sort of imputation,' he said. "'What? Well, obviously she—' "'The dean stopped. "'The big leaves on Mrs Whitlow's hut were pushed aside and she emerged.' It was probably the flower in her hair. That was certainly the crowning glory. But she'd also done things to her dress. There was, for a start, less of it. Since the word is derived from an island that did not exist on the Discworld, the wizards had never heard of a bikini. In any case, what Mrs Whitlow had sewn together out of her dress was a lot more substantial than a bikini. It was more a New Zealand two quite large, respectable halves, separated by a narrow channel. She'd also tied some of the spare cloth around her waist, sarong style. In short, it was a very proper item of clothing, but it looked as if it wasn't. It was as if Mrs Whitlow was wearing a fig leaf six feet square. It was still just a fig leaf. "'I thought this might be a little more suitable for the heat.' she said. Of course, I wouldn't dream of wearing it in the university, but since we appear to be here for a little while, I remembered a picture I saw of Queen Zazumba of Sumtri. Is there anywhere I could have a bath, do you think? <laughs> said the senior wrangler. The dean coughed. There is <clears throat> a little pool in the jungle. With water lilies in it, said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. Pink ones. <sighs> said the Senior Wrangler. And there's a waterfall, said the Dean. <sighs> and a soap bush, as a matter of fact. They watched her walk away. Up and down, up and down, said the Bursar. A fine figure of a woman, said Ridcully. She walks differently without her shoes on, doesn't she? Uh, are you all right, senior wrangler? Mm -hmm. 
I think the heat's getting to you. You've gone very red. I'm... I'm... Oh, gosh, it is hot, isn't it? I think perhaps... <clears throat> I should have a dip, too. In the lagoon, said Ridcully, meaningfully. Uh, oh, the, the, the salt is very bad for the skin, Arch-Chancellor. Quite so. Nevertheless, or you can go looking for the pool when Mrs. Whitlow comes back. I find it uh, rather insulting, Arch-Chancellor, that you should appear to think that... Uh, well done, said Ridcully. Now, shall we go and look at this boat? Half an hour later, all the wizards were assembled on the opposite shore. It was green, and it bobbed up and down. It was clearly a ship, but built perhaps by someone who'd had a very detailed book of shipbuilding, which nevertheless didn't have any pictures in it. There was a blurriness of the detail. The figurehead, for example, was certainly vaguely female, although to the dean's disappointment it had the same detail as a half-sucked jelly baby. It put the senior wrangler in mind of Mrs. Whitlow, although currently rocks, trees, clouds and coconuts also reminded him of Mrs. Whitlow. And then there was the sail. It was, without a shadow of a doubt, a leaf. And once you realised that it was a leaf, then a certain marrow or pumpkin quality about the rest of the vessel began to creep over you. Ponder coughed. There are some plants which rely for propagation on floating seeds, he said in a small voice. The common coconut, for example, has... Does it have a figurehead? said Ridcully. Uh, one variety of mangrove fruit has a sort of keel, which... And a sail, with what looks very much like rigging, said Ridcully. Er, uh, no. And what are those flowers on the top, Ridcully demanded. Where a crow's nest would be was a cluster of trumpet-shaped flowers, like green daffodils. Who cares, said the chair of indefinite studies. It's a ship, even if it is a giant pumpkin, and it looks as though there's room for all of us. He brightened up. Even if it is a bit of a squash, he added. It has appeared very fortuitously, said Ridcully. I wonder why. I said, even if it is a bit of a squash, said the chair of indefinite studies, because a squash, you see, is another name for... Yes, I know, said Ridcully, looking thoughtfully at the bobbing vessel. I was only attempting to... Thank you for sharing, Chair. Actually, it does look pretty roomy, said the Dean, ignoring the Chair's pained expression. I vote we load up with provisions and go. Um, where to? said Ridcully. Somewhere where fearsome reptiles don't suddenly turn into birds, the Dean snapped. You'd prefer it the other way round, said Ridcully. He started to wade out into the water until, armpit deep, he was able to bang on the side of the hull with his staff. I think you are being a little obtuse, Mustrum, said the dean. Really? How many types of carnivorous plants are there, Mr. Stibbons? Dozens, sir. And they eat prey up to... No upper limit in the case of the sapu tree of Sumtri, sir. The sledgehammer plant of Bang Bang Duck takes the occasional human victim who doesn't see the mallet hidden in the greenery. There's quite a few that can take anything up to rat size. The pyramid strangler vine really only preys on other more stupid plants. But I just think that there's something very odd about a boat-shaped plant turning up just when we want a boat said Ridcully. I mean, chocolate coconuts, yes, and even filter-tipped cigarettes. But a boat with a figurehead? It's not a proper boat without a figurehead, said the senior wrangler. Yes, but how does it know that, said Ridcully, wading ashore again. Well, I'm not falling for it. I want to know what's going on here. Damn! They all heard the voice. Thin, reedy, and petulant. It came from everywhere around them. Small, soft white lights appeared in the air, spun around one another with increasing speed, and then imploded. The god blinked and rocked back and forth as he tried to steady himself. How, oh, my goodness, he said, what do I look like? He held up a hand in front of his face and flexed his fingers experimentally. Ah! 
The hand patted his face, his bald head, and lingered for a moment on the long white beard. He seemed puzzled. "'What's this?' he said. "'Eh, uh, a beard?' said Ponder. The god looked down at his long white robe. "'Oh, patriarchality. Ah, well, let me see now.' He seemed to pull himself together, focused his gaze on Ridcully, and his huge white eyebrows met like angry caterpillars. <clears throat> "'Be gone from this place, or I will smite thee!' he commanded. "'Why?' the god looked taken aback. "'Why? You can't ask why in this situation?' "'Why not?' The god looked slightly panicky. Because mm, uh, thou must go from this place, lest I visit thee with boils. Really? Most people would bring a bottle of wine, said Ridcully. The god hesitated. What? he said. Or cake, said the dean. Cake is a good present if you're visiting someone. It depends on what kind of cake said the senior wrangler. Sponge cake, I've always thought, is a bit of an insult. Something with a bit of marzipan is to be preferred. Be gone from this place, lest I visit you with cake, said the god. It's better than boils, said Ridcully. Provided it's not sponge, said the senior wrangler. The problem faced by the god was that, while he had never encountered wizards before, the wizards had, in their student days, met more or less on a weekly basis things that threatened them horribly as a matter of course. Boils didn't hold much of a menace when rogue demons had wanted to rip your head off and do terrible things down the hole. Listen, said the god, I happen to be the god in these parts, do you understand? I am, in fact, omnipotent. "'I'd prefer that, um, what is it, you know, the, the cake with the pink and yellow squares,' muttered the senior wrangler, "'because wizards tend to follow a thought all the way through.' "'You're a bit small, then,' said the dean. "'And the uh, sugary marzipan on the outside. Mm, it's marvellous stuff.' The god finally realised what else had been bothering him. Scale was always tricky in these matters. Being three feet high was not adding anything to his authority. "'Damn!' he said again. "'Why am I so small?' "'Size isn't everything,' said Ridcully. "'People always smirk when they say that. I can't think why.' "'You're absolutely right,' snapped the god, as if Ridcully had triggered an entirely new train of thought. "'Look at amoebas, except that of course you can't, because they're so small. "'Adaptable, efficient, and practically immortal. "'Wonderful things, amoebas!' His little eyes misted over. "'Best day's work I ever did.' "'Excuse me, sir, but exactly what kind of god are you?' said Ponder. "'And is there cake or not?' said the senior wrangler. The god glared up at him. "'I beg your pardon,' he said. "'I meant, what is it that you're the god of?' said Ponder. "'I said, what about this cake you're supposed to have?' said the senior wrangler. "'Senior wrangler?' Yes, asked Chancellor. Cake is not the issue here. But he said, Your comments have been taken on board, Senior Wrangler, and they will be thrown over the side as soon as we leave harbour. Mm. Do continue, God, please. For a moment, the God looked in a thunderbolt mood and then sagged. He sat down on a rock. Oh, all that smiting talk doesn't really work, does it? He said gloomily. You don't have to be nice about it, I could tell. I could give you boils, you understand. It's just that I can't really see the point. They clear up after a while anyway. And it is rather bullying people, isn't it? To tell you the truth, I'm something of an atheist. Sorry, said Ridcully. You are an atheist god? The god looked at their expressions. Yeah. I oh, know, he said. It's a bit of a bottomer, isn't it? He stroked his long white beard. Why exactly have I got this? You didn't shave this morning, said Ridcully. I mean, I simply tried to appear in front of you in a form that you recognise as godly, said the god. 
A long beard and a nightshirt seem to be the thing, although the facial hair is a little puzzling. It's a sign of, of wisdom, said Ridcully. Said to be, said Ponder, who'd never been able to grow one. Wisdom, insight, acumen, learning, said the god thoughtfully. Oh, the length of the hair improves the operation of the cognitive functions. Some sort of cooling arrangement, perhaps? Mm, never really thought about it, said Ridcully. The beard gets longer as more wisdom is acquired, said the god. I'm not sure it's actually a case of cause and effect, Ponder ventured. I'm afraid I don't get about as much as I should, said the god sadly. To be frank, I find religion rather offensive. He heaved a big sigh and seemed to look even smaller. Honest, I really do try, but there are some days when life just gets me down. Oh, excuse me, liquid seems to be running out of my breathing tubes. Would you like to blow your nose, said Ponder. The god looked panicky. Where to? I mean, you sort of, hold, look, here's my handkerchief. You just sort of put it over your nose and sort of, well, snuffle into it. Snuffle, said the god. Interesting. And what a curiously white leaf. No, it's a cotton handkerchief, said Ponder. It's made. He stopped there. He knew that handkerchiefs were made and cotton was involved, and he had some vague recollection of looms and things, but when you got right down to it, you obtained handkerchiefs by going into a shop and saying, I'd like a dozen of the reinforced white ones, please. And how much do you charge for embroidering initials in the corners? You mean, created? said the god, suddenly very suspicious. Are you gods too? Beside his foot a small shoot pushed through the sand and began to grow rapidly. No, no, said Ponder. Um, you just take some cotton and, and, and hammer it flat, I think, and you get handkerchiefs. Oh, then you're tool-using creatures, said the god, relaxing a little. The shoot near his foot was already a plant now and putting out leaves and a flower bud. He blew his nose loudly. The wizards drew closer. They were not, of course, afraid of gods, but gods tended to have uncertain tempers, and a wise man kept away from them. However, it's hard to be frightened of someone who's having a good blow. You, uh, you really the, um, the god in these parts? said Ridcully. The god sighed. Yes, he said. I thought it would be so easy, you know, just one small island. I could start all over again, do it properly, but it's all going completely wrong. Beside him, the little plant opened a nondescript yellow flower. Start all over again? Yes, you know, godliness. The god waved a hand in the direction of the hub. I used to work over there he said. Basic general godding, you know, making people out of clay, old toenails and so on, and then sitting on mountain tops and casting thunderbolts and all the rest of it. Although, he leaned forward and lowered his voice, very few gods can actually do that, you know. Really? said Ridcully, fascinated. Very hard thing to steer, lightning. "'Mostly we waited until a thunderbolt happened to hit some poor soul "'and then spake in a voice of thunder "'and said it was his fault for being a sinner. "'I mean, they were bound to have done something, weren't they?' "'The god blew his nose again. <sighs> "'Quite depressing, really. "'Anyway, I suppose the rot set in "'when I tried to see if it was possible to breed a more inflammable cow.' "'He looked at the questioning expressions. Burnt offerings, you see. Cows don't actually burn all that well. They're naturally rather soggy creatures, and frankly everyone was running out of wood. They carried on staring at him. He tried again. I really couldn't see the point of the whole business, to tell you the truth. Shouting, smiting, getting angry all the time. Don't think anyone was getting anything out of it, really. But the worst part, you know the worst part... The worst part was that if you actually stopped the smiting, people wandered off and worshipped someone else. 
It's hard to believe, isn't it? They'd say things like, Things were a lot better when there was more smiting, and if there was more smiting, it'd be a lot safer to walk the streets. Especially since all that had really happened was that some poor shepherd who had just happened to be in the wrong place during a thunderstorm had caught a stray bolt. And then the priests would say, Well, we all know about shepherds, don't we? And now the gods are angry, and we could do with a much bigger temple, thank you. Typical priestly behaviour, sniffed the dean. But they often believed it, the god almost wailed. It was really so depressing. I think that before we made humanity, we broke the mould. There'd be a bad weather front, a few silly shepherds would happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and next thing you know it was standing room only on the sacrificial stones, and you couldn't see for the smoke. He had another good blow on a piece of Ponder's handkerchief that had so far remained dry. I mean, I tried. God knows I tried. And since that's me, I don't know what I'm talking about. Thou shalt lie down flat in thundery weather, I said. Thou shalt sight the midden a long way from the well, I said. I even told them thou shalt really try to get along with one another. Did it work? I can't say for sure. Everyone was slaughtered by the followers of the god in the next valley who told them to kill everyone who didn't believe in him. Ghastly fellow, I'm afraid. And the flaming cows, said Ridcully. The what? said the god, sunk in misery. The more inflammable cow, said Ponder. Oh, yes. Another good idea that didn't work. I just thought, you know, that if you could find the bit in, say, an oak tree which says, be inflammable, and glue it into the bit of the cow which says, be soggy, it'd save a lot of trouble. Unfortunately, that produced a sort of bush that made distressing noises and squirted milk. But I could see that the, the, the principle was sound. And frankly, since my believers were all dead or living in the next valley by then, I thought to hell with it all. I'd come back here and get to grips with it and do it all more, more sensibly. He brightened up a bit. You know, it's amazing what you get if you break even the common cow down into very small bits. Soup, said Red Cully, because sooner or later, everything is just a set of instructions. The god went on, apparently not listening. "'That's just what I've always said,' said Ponder. "'Have you?' said the god, peering at him. "'Well, anyway, that's how it all began. "'I thought it would be a much better idea to create creatures "'that could change their own instructions when they needed to, you see?' "'Oh, you mean evolution,' said Ponder Stibbons. "'Do I?' the god looked thoughtful. "'Changing over time.' Yes, that's actually quite a good word, isn't it? Evolution. Yes, I suppose that's what I do. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be working properly. Beside him there was a pop. The little plant had fruited. Its pod had sprung open, and there appeared to be, bunched up like a chrysanthemum, a fresh white hanky. Oh, you see, he said, that's the sort of thing I'm up against. Everything is so completely selfish about it. He took the handkerchief in an absent-minded way, blew his nose on it, crumpled it up and dropped it on the ground. "'I'm sorry about the boat,' he continued. "'It was a bit of a rush job, you see. I just didn't want anyone upsetting everything, but I really don't believe in smiting, so I thought that since you wanted to leave here, I should help you do so as soon as possible. I think I did a rather good job in the circumstances. It'll find a new land automatically, I think. So why didn't you go?' The um, bare naked lady on the front was was a, a bit of a giveaway, said Ridcully. The what? The god peered in the direction of the boat. These eyes are not particularly efficient. Hmm. Oh dear, yes, the figure. Morphic bloody resonance again. Will you stop doing that? The handkerchief plant had just put forth another fruit. The god narrowed his eyes, pointed his finger and incinerated it. As one man, the wizard stepped back. Ah, stop concentrating for five minutes and everything loses any sense of discipline, said the god. Everything wants to make itself damn useful. I can't think why. Sorry, am I getting this right? 
"'You're a god of evolution?' said Ponder. "'Um, is that wrong?' said the god anxiously. "'But it's been happening for ages, sir.' "'Has it? But I only started a few years ago. "'Do you mean someone else is doing it?' "'I'm afraid so, sir,' said Ponder. "'People breed dogs for fierceness and racehorses for speed, "'and, well, even my uncle can do amazing things with his nuts, sir.' "'And everyone knows that you can cross a river with a bridge. "'Ha, ha, 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 said Ridcully. "'Can you?' said the god of evolution seriously. "'I'd have thought that you simply get some very soggy wood.' "'Oh, dear!' "'Ridcully winked at Ponder Stibbons. "'Gods were often not good at humour, "'and this one was even worse than Ridcully. "'We're back in time, Mr Stibbons,' he said. "'It may not have happened already, yet, hmm?' "'Oh, yes,' said Ponder. "'Anyway, two gods of evolution wouldn't be a bad thing, would they?' "'said Ridcully. "'Makes it a lot more interesting. "'The one who's best at it would win.' The god stared at him with his mouth open. Then he shut it just enough to mouth Ridcully's words to himself, snapped his fingers, and vanished in a puff of little white lights. "'Now you've done it,' said the lecturer in recent rooms. "'No cake for you,' said the bursar. "'All I said was the one who's best at it would win,' said Ridcully. "'Actually, he didn't look upset,' said Ponder. "'He looked as if he'd suddenly realised something.' Ridcully looked up at the small mountain in the centre of the island and appeared to reach a decision. "'All right, we'll leave,' he said. "'The reason this island's so odd is that some rather daft god is messing around with it. "'That's a pretty good explanation as far as I'm concerned.' "'But, sir,' Ponder began, "'see that little vine just by the senior wrangler there? "'It's only been growing for the last ten minutes,' said the dean. "'It looked like a small cucumber vine, except that the fruits were yellow and oblong.' "'Pass me your penknife, Mr. Stibbons,' said Ridcully. Ridcully sliced the fruit in half. It wasn't fully ripe yet, but the pattern of pink and yellow squares was clearly visible, surrounded by a layer of something sticky and sweet. "'But I only thought about that cake ten minutes ago,' said the senior wrangler. "'Seems perfectly logical to me,' said Ridcully. "'I mean, here we are, wizards, we move about,' We want to leave the island. What will we take with us? Anyone? Food, obviously, said Ponder. But, right, if I was a vegetable, I'd want to make myself useful in a hurry, yes? No good hanging around for a thousand years just growing bigger seeds. No fear. All those other plants might come up with a better idea in the meantime. No, you see an opportunity and you go for it. <laughs> there might not be another boat along for years. Millennia, said the dean. Even longer, Ridcully agreed. Survival of the fastest, eh? So I suggest we load up and go, gentlemen. What? Just like that? said Ponder. Mm, certainly. Why not? But, 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 but think of the things we could learn here, said Ponder. The possibilities are breathtaking. At least there's a god who's actually got the right idea. At least we can get some answers to all the important questions. We could... We can. Look, we can't just go. I mean... Go? I mean, we're wizards, aren't we? He was aware that he had their full attention, something that wizards did not often give. Usually they defined listening as a period in which you worked out what you were going to say next. It was disconcerting. Then the spell broke. The senior wrangler shook his head. Curious way of looking at things, he said, turning away. So, I vote we take plenty of those cheese nuts, Arch-Chancellor. "'Good provisioning is the essence of successful exploration,' said the dean. "'Quite a roomy vessel, too, so we needn't stint.' "'Ridcully pulled himself aboard via a trailing tendril and sniffed. <sniffs> "'Smells rather like mm, pumpkin,' he said. "'Always liked pumpkin, a very versatile vegetable.' "'Ponder put a hand over his eyes. "'Oh, really?' he said wearily. A group of unseen university wizards are seriously considering putting to sea on an edible boat? Fried, boiled, a good base for a soup stock, and, of course, excellent in pies, said the Arch-Chancellor happily. Also, the seeds are a tasty snack. Good with butter, 
said the chair of indefinite studies. I suppose there isn't a butter plant anywhere, is there? There will be soon, said the dean. Give us a hand up, will you, Arch-Chancellor? Ponder exploded. I don't believe this, he said. You're turning your back on an astonishing God-given opportunity. Absolutely, Mr Stibbons, said Ridcully from above. No offence meant, of course, but if the choice is a trip on the briny deep or staying on a small island with someone trying to create a more inflammable cow, then you can call me Salty Sam. Is this the poop deck? said the dean. I hope not, said Ridcully briskly. You see, Stibbons... Are you sure? said the dean. I'm sure, Dean. You see, Stibbons, when you've had a little more experience in these matters, you'll learn that there's nothing more dangerous than a god with too much time on his hands. Except an enraged mother bear, said the senior wrangler. No, they're far more dangerous, not when they're really close. If it was the poop deck, how would we know? said the dean. Ponder shook his head. There were times when the desire to climb the thaumaturgical ladder was seriously blunted, and one of them was when you saw what was on top. I, I, I just don't know what to say, he said. I am frankly astonished. Well done, lad. So run along and get some bananas, will you? Green ones will keep better. And don't look so upset. When it comes to gods, I have to say, you can give me one of the make-out-of-clay-and-smiting brigade any day of the week. That's the kind of god you can deal with. The practically human sort, said the dean. Exactly. Call me overly picky, said the chair of indefinite studies, but I'd prefer not to be around a god who might suddenly decide I'd run faster with three extra legs. Exactly. Is there something wrong, Stibbons? Oh, he's gone. Oh, well, no doubt he'll be back. And, uh, Dean? Yes, Arch-Chancellor? I can't help thinking you're working up to some sort of horrible joke about a poop deck. I'd prefer not, if it's all the same to you. You all right, mate? No one in the world had ever been so pleased to see Crocodile Crocodile before. Rincewind let himself be pulled upright. His hand, against all expectation, was not blue and three times its normal size. That bloody kangaroo, he muttered, using the hand to wave away the eternal flies. What kangaroo was that, mate? said the crocodile, helping him back towards the pub. Rincewind looked around. There were just the normal components of the local scenery, dry-looking bushes, red dirt, and a million circling flies. The one I was talking to just now. I was just sweeping up, and I saw you dancing around yelling, said the crocodile. I didn't see no kangaroo. It's probably a magic kangaroo, said Rincewind wearily. Oh, right, a magic kangaroo, said Crocodile. No worries. I think maybe I'd better make you up the cure for drinking too much beer, mate. What's the cure? More beer. How much beer did I have last night, then? Ah, about twenty pints. Don't be silly, no one can even hold that much beer. Ah, oh, you didn't hang on to much of it at all, mate. No worries. We like a man who can't hold his beer. In the fetid flea pit of Rincewind's brain, the projectionist of memory put on reel two. Recollection began to flicker. He shuddered. Was I... Singing a song, he said. Too right. You kept pointing to the rue beer poster and finging. The crocodile's huge jaws moved as he tried to remember. Tie me kangaroo up. Bloody good song. And then I... Then you lost all your money playing two up with Daggy's shearing gang. That's... I... Uh, uh, there were these two coins and the bloke had tossed them in the air and... You had to bet on how they'd come down. Right, and you kept betting they wouldn't come down at all. Said it was bound to happen sooner or later. You got good odds, though. I lost all the money Mad gave me? Yep. How was I paying for my beer, then? Ah, the blokes was queuing up to buy it for you. They said you were better than a day at the races. And then I, um... There was something about sheep. 
He looked horrified. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. You said, strain the fraying crones a dollar a time for giving a sheep a haircut. I could do a beaut soft job like that with my eyes shut. Too right, no flaming worries, boy. I've bonds a shoot through ye gods. This is good beer. Oh, gods. Did anyone hit me? Nah, mate. They reckoned you were a good sport. Especially when you wagered 500 squids, you could beat their best man at shearing. I couldn't have done that. I'm not a betting man. Well, I am, and if you've been shooting a line, I wouldn't give a tuppence for your chances, Rinso. Rinso, said Rincewind weakly. He looked at his beer glass. What's in this stuff? Your mate Mad said you were this big wizard and could kill people by just pointing at them and shouting, said Crocodile. I wouldn't mind seeing that. Rincewind looked up desperately and his eye caught the Rue Beer poster. It showed some of the damn silly trees they had there and the arid red earth and nothing else. Huh? What's that? said the crocodile. What happened to the kangaroo? Rincewind said hoarsely. What kangaroo? There was a kangaroo on that poster last night, wasn't there? Crocodile peered at the poster. I'm better at smell, he admitted at last, but I've got to admit it, it smells like it's gone. Something very strange is going on here, said Rincewind. This is a very strange country. We got an opera house, Crocodile volunteered. That's culture. And 93 words for being sick? Yeah, well, we're a very vocal people. Did I really bet 500, what was it? Squids. Squids I haven't got. Yep. So I'll probably get killed if I lose, right? Nah, worries. I wish people had stopped saying that. He caught sight of the poster again. That kangaroo's back! The crocodile turned around awkwardly, walked up to the poster and sniffed. <coughs> Could be, he said cautiously. And it's facing the wrong way. Take it easy, mate, said Crocodile Dongo, looking concerned. Rincewind shuddered. You're right, he said. It's the heat and the flies getting to me. It must be. Dongo poured him another beer. Ah, well, beer's good for the heat, he said. Can't do anything about the bloody flies, though. Rincewind started a nod and stopped. He removed his hat and looked at it critically. Then he waved a hand up and down in front of his face, temporarily dislodging a few flies. Finally, he looked thoughtfully at a row of bottles. Got any string, he said. After a few experiments and some mild concussion, Dongo advanced the opinion that it'd be better with just the corks. The luggage was lost. Usually it could find its way anywhere in time and space, but trying to do that now was like a man trying to keep his footing on two moving walkways heading in opposite directions, and it simply couldn't cope. It knew it had been stuck underground for a long time, but it also knew that it had been stuck underground for about five minutes. The luggage had no brain as such, even though an outsider might well get the impression that it could think. What it did do was react in quite complex ways, to its environment. Usually this involved finding something to kick, as is the case with most sapient creatures. Currently it was ambling along a dusty track. Occasionally its lid would snap at flies, but without much enthusiasm. Its opal coating glowed in the sunlight. Oh, isn't that pretty? Fetch it here, you two. It paid no attention to the brightly coloured cart that stopped a little way along the track. It was possibly aware at some level that people had got out and were staring at it, but it didn't resist when they appeared to reach a decision and lifted it onto the cart. It didn't know where it had to go, and since it also didn't know where this cart was going, perhaps it would take it there. It waited a decent while after it had been put down, and then took in its surroundings. It had been stacked up by a lot of other boxes and suitcases, which was comforting. After five minutes spent being underground for millions of years, the luggage felt that it was due some quality time and it didn't even resist when someone opened its lid and filled it up with shoes. Quite large shoes, the luggage noticed, and many of them with interesting heels and inventive ways with silk and sequins. They were clearly ladies' shoes. That was good, the luggage thought, or emoted, or reacted. Ladies tended to lead quieter lives. 
the purple cart rumbled off, painted crudely on the back with the words, Petunia, the Desert Princess. Rincewind looked hard at the shears that the head shearer was waving. They looked sharp. You know what we do to people who go back on a bet round here? said Daggy, the gang boss. Um, but I was drunk. So were we. So what? Rincewind looked out across the sheep pens. He knew what sheep were, of course, and had come into contact with them on many occasions, although normally in the company of mixed vegetables. He'd even had a toy stuffed lamb as a child. But there is something hugely unlovable about sheep, a kind of mad, eye-rolling brainlessness smelling of damp wool and panic. Many religions extol the virtues of the meek, but Rincewind had never trusted them. The meek could turn very nasty at times. On the other hand, they were covered in wool, and the shears looked pretty keen. How hard could it be? His radar told him that trying and failing was probably a lot less of a crime than not trying at all. Can I have a trial run, he said. A sheep was dragged out of the pens and flung down in front of him. Rincewind gave Daggy what he hoped was the smile of one craftsman to another, but smiling at Daggy was like throwing meringues against a cliff. Um, can I have a chair and a towel and two mirrors and a comb, he said. Daggy's look of intense suspicion deepened. What's this? What do you want all that for? Uh, got to do it properly, haven't I? Away, out of sight, at the back of the shearing shed, on the sun-bleached boards, the outline of a kangaroo began to form. And then, the white lines drifting across the wood like wisps of cloud across a clear sky, it began to change shape. Rincewind hadn't had a proper haircut in a long time, but he knew how it was done. So, have you, uh, have you had your holidays this year, then? he said, clipping away. <coughs> what about this weather, eh? Rincewind said desperately. <coughs> the sheep wasn't even trying to struggle. It was an old one, with fewer teeth than feet, and even in the very limited depths of its extremely shallow mind, it knew that this wasn't how shearing was supposed to go. Shearing was supposed to be a brief struggle followed by a glorious, cool freedom back in the paddock. It wasn't supposed to include searching questions about what it thought of this weather or inquiries as to whether it required something for the weekend, especially since the sheep had no concept of the connotations of the term weekend or, if it came to that, of the word something either. People weren't supposed to splash lavender water in its ear. The shearers watched in silence. There was quite a crowd of them because they'd gone and fetched everyone else on the station. They knew in their souls that here was something to tell their grandchildren. Rincewind stood back, looked critically at his handiwork, and then showed the sheep the back of its head in the mirror, at which point the creature cracked, managed to get its feet under it, and made a run for the paddock. Hey, wait till I take the curlers out, Rincewind shouted after it. He became aware of the shearers watching him. Finally, one of them said in a stunned voice, That's sheep shearing where you come from, is it? Uh, <laughs> what did you think? said Rincewind. It's a bit slow, isn't it? How fast was I supposed to go? Well, Daggy here once nearly did fifty in an hour. That's what you've got to beat, see? None of that fancy rubbish. Just short back, front, top and sides. Mind you, said one of the shearers wistfully, that was a beautiful looking sheep. There was an outbreak of bleating from the sheep corals. Ready to give it a real go, Rinso? said Daggy. Ye gods, what's that? said one of his mates. The fence shattered. A ram stood in the gap, shaking its head to dislodge bits of post from its horns. Steam rose from its nostrils. Most of the things Rincewind had associated with sheep, apart from the gravy and mint sauce, had to do with sheepishness. But this was a ram, and the word association was suddenly rampage. It pawed the ground. It was a lot bigger than the average sheep. In fact, it seemed to fill Rincewind's entire future. That's not one of mine, said the flock's owner. Daggy placed his shears in Rincewind's other hand and patted him on the back. This one's yours, mate, he said and backed away. You're here to show us how it's done, eh, mate? 
Rincewind looked down at his feet. They weren't moving. They remained firmly fixed to the ground. The ram advanced, snorting and looking Rincewind in the bloodshot eye. Okay, it whispered when it was very close. You just make with the shears and the sheep will do the rest. No worries. Is that you? said Rincewind, glancing at the distant ring of watchers. Eh, good one. Ready? They'll do what I do. They're like sheep. Okay. The shearers watched as wool fell like rain. That's something you don't often see, said one of them. Them standing on the reds like that. The cartwheels is good said another shearer, lighting his pipe. I mean, for sheep. Rincewind just hung on to the shears. They had a life of their own. The sheep flung themselves against the clippers as if in a real hurry to get into something more comfortable. Fleeces curled around his ankles, then around his knees, rose above his waist, and then the shears were slicing the air and sizzling as they cooled down. Several dozen dazed sheep were watching him very suspiciously. So were the sheep shearers. Um, have we started the competition yet? he said. You just sheared thirty sheep in two minutes, roared Daggy. Is that good? Good? No one takes two minutes for thirty sheep. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't go any faster. The shearers went into a huddle. Rincewind looked around for the ram, but it didn't seem to be there any more. Finally, something seemed to have been settled. The shearers approached him in the cautious, oblique way of men trying to hang back and walk forward at the same time. Daggy stepped forward, but only comparatively. In fact, his mates had all, without discussion, taken one step backwards in the choreography of caution. Uh, good day, he said nervously. Rincewind gave him a friendly wave, and it was only halfway through when he remembered that he was still holding the shears. Daggy hadn't forgotten about them. Eh... Uh, we ain't got five hundred squids till we get paid. Rincewind wasn't certain how to deal with this. Um, no worries, he said. This covered most things. So, if you're gonna be around... I just want to get to bugger up as soon as possible, said Rincewind. Daggy kept smiling, but turned around and went into another huddle with the rest of the shearers. Then he turned back. Maybe we could sell a few things? I'm not bothered about the money, actually, said Rincewind loudly. Just point me in the direction of bugger up. No worries. You don't want the money? No worries. There was another huddle. Rincewind heard hissed comments of, Get him out of here right now. Daggy turned back. I got a horse you can have, he said. It's worth a squid or two. No worries. And then you'll be able to ride away? She'll be right, no worries. It was an amazing phrase. It was practically magical all by itself. It just made things better. A shark's got your leg, no worries. You've been stung by a jellyfish, no worries. You're dead, she'll be right, no worries. Oddly enough, it seemed to work. No worries, he said again. Got to be worth a squid or two, that horse, Daggy said again. Practically a bloody racehorse. There was some sniggering from the crowd. Mm, no worries, said Rincewind. Daggy looked for a moment as if he was entertaining the suggestion that maybe the horse was worth more than 500 squid, but Rincewind was still dreamily holding on to the shears, and he thought the better of it. Get ye to bugger up in no time, that horse, he said. No worries. A couple of minutes later, it was obvious even to Rincewind's inexperienced eye that while you could race this horse, it wouldn't be sensible to race it against other horses, at least ones that were alive. It was brown, stubby, mostly a thatch of mane, with hooves the size of soup bowls, and it had the shortest legs Rincewind had ever seen on anything with a saddle. The only way you could fall off would be to dig a hole in the ground first. It looked ideal. It was Rincewind's kind of horse. No worries, he said. Um, actually, one small worry. He dropped the shears. The shearers took a step back. Rincewind went over to the corral and looked down at the ground, which was churned from the hoof prints of the sheep. Then he looked to the back of the shearing shed. For a moment, he was sure there was the outline of a kangaroo. The shearers approached him cautiously as he banged on the sun-bleached planks, shouting, I know you're in there! Eh, uh, that's what we call wood said Daggy. Wood, he added, for the hard of thinking. 
made into a wall. Did you see a kangaroo walk into this wall? Rincewind demanded. Not us, boss. It was a sheep at the time, Rincewind added. I mean, it's normally a kangaroo, but I'll swear it turned into that sheep. The shearers shuffled uneasily. You're not going to say anything about woolly jumpers, are you? said one, almost timorously. What? What's knitwear got to do with it? Eh, that's a mercy anyway, the small shearer mumbled. You know, it's been doing that all the time, said Rincewind. I thought there was something wrong with that beer poster. Something wrong with a beer too? I'm not putting up with any more kangaroo nonsense. I'm off home, said Rincewind. Where's that horse? It was standing where they left it. He waved a finger at it. And no talking, he said as he swung his leg over it. This simply resulted in him standing over the horse. He was sure that somewhere under the overhanging mane, something sniggered. You gotta kind of sag down, said Daggy, and then you kind of lifts your legs kind of up. Rincewind did so. It was like sitting on an armchair. You sure this is a horse? Won it in a game of two up from a bloke from Goolala, said Daggy. Gotta be tough coming from the mountains. They breed some special to be sure-footed. He said it wouldn't fall off anything. Rincewind nodded. His type of horse, all right. The quiet, dependable type. Which way's bugger up? The men pointed. Right. Thank you. Giddy up. Uh, what's this horse called? Daggy seemed to think for a moment and then said, Snowy. Why Snowy? That's an odd name for a horse. Ah, uh, I used to have a dog called Snowy. Oh, right. That makes sense. Sense for here, anyway, I suppose. Well, good day, then. The shearers watched him go, which, at Snowy's pace, took some time. Had to get rid of him, said Daggy. He could put us on the dole in a day. One of the men said, Why didn't you tell him about the drop bears over that way? He's a wizard, ain't he? He'll find out. Yeah, but only when they bloody drop on his head. Quickest way, said Daggy. Daggy? Yep. How long did you say you'd had that horse? Ages. Won it off a bloke. Right? Right. Right. What? Only, did you always have it ages half an hour ago? Daggy's wide brow furrowed a little. He took off his hat and wiped his head with his arm. He looked at the disappearing horse and then at the sheds and then at the other men. Several times he started to speak, shut his mouth before he could get the first word out, and glared around him again. You all know I've had it for bloody ages, right? he demanded. Yes, right, ages. Won it off a bloke. Right, yeah, right. You must have done. Mrs Whitlow sat on a rock combing her hair. A bush had sprouted several twigs with rows of blunt, closely set thorns just when she needed them. Large, pink and very clean, she relaxed by the water like an amplified siren. Birds sang in the trees, sparkling beetles hummed to and fro across the water. If the senior wrangler had been present, someone could have scraped him up and carried him away in a bucket. Mrs Whitlow did not feel in any danger. The wizards were around, after all. She was mildly worried that the maids would be getting lazy since she wasn't there, but she could look forward to making their lives a living hell when she got back. The possibility of not getting back never entered her head. A lot of things never entered Mrs Whitlow's head. She'd decided a long time ago that the world was a lot nicer that way. She had a very straightforward view of foreign parts, or at least those more distant than her sister's house in Querm, where she spent a week's holiday every year. They were inhabited by people who were more to be pitied than blamed, because really they were like children. That is to say, she secretly considered them to be vicious, selfish and untrustworthy. And they acted like savages. Again, when people like Mrs Whitlow use this term, they are not, for some inexplicable reason, trying to suggest that the subjects have a rich oral tradition, a complex system of tribal rights, and a deep respect for the spirits of their ancestors. They are implying the kind of behaviour more generally associated, oddly enough, with people wearing a full suit of clothes, often with the same insignia. On the other hand, the scenery was nice, and the weather was warm, and nothing smelled very bad. She was definitely feeling the benefit, as she'd put it. Not to put too fine a point on it, Mrs Whitlow had left her corsets off.
the thing that the senior wrangler insisted on calling the melon boat, was, even the dean admitted, very impressive. There was a big space below deck, dark and veined and lined with curved black boards, very like giant sunflower seeds. Boat seeds, said the Arch-Chancellor. Probably make good ballast. Senior Wrangler, don't eat the wall, please. I thought perhaps we could do with more cabin space, said the Senior Wrangler. Cabins, possibly. State rooms, no, said Ridcully, heaving himself back onto the deck. A vast shipmate, shouted the Dean, throwing a bunch of bananas onto the boat and climbing up behind them. Quite so. Er, uh, how do we sail this uh, vegetable, Dean? Oh, Ponder Stibbons knows all about that sort of thing. And, and, and where is he? Didn't he go off to fetch some bananas? They looked down at the beach where the bursar was stockpiling seaweed. He did seem a bit, um, upset, said Ridcully. Can't imagine why. Ridcully glanced up at the central mountain glowing in the afternoon sun. I suppose he wouldn't have done anything... Mm, stupid, would he? he said. Arch-Chancellor, Ponder Stibbons is a fully trained wizard, said the Dean. Thank you for that very concise and definite answer, Dean, said Ridcully. He leaned down into the cabin. Senior Wrangler, we're going to look for Stibbons, and we ought to go and fetch Mrs Whitlow too. There was a shriek from below. Mrs Whitlow, how could we have forgotten her? In your case, only by having a cold bath, Senior Wrangler. As horses went... This one went slowly. It moved in a stolid, I-can-do-this-all-day manner that clearly said the only way you get me to go faster will be to push me off a cliff. It had a curious gait, somewhere faster than a trot but slower than a canter. The effect was a jolting slightly out of synchronisation with the moment of inertia in any known human organ, causing everything inside Rincewind to bounce off everything else. Also, if he forgot for a second and lowered his legs... Snowy went on without him, and this meant that he had to run ahead and stand there like a croquet hoop until he caught him up. But Snowy didn't bite, buck, roll over, or gallop insanely away, which were the traits Rincewind had hitherto associated with horses. When Rincewind stopped for the night, the horse wandered off a little way and ate a bush covered with leaves the thickness, smell, and apparent edibility of linoleum. He camped beside what he had heard called a billabong, which was just an expanse of churned earth with a tiny puddle of water welling up in the middle. Little green and blue birds were clustered around it, cheeping happily in the late afternoon light. They scattered when Rincewind lay down to drink and scolded him from the trees. When he sat up, one of them landed on his finger. "'Who's a pretty boy, then?' said Rincewind. The noise stopped. Up on the branches, the birds looked at one another. There wasn't much room in their heads for a new idea, but one had just turned up. The sun dropped towards the horizon. Rincewind poked very cautiously inside a hollow log and found a ham sandwich and a plate of cocktail sausages. Up in the trees, the budgerigars were in a huddle. One of them said, very quietly, Who? Rincewind lay back. Even the flies were merely annoying. Things began to sizzle in the bushes. Snowy went and drank from the tiny pool with a noise like an inefficient suction pump trying to deal with an unlucky turtle. It was nevertheless very peaceful.